ahead and call the special board of education meeting for the West Southwest Monkey School District for order, please. Um, Suzette, if we could please do the roll. Yes. Ms. Krug. I will come back to her. Mr. Sickett. Present. Mr. Keller. Here. Mrs. Justum. I saw her. She's in there. Mrs. Justum, are you here? Try her again in a minute. Mr. Ustruck. Here. Mr. Schultz. Present. Mr. Lee. Here. Mrs. Kaiser. Here. President Emmons. Here. I'm going to try Ms. Klug again. Here. Thank you. And Mrs. Justin. I'm scrolling through. You know she's present, Stephanie. I assume she was. He is. She's on page two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. Does that include roll call? Is that, is that everybody? Okay. All right. So we'll move on to item three this evening, which are public comments. And just a note for special board of education meetings, we generally do not offer public comments. Those are for our regular scheduled meetings on the second and fourth Monday of the month. But due to the nature of the topic, we chose to add public comments to this particular um, meeting agenda today. Um, so if you are here to participate in public comments, um, as a reminder, if you could please put your name into the chat so that we can go ahead and make sure that we have everybody, um, that we don't miss anyone. And as a quick reminder, you have three minutes to address the board and our administrative team. And additionally, that the board does not reply or respond or debate during public comments, um, but rather you know that you uh, your, your comments are heard. And if a reply is necessary, we will certainly get that to you before the next Board of Education meeting. So that being said, uh, I will go ahead and start going through the chat to find the names and I will go through them in order. Please remember to list your name and your home address when uh, is your turn to speak. Um, and then I will just kind of be keeping an eye on the clock um, for the timer. So I'll go ahead and get started in just a second. All right. Uh, Lisa Duvall. Hello. <clears throat> my name is Lisa Duvall. My address is 1031 South 122nd Street. All right. Good evening. Um, I am a parent of a ninth and 10th grader at Nathan Hale. I'm also a teacher in another virtual district. I want to express my frustration with how the West Dallas School District has handled the learning process during this pandemic. I've lived in West Dallas my entire life, went to Walker, FLW, and Hale. My kids were part of the very first pilot programs of next generation learning at Walker almost 10 years ago. West Dallas as a district and particularly Walker as the main school was the poster child for individualized learning. And if I recall correctly, people from all over the country were coming to observe this learning style. What does this mean? For this, it means teaching to the child's academic and social emotional levels, differentiating work and adjusting each individual learning style, which varied vastly from child to child. This also meant complete change of classroom setup as well as one-to-one -one technology for students. As my kids moved to middle school, districts didn't have a solid plan in place for this group of children. Lane Global was an attempt, but was not even close to the level it should have been. Um, all of my son's teachers left for another district and a slew of provisional teachers came in. Um, I feel like West Dallas has been a stepping stone for new teachers and the district has failed to attract and retain staff. So exactly what is my point here? I have been very vocal on social media. Virtual learning is okay for my 10th grader and outright not working for my 9th grader. I'm frustrated that the district has not provided any sort of in-person learning despite that I live two weeks blocks away from New Berlin and they are going five days a week. <clears throat> I'm frustrated that when I drive by Hale, I see large groups of camp kids and staff playing together with no masks daily. I'm disappointed that the district expects children that have been taught through the next generation learning individualized style <laughs> for the past 10 years to sit in front of a screen for seven hours a day and all learn the same thing the same way. I'm frustrated that my teenage child is expected to stay tuned in for 90 minutes of a teacher talking or presenting or watch an hour video and fill out a six page worksheet. This is not teaching, she is not learning. 
I'm frustrated that my child has to, who has used Google Classroom her entire academic career has had to switch to Schoology this year and still gets lost in the program four months into the school year. Why couldn't the high school kids and teachers have stayed on the platform that they were used to? I'm frustrated that teachers lose assignments in their sea of electronic paperwork. Um, I'm frustrated that when I email a teacher to inform them of my struggling child, how they plan to differentiate work for her and other students, that their response has been, they haven't received any guidance from the district on this topic. All of my children's teachers know who I am. I don't blame them. They are doing the best they can with what they have, and I know how hard they're working and the unbearable challenges they face. I have voiced my frustrations with them and have been regularly advocating for my child and others in the classroom. I was also one of a total of three parents that showed up at the virtual open house with administrators where I expressed my concerns there. I've listened to the public bash uh, teachers and parents, and I have even seen people say that um, parents are failing their children during this adversity. Let me tell you something. I have a degree in international business. I have a master's degree in education, and my child and I struggle every day. We are in tears. Um, I don't really know how else to handle it. Her level of work, electronic work is out of control. Cooking class alone has 18 summative assignments and 47 formative assignments, all online. I'm doing the best I can to just help her survive, and many other parents are doing the same. If that is failure, I'd like to see what success looks like. Just because it's easier or manageable for some students does not mean it is a um, failure that others struggle. Lastly, I'm very happy the virtual is working for some people, but for our family and many others, it's a constant struggle and we have been both um, in tears daily. Last year, my eighth grade kid was an AB student. Now she is barely scraping by. If I'm struggling as a teacher myself to help her, I really wonder how other students that have little to no support at home are able to succeed. Virtual does not work for all kids. As a suburban district, we should have the ability to offer some form of in-person learning like all the others have done. Expecting all kids to learn the same in their extreme diverse home environments and then continuing to assign grades to that work is the definition of inequity. I beg you that to please offer some in-person for our kids. This is affecting the academic levels and mental health of a good portion of our children and putting them behind the other suburban districts. Please consider the voices and requests of struggling parents and kids. Thank you. Amy Hutter. Hi, my name is Amy Hutter, 12137 West Verona Court. And I am speaking to you tonight, not only as a parent of two children, a middle school and a high schooler, but also as an educator for the past 25 years. And I think I have valuable firsthand information and knowledge about hybrid learning to share. I currently teach high school English at a nearby high school and taught for 10 weeks in the hybrid model that WAWM will be voting on tonight. And I can tell you from experience that it was not very effective. So much so that my district is going back five days a week next semester with strong community support, even though it has been clearly explained that social distancing will not be possible. From my experience this fall, seeing my students for two days and then not seeing them again until the following week was inconsistent and confusing for everyone involved. When my students were not physically in class, I posted assignments for them to do, and I can tell you that even the most motivated students oftentimes did not complete their assignments. Therefore, when I saw them again after six days, it was difficult to continue on with the curriculum because they were not ready to move on. And keeping track of my A students and B students' schedules was difficult enough, not to mention the fact that what I love about this job is forming relationships with kids, and that was very difficult to achieve. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the plan is here at WAWM. However, if the district will be asking our teachers to not only teach the A group that is in front of them, but also the B group that is at home, as well as the students who are 100% virtual, then I think all three groups will lose. As a teacher, I can assure you that one person cannot effectively and efficiently manage three different groups of kids at the same time. It is simply not fair to the teacher or to the students. I understand that the hybrid model looks good on paper. It keeps kids more socially distanced and gives more time for cleaning. But really, that is to me the only real benefit. And honestly, when you consider that kids will, be, will not be six feet apart when walking down the halls, waiting outside their teacher's classroom doors, standing in line in the cafeteria, the only time they might actually be socially distanced will be while sitting at their desks. And that's probably not even possible in many classrooms in the district. 
The point is many districts such as Greendale and Wauwatosa tried hybrid and it didn't work. So now these districts are joining so many others in the area such as Elmbrook, Muskego, Whitnall, and New Berlin in bringing back their students five days per week and West Dallas should do the same. Just because we were all virtual does not mean we have to go to hybrid first. In fact, I would argue that going back five days would actually be easier on everyone, administrators, teachers, secretaries, parents, and students. Just as I feel many parents, students, and teachers appreciated the consistency of all virtual, they will also appreciate the consistency of five days per week. It is not too late to change, late to change course. There is still almost a month to make five days a week happen. Now, will there be students in classrooms that have to quarantine? Yes. Will some learning be disruptive for some students? Yes. But students, parents, and teachers in nearby communities have all dealt with it and will continue to deal with it, and West Dallas can do it too. I have seen our teachers, administrators, and students rise to the occasion during this pandemic, and I know that they are ready to face this next challenge if you give them a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia Sontag. Hi, my name is Cynthia Sontag. My address is 2238 South 106. My son is in 10th grade at Nathan Hale, and I'm actually on the other side of the fence. I actually am thriving with him in virtual learning and don't want him to go back to in-person at all in any aspect next year. He will lose his teachers, friends, and special classes if he goes to this new charter school that is being developed or considered to be developed. He's academically thriving now, so that we take him out of his current experience, I don't know how that would continue. He would lose the structure of the Nathan Hale's current curriculum. He would lose all of his friends and that would be a mental health aspect for him. So I, I worry about that too. Um, I wonder if he goes to this charter thing, would he ever be able to come back to it in the senior year or so? I just don't know how this would affect him because academically he's thriving virtually when he was struggling in person in freshman year. The other question I have is, why can't they consider doing something like a live stream or a Zoom that the kids can watch the in-person instruction? It's not a hybrid model. It would be the kids in school who want to be and then the kids who are virtually watching. That way the kids would be able to distance in class and my son wouldn't miss any instruction and he would still be a part of the classroom model. The other question I have is how can you control, say for example, I work in a hospital. So if I'm a exposed person from work and I come home, I'm asymptomatic and I don't know that I'm sick and I give it to my kid and he's asymptomatic, doesn't know he's sick and he goes to school. Now he becomes a super spreader at the school. How can you control that? Because you can't say I'm failing my kid by sending him to school, not knowing he's sick. That's going to happen. It's not just saying I'm gonna do it, but it's gonna happen in general. And the question that I have is how can you protect the kids if they're all in school without being six feet apart? This would give some alleviation to that. You can actually have some kids at home watching and some kids there being able to spread out a little bit better. I just want my son to be safe. I want him to thrive and I want it to be considered and not excluded. I don't want him to go to this charter school in his junior year and have to start all over. He'll lose everything. What about his band? What about Spanish? What about sports? If some kids want to do sports, can they do that? Right now he's in band class. Will he have to return his tuba and lose his current education in music and specials like Spanish or other specials coming up in junior year, senior year? Think of all the things that these kids would be losing if you pull them out of the current instruction they have through Nathan Hale's curriculum. I beg of you, please don't fail my son. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Berheim. Yeah, hi, I'm Andrew. I live at uh, 1613 uh, South 75th Street in West Dallas. My son is in seventh grade at Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I first of all want to thank especially any teachers that are on here and all the teachers for uh, the last you know year of teaching our kids. I think it's been incredibly difficult. I understand that, you know, not all parents are gonna be happy no matter what the decisions are that are made. Uh, my hope is, is that the voices of teachers are being listened to. Um, I'm not sure, you know, what the majority of teachers are wanting to do. Uh, maybe some of you have that data and that'll be talked about today in the meeting. 
Um, but I just want to make sure that the voices of teachers are being heard and that uh, the majority of what teachers want um, is going to be uh, a major influence in the decisions that are made uh, since they're the ones that are going to be there. And, uh, you know, our kids are going to be affected. Our kids' families are going to be affected, but teachers are going to be affected and teachers' families are going to be affected. Um, I just tested positive for COVID Saturday. I work for a nonprofit in Waukesha. And, um, you know, if there was in-person learning, my son would be quarantined for the next, you know, till I think January 21st, um, which would severely interrupt his education. Um, unless, he, of course, he chose to do the charter school, which Cynthia brought up the issues um, that would accompany that in terms of him not being with his class and teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just want to say, you know, no matter what decisions are made, I understand that some parents are going to be upset. Um, I would rather that parents be upset for making the right decision than parents being upset for making the wrong decision. Um, so once again, solidarity and thanks to all the teachers. Thank you. Um, Debbie Foley. Hi, good evening. I live at 1431 South 56th Street. My grandson lives with me as well as his mother and he's a student at Pershing of Mrs. Rosenbaum. And before I ask my question, I just wanted to get out there that Pershing has been doing an excellent job with my grandson and all the other students. Um, I've been with him. I retired in 2018 never to think my second career would be homeschooling. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm exhausted because my daughter's an essential worker. I've been Javon's full-time support for virtual learning. And I'm looking forward to the next step of going back for the two days as a step. And I'm saying this because like the last person who spoke, I am a survivor of COVID. It was brought into my house I've been in the house since March of last year because I'm elevated risk. Came into our house, everybody got sick. And I'm kind of tired of people saying, well, 99% survive. Does everybody understand 9% go through during the time that we're It's awful, absolutely awful. Javon didn't have too many symptoms. I was the worst. So I worry about the teachers. Um, and everybody else, but I'd like to see how it goes if we're going to go back two days. Him to go back and then all of a sudden be pulled, you know, for going back to virtual training because he's been off of school for so long. He's a first grader since kindergarten. He's been at home and now he's like, well, I don't want to go back. That's not the right answer. We want to get them back into school, but do it slowly. So that was my comment. I thank Pershing, I thank Mr. Harris, I thank the teachers, but I had a question regarding, and you guys may address this later, but with the PowerPoint that I reviewed, we had students Monday and Tuesday, and then we had students Thursday and Friday. If my grandson is in the second group of Thursday and Friday and virtual on Wednesday, what is he doing on Monday and Tuesday? That was my question, I'm done, and I thank you for listening. Much. Um, I apologize. I'm trying to go through the chat, but it's turned into a conversation. Interesting names for um, all the comments. So I'm trying to go through to make sure that I find everyone. Um, Janine Bagley, did I already get you, Janine? No, you did not. Okay, um, you're next. Hi. Uh, my address is 2826 South 83rd Street. I apologize. I did not prepare anything. Um, I did not think I'd be able to speak. I have old twins in first here. I'm an essential worker. My husband is an essential worker. So I'm hemorrhaging out money to put them in a daycare and hiring a tutor. I'm home in the evening times. I need to supplement their education because I don't think that virtual is working for them. How are they practicing their writing, their reading, all sorts of things? They're, they are proficient on the iPad. They're better. things like that it's like nobody really cares I'm getting upset and leave the district and that's not what I want uh, but again we are not virtual learning is not
for us. I do not think virtual learning works for the younger grades. In addition to losing all of the basic skills that you learn in first grade and whatnot, we're also losing the social aspect. We have been, they have been home since, you know, middle of 5K and I can definitely tell that they are not getting enough social interaction with other kids. Um, they hate school, they beg not to do it. And you know what, when they are in school, all of the worksheets and everything that they do, they're done before lunchtime. They only have Zoom conferences then. And I have to then supplement and I am buying them worksheets and printing things off from the computer and whatnot so that they get a better education. I, I guess that's all I have to say that virtual learning sucks. We're dying. Thank you. Uh, Julie Anderson. Hi, um, I'm Julie McCabe. So, um, I had gotten married, so my name didn't switch over yet. I'm a teacher at Hale. Um, I have expressed my concerns with the recent proposals of virtual learning and going into the schools. Um, I do believe um, that everyone should be heard and everyone Parents, your concerns are absolutely valid. And I was very happy to hear that you also care about the teachers and our concerns. Um, I know that we have done a lot of work as teachers getting, um, putting out surveys, asking how we're doing. And I know, you know, sometimes it's just not going to work. And um, so we got, gave families the choice to do virtual or do in-person. However, teachers are not given that choice. Um, we were given the choice to do some kind of like application to be able to work from home. Um, however, that was only accepted if, you know, you had, you know, more serious health conditions. Um, but other than that, if the decision is to go back, all teachers are going to be back. Um, I have students with severe, se severe significant special needs, some that need toileting, uh, personal cares, which require me to often be very close in contact with them. And I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, so I just feel that it should be a teacher choice as well as a family choice. I know that's not gonna be easy, but it almost feels like we're kind of being pushed to the side, being ignored, not cared about. So I do really appreciate all of um, you guys giving us the compliments. We are working our butts off. I know you're all working your butts off too. Um, I've had very great experiences with my, my families and um, unfortunately, it's a tough time and I just like us all to get what we want and that might not happen. That's not going to happen, but I really do think that. Prepare, I didn't know this was a public forum. Otherwise I would have been a little more eloquent. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that was the last name that I saw in the chat. Everything else was commentary. Um, in the audience um, here, I, are you here I, for public comments as well? No? Okay. Um, okay, uh, Emma? Yeah, sorry, I got my name in there a little late. Um, my name is Emma Lucht. I'm a teacher at Jefferson Elementary School. I teach fourth grade. Um, first of all, I do want to thank all the parents and grandparents that I have in my class. They've been rock stars in working with the third and fourth graders on what they need to do. Um, my main concern over going virtual or going from virtual into any phase of in-person learning is just concern over what happens with exposure. My husband's an essential worker. He's already been exposed three times since March which caused, you know, I have to keep my daughter home from daycare. I can't use family to watch her. And trying to teach with a 15 month old was difficult. And thankfully my students find that she's adorable and don't mind when she mashes on my laptop or tries to close it um, while I'm teaching. But my concern is just what the procedures are going to be if things like that happen again. There's been exposures at her daycare. There's been, like I said, with my husband being an essential worker exposures. And I just wanna make sure that if we go to in-person learning that there are policies and procedures in place for when those happen. So that way it's not a scramble so that our kids aren't the ones losing out because of it. Um, I spend my entire day on Zoom 
working with students and I want to make sure that if I get exposed or my husband gets exposed or my daughter gets exposed and I have to stay home that they're still going to get a quality education and not miss out for however many days it has to be. So those are just my um, concerns and what I wanted to express. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lindsay Nolder. Hi, thank you. Um, I apologize, I too did not really prepare anything ahead of time. I heard some very eloquent pre-written speeches, um, but I am a teacher in the district and after speaking with my kids and reconnecting with them after two weeks, um, I have some major concerns about going back. Um, I am an at-risk person and had COVID in March and I'm still feeling the complications from that. I live with two people who are in their mid 60s that I am terrified that if they do get it from me after having avoided it for nine months because we've been incredibly careful that um, they might not make it. Um, and that's because of their age and some health factors that they have. And it just, it, it really scares me, the thought of going back and being exposed to hundreds of kids who are exposed through their parents and their parents' work, um, but also through things that they were doing over their break. And I'm not trying to villainize any parents here for like trying to bring your kids a sense of normalcy, but I have kids seeing family that lives out of state, kids on extended sleepovers, days long sleepovers and going to like 10 different stories that they listed in Zoom, kids traveling and on Zoom today from other states and even other countries several kids who went out of state and are now back, several kids who went out of country and are now back, people who were seeing family and friends that they do not live with. We know that after holidays, COVID spikes, we are having the deadliest days that our country has ever seen because of this disease. And yes, the survival rate is high, but there's no way of knowing who is going to survive and who will not and what their recovery is going to be like. And it's very, very scary for teachers who have been incredibly careful for nine months and safe so that we can teach from home and do the best that we can. Um, it's very scary to think that all of that work is going to be over if we are forced to go back because like somebody else brought up, we do not have a choice. And it just scares me knowing, you know, I tried to reconnect with my kids today and it was so hard to be excited for them for having a sense of normalcy, but also say, oh my God, I hope you were being safe because whatever you caught on your fancy trip or your sleepovers is going to come to school. And that's so scary. And like, I appreciate you parents. I've talked to so many of my students' parents who are you know, at your wits end and who are saying that this is not good for your kids, but it's not safe to go back. If it wasn't safe in March, how in the world is it safe now when our country's in the worst place that it's ever been? Uh, so once again, thank you, parents. We do appreciate what you are going through. We do. We, we, some of us have kids. I have a niece who is seven and I hate seeing her do virtual school, but I know that it is better for her and for her family than possibly bringing home COVID. So we do see it from your point of view and we do appreciate you. I know that gets lost sometimes when we don't all have a chance to talk together, but based on what I heard today, I'm terrified to go back and what I'm going to be exposed to when I'm forced to go back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Fair. Yes, hello. I also don't have anything eloquently written down, but I just wanted to be a voice for the parents to have had their kids at the virtual camps. Um, I just wanted to say I've got one kid with a IEP, three with a 504. We're at Walker in Franklin, and the Franklin staff has been amazing, um, right down to every single person at that school. Um, but my kids have been going to Frank Lloyd Wright, and that staff has gone beyond the call of duty. They have been going to IEP meetings. They're texting the teachers. They're joining class dojo to make sure that these students are getting the best education that they can be. Um, and yesterday we sat around the table as a family and we told the kids the plan of going back to school. And I had three kids tell me they don't wanna go back. They like the camp. They started crying that they are gonna miss the teachers there. They're gonna miss the one-on-one -on -one they get. They're gonna miss the new friends that they have met. Um, and they're gonna miss how things are going. 
Um, and I think that says a lot. I have a fourth grader um, and he does not want to go back. He loves his teacher dearly, but he said, mom, that's a lot of kids in a classroom. And right now there's only a few. If I get frustrated, I can walk away. If I need extra help, I've got somebody right here. Um, I've also got a first grader and a kindergartner at Franklin, and they both are excelling by leaps and bounds. Um, my first grader couldn't even do Zoom last year and now is excelling in her class. I've got in comments from the principal and from the teachers. Um, my second grader at Walker is in the self-contained classroom, um, and he is excelling in virtual learning. Um, he could not do a regular ed classroom and he is excelling and he's actually a regular ed right now because it is virtual. He's not overwhelmed. He can do the work. He is doing amazing. And the kids told me yesterday, said, mom, please let everybody know that we want our camp. We want this option. Um, and so I just, you know, I think we really need to think about the teachers and you know, whatever, all the hard work that they have been doing for these students. And really, if we want to go back to school, there should be people from all walks of life, people who are using the camp, people in special ed, people regular ed, teachers, parents, everybody really coming together to come up with a plan that's going to work for people and giving people multiple options. But I just want to say it's for the people that are working at those virtual camps, they are doing amazing and they should be commended for all their hard work that they've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Kinsey. Yeah, good evening. Um, I actually, I did not know I'd have the opportunity to, uh, to talk as well. I just actually want to take an opportunity and thank everyone, parents, school board admin. I think everyone's taken their own difficult path through this time. And I think everyone has had their own suffering and um, it all needs to be recognized. I also wanna thank the school district for, for setting down a vision early on in the game and sticking to that vision. Um, as a resident in a nearby district that has changed their mind numerous times, that's been very frustrating as a parent to, to have one model and then another model and then another model it doesn't really give a lot of confidence, not just to the education, but to the, the long-term vision of that district. Um, I also would like to say that I would really like not gut instinct, political platform, anything to, to make decisions for the safety and well-being of children, families, educational quality, other than science and data and proven results. And I can sympathize with parents that are struggling I can rejoice with families that are doing well because I see it. I'm a teacher at Hale and um, I, I witness all of it, right? I see kids who are thriving and I see kids who are, are hanging in there. Um, <clears throat> I, I do believe um, whichever path we take going forward, and that my, my personal opinion is actually not relevant here, um, I would just encourage there to be logic behind the decision. I don't want this to be an opportunity for somebody to like, you know, flex their political muscle or their, their, their most angry face um, I think science has to, has to lead this decision here. When I look at the fact that the numbers are, are going in the wrong direction in our nation, it does scare me. Um, <clears throat> I teach European history. I follow European politics very closely. Um, you know, those nations were stalwarts for, for maintaining education throughout. And now they're even reconsidering now that new strains and the numbers are in the wrong spot. Um, so I just want to see the right litmus being used to uh, to make the decision as we move forward. And I also want to encourage parents, teachers, admin to, to also consider the quality of education even upon return. Because I do think there is kind of a misunderstanding that like putting kids inside a building means like a return to, you know, very socially engaged, a collaborative kind of studies with students. I don't think that that can be a reality, either social distance or if we go back full five without that social distancing in place. And the reason why I say that is it's still gonna be largely digital. Assignments will still be done via a learning management system. Um, other area districts will attest to this too. It's kind of virtual learning, but inside a confined space. I just want people to understand that that's not a threat. I just want people to understand that the disease and the, the protocols don't 
change. Um, and so that's, it might actually take kind of a feeling of, of step backwards of instruction when you put that many people into a space. I wish all of you the best. Um, I, I wish this darn thing would just end in general. Um, and, and please, you know, let's let's all accept the, the decision with at least an open mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, scrolling through. Uh, Jason Darling. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right, uh, 11037 West McGonagall Drive. So I spoke last month too, and uh, I just want to touch on, uh, people are talking about essential workers. I'm a essential worker. I've been going through it. I've checked in the job sites that have over 250 guys on it, um, basically in the heart of the shutdown. Um, we really have not been, um, I guess, uh, guideline protocol. And I hear some of the people saying that they don't want to do this, but this is the job that I picked. Um, to me, education is essential. And I'm not trying to attack any of the teachers because I appreciate the teachers and what they're trying to accomplish. However, I'm not fully on with the decisions that are be being made for the schools or for the teachers. But one of the teachers here said that she got married. Um, so it's okay to get married, but can't go out to a restaurant or have kids interact and be kids, whether it's, uh, you know, kindergartners all the way up to high schoolers. Um, just today when the kids log back in, I overheard third grade class asking the teacher, when, when can we come back in, in, back in person in school? Uh, they didn't have an answer, obviously. Told them that they're voting on us tonight, but they uh, wished it would basically be that uh, he could have them all back there in class. Um, I've talked to people at a local bar here in West Dallas, and one of them is a teacher. So I know the teachers are out and about. So if you can go out and about, I guess I'm just wondering what makes going through the job that you signed up for any different for the ones that are closing that. Um, we have had no issues since March. Uh, being an essential worker, um, there's also another one brought up about uh, elderly contact uh, my grandmother is 89 years old um, she did her quarantining um, out of fear uh, the unknown um, but I'd say in the last month now she's goes back out she does her thing she needs to get out she needs to have the interaction she puts her mask on um, and she's had no problems and like I said she's 89 she's a diabetic uh, she's overweight, so she has other risk factors to factor in, but she's making it by just fine. Um, I hope that continues, but it is what it is. But as far as a virus, we don't just eliminate a virus. Uh, if that's ever happened before, somebody please inform me. But as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware and concerned, a virus is here to stay. Um, whether you get a vaccine for it or not, we've had anti-vaxxers before. That's never been an issue. Um, those kids that have anti-vaxxer parents still go to school. So it's not a problem. Um, I know that pretty much, I would go as far as to say probably 75% of the parents in here um, going back to when their kid was six months old, all the way up to 12 years old, you probably dosed them up with Tylenol to get them through the door with, with, uh, with a temperature or something. I, it's gonna happen. Um, people are gonna do certain things, but as far as uh, keeping it closed, the virtual learning does not work for us. It does not work for the vast majority. Um, the virus isn't going to go anywhere, vaccine or not. Um, it's going to it's going to be there. It's going to linger. It's going to pop back up. I just I guess I just don't see the problem with going to an in person five days at the very least, uh, considering the hybrid. But as one of the other teachers had mentioned before, it just seems like that is going to be a scheduling nightmare and more chaotic than what this is now. Um, that's that's all I've got. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Schumacher. Um, can, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, Sarah. Yes, sir. um, Sarah Schumacher, I reside at 8709 West Beecher. Um, I have a child that is a ninth grader and also a senior at Central 
high school. Um, and for the most part, the teachers have been great. They try to get back to us. They try to, but there's also been some unprofessionalism in teaching. Um, teachers whose children are on the screen, whose animals are on the screen. Um, I am not able to go to work and take my children to work with me. It just, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, is the dog squeaking his toy? Um, it's, it's, I feel like if the kids are going to be home learning and doing the virtual, that the teachers should be able to teach from the classroom at least. So they don't have all the outside from being in their house, all the outside noise of their kids being home and things like that. I also am a essential worker. I have worked since day one in healthcare with COVID positive patients, with people who are having strep throat and I have not brought anything home to my house. Um, I also believe that the kids are playing sports. They're playing basketball. Football was pushed off. They're wrestling. Um, you know, it's, and it's working. We're not having these huge spreads of kids that are getting other kids sick. There have been a few quarantines, but nothing that would show that these kids are super spreaders of this, of COVID-19. And I see that working in pediatrics. We're not testing kids day in and day out and having hundreds of kids test positive. Um, and I just think the kids, the kids deserve better from all of us. They deserve better from teachers. They deserve better from parents. Um, I've had a few conversations with guidance counselors that when I'm talking to them, they ask me, oh, you're not home during the day with your kids? You're not there to help them? No, I'm, I'm at work during the day. I cannot stay home. I have, I have to work. I have to go into work every day. Um, and I just think it's not fair to the kids. I had my son, who my youngest son, who was a ninth grader, who was almost a 4.0 student for his whole since kindergarten and on. And he is now failing or barely passing almost every class. There's no motivation for these kids, none. I, I just feel like they don't want, they don't want to put the work in. I can't imagine what it's like to look at a screen for seven hours a day. Um, and I think that we have to do better for the kids in some way, shape, or form. They they deserve more from us. And that's about all I have to say. Thanks, Sarah. Emily Peterson. Hi, my name is Emily Peterson. I am a um, West Milwaukee resident. I live at 1230 Southwest Chester Street. I am also a teacher at one of the schools, um, Franklin. I teach K-4 and K-5, so I deal with the the cutest and the youngest of our district. And um, I gotta say our staff works very hard around the clock to provide the best personalized, individualized educational experience, um, regardless of the obstacles that we um, are clearly facing. I am seeing some pretty awesome growth with my students. Um, I have students that are above their grade level right now. I have K-4 students that are reading. This is all done virtually online. This is because of the hard work that I put in and that my colleagues have put in as well. Um, I know that um, one of my biggest concerns is the um, choreography of going back to the classroom. Um, first and foremost, I am a person of science. So if our data supports going into the classroom, that is to me a logical next step, but only and only when that is the case. We all have a lot of feelings on this issue. I am so grateful to hear all of the stories because um, as at least our school talks about, our, our um, stories shape our experiences and that provides these wonderful relationships that we have. We can't learn and work together without knowing our story. So thank you. Um, but I am concerned because 
I know from just being a staff member that there just aren't people to cover classrooms and aren't subbing. So my care, my, my fear is having where are kids going when there isn't a teacher able to teach because they're sick for any reason, because that does happen even in a non COVID year. Um, I am concerned about, um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. I'm just concerned generally how um, we're going to social distance 4K and 5K kids. They, they're they little, they're tiny. They need um, they need a mother or father figure in the classroom. Um, it is not logical or reasonable. They like the, they have snots, they, they touch everything. Um, they need to play first and final foremost. And without having a play-based classroom, it's really hard on these kids and I fear because of the way that our classrooms have to be set up with plexiglass and all the social distancing, my students aren't going to have that play-based experience that they need and deserve in education. I don't know what the answer is, but I wanted um, at least my perspective to be shared so that the board, you are able to um, consider this in your um, decision. And finally, I just want to say um, thank you to every parent and person in this room who has worked very hard to provide their kids and their community with um, the best educational um, experience we can have given these very unusual circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brittany Ruiz. Hi, I'm Brittany Roos. I am a sixth grade teacher at West Milwaukee Intermediate School. Um, just a couple of things that I want to kind of just get out there. The board's gonna make their decision tonight, whether we are returning to school or staying virtual. One of the things that I've had happen personally with my household is I have a son in 4K in a neighboring district, um, and he has been home quarantined for six weeks since the middle of October. And the biggest thing that I've brought up numerous times is really wanting to have a solidified plan from the board in the district of, if I have to be home with my son because there's nobody else that can take care of him, I tried sending him to daycare, I was unable to do that as well because he had exposure. I had to teach home virtually with him as well. And my biggest thing is, you know, I love my job, I love my kids, I love my students. I want to be the consistent teacher that is with them every day. And because we've been home virtually, I've been able to do that for them. So they know regardless of what's going on in my household, I am still there at 737 in the morning to be there for them. So I am really just thinking forward that we need to have a plan to make sure that the teachers can continue to be there for their students regarding what could potentially be happening in their individual households. Um, my son was home for two weeks. Once it was a school quarantine, the entire school was shut down. There was not much that we could do. So unfortunately where he's going to school, he is face to face, but it has not been working very well in that specific school that he's in for his district. So it's been very difficult to try to manage. And I know someone brought it up. They see students or children from personal uh, teachers at home. I, we're trying to do you know, what we can when there's no care, no family, it's either I don't teach your kid and there's no consistency for your student or I have to kind of, you know, figure something out. So my whole thing moving forward is that I really just want a consistent plan, letting teachers know what can we do to make sure that we continue to be there for our students if we have to be at home for whatever reason it may be. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Jackson. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so I am, I have two high school students at Hale. I live at 1565 South 81st. My son is a senior and my daughter is a sophomore. Um, my son is doing fine as far as the academic side of things go with being virtual. Um, he doesn't, you know, it's not ideal, but he's not struggling. Um, he's a little disappointed in his senior year, but at the end of the day, you know, this isn't what anybody foresaw or wanted. So um, my concern, sorry, I'm letting the dog out, um, is 
with my daughter. Um, my daughter is, she has ADHD, bipolar disorder type two with psychosis. Um, and this has been monumentally hard on her. Her dad and I both are essential workers. My husband works in a power plant. He has to be there, cannot make power from home. Um, and I dispatch for HVAC services for hospitals and different um, businesses that require ventilation to be clear for COVID. Um, so we're both in the office. So I have a 15 year old who, I don't know exactly how to explain bipolar disorder until you physically deal with it, but it is incredibly alarming. I have come home days where she has been in the fetal position on our kitchen floor crying, just completely frustrated with the situation. Um, she feels trapped, she's isolated, which is really bad for anybody with depression. Um, I have come home from work and I don't work that far away. I work five minutes away. So if there's an emergency, I can come home, but I, I've been driving home and I have found her walking, and this was in November, um, walking, to me, barefoot, in her pajamas, just crying because she she doesn't feel like she has any support. I've cut back my hours at work as much as I feasibly can. Um, and I've contacted members of the board. I have contacted the counselor at school. I have emailed the principal. I have tried to do everything I possibly can to get some support and all of the options I have are still virtual options. Um, I, nobody has given me an option to get her on an IEP program. I, I just, I don't understand how we can let the circumstances as they are. And I understand, I get it. This isn't, you know, something that anybody's dealt with before, but with all due respect, the science, the CDC, the statistics, um, they're saying that schools aren't super spreaders. And while I understand this may be fine for some people, like my kid upstairs that is a senior, it's fine. Um, it might not be ideal. For some, it probably is ideal. Some kids are probably thriving in this, but for the ones that aren't, it's more than a disservice. I am fearful for my kid, like every day. I don't know what I'm gonna come to home to. I'm worried about her safety and there are no options for her that are actually helpful. There, there have been suggestions and things made that may sound good and look good on paper, but at the end of the day, her mental health has just completely deteriorated over this time. And the options that I've gotten are all just, well, we'll check in with her online. I'm, that's not helping. So um, I don't mean to come off ungrateful because I know everyone is working very hard and trying to do what's best for a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. The teachers have been phenomenal and understanding. Uh, the counselor has done everything she can. I will say have not heard back from the principal, which is upsetting. Um, but um, board members have told me, you know, sources to reach out to. But at the end of the day, my daughter's still sitting here at a computer feeling alone with no support failing her classes and um, just her mental health is deteriorating to the point where a week ago we almost had to hospitalize her again. So regardless of what the decision is made tonight as far as hybrid or going back full time or whatever, I would really like a separate conversation for kids that are falling behind, kids that do have mental health issues or learning disabilities because something has to be done for those kids because what's happening now is not working. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer McFadden. 
Good evening. My name is Jennifer McFadden. I reside at 1552 South 80th Street. I am a teacher within the district. I teach at the high school in the special education department. I just wanted to voice some of my concerns as I work with students that do have IEPs um, in terms of how they're doing. With about two students on my caseload that are doing even reasonably well. Uh, the rest are completely floundering and I 100% empathize with their families and the struggles that they're going through and the fact that the services that we are providing virtually definitely do not even come close to the ones that we provide when we are face to face with our students. However, um, I am cautious and anxious um, with the return back to school um, because the way it has been presented um, from administration. Um, has been a complete 180 and lack of information to us. Um, in the department meetings that we've had, uh, staff has voiced their concerns and asked questions, and we've been told that those uh, questions need to be decided at a later time. Uh, there is about a, a, about a month until we could make this transition, and I think that there could be some really good turnaround and that we could make a return um, so students can get the learning that they need. Um, however, it makes me very nervous that we haven't made decisions on how passing time will look, on how bathroom breaks will look, on anything like that, and that my safety and the safety of my students um, will be insured uh, by the school district. Um, I'm also nervous about the lack of subs that we have just chronically, regardless of a pandemic. I know that that is not just a West Dallas problem, that is a problem across the state. Um, I currently do have COVID. I'm able to work from home and I'm able to provide services for my students. Um, but if we were in person, I would not be able to be there. Um, and if I was unwell enough to not be able to be even virtual, I just worry who is going to step in and who is going to provide those services for my students. Um, so I just, those are the concerns that I have. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for all the support from the community. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Thrall. Hi, my name is Uh, my name is Kristen Thrall. I reside at 1430 South 60th Street in West Dallas. I have a student who is an 11th grader and I have a student who is a 6th grader. My 11th grader is at Central. My 6th grader is at West Milwaukee. They have both always been good students. They are ridiculously behind. I also want to speak to the idea that their mental health is suffering dramatically. It's been a real struggle here. There's been a lot of concern about how much how much mental health assistance they need and we've had to really really work hard on keeping them happy and healthy so that that doesn't go too far also so that's one of the biggest concerns that we have i don't necessarily feel like they should be going back to school but my husband and i have decided that we're going to put it in their hands and if they desire to go back to school because it's their mental health they're concerned about and the fact that being so behind in classes is totally wrecking them as far as how they feel about their self-esteem and their grades and how things go around our house. Today, when school's out, we've sat here all afternoon doing missing assignments, missing assignments to the point where they're just stressed and overwhelmed and depressed and sad. So I hope that as we move forward with this, that's a consideration. I don't know what the right answer is for our health, but I know our mental health is really going down the drain quickly. Do you have anything else to say? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the last call then for uh, adding your name. The names keep trickling in in between all the conversations. So I have two more right now. Um, Jesse Kosinski is next. Um, and then we had one last one that just signed up and that will be the, the last. If there isn't anyone else, we'll be able to move on with the content of the meeting this evening. Um, so Jesse Kosinski, you are up next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, Jesse Kosinski, my address is 13331 West North Lane, New Berlin. Um, I'm just, I'm not prepared to say anything, but my, I have a daughter in who is a junior in high school um, and she is struggling greatly. She has always been a, a good student and good grades. 
and uh, had planned to go to college after high school. And with the way things have gone with virtual, she has not been successful. Um, and now my fear is how it'll impact her in getting into college. I have been very communicative with teachers. I've had some teachers who've been very helpful. I have others who basically just tell me this is your child's grade. This is what they need to do. I've had other teachers who've said that they are so far behind that they can't make up work in old units. And I've had other teachers who haven't responded at all and still waiting for a teacher who I emailed over three weeks ago. I emailed again with no response. Um, it's just really frustrating and really challenging. And regardless of how this all pans out tonight, whether we go back in person or whether we stay virtual, um, I think there needs to be a plan for figuring out how we get these kids caught back up and how we can prevent them from damaging moving forward um, their grades and that type of thing. I know other districts I've heard uh, have changed some of their late grading policies to allow late grades or late homework to come in. I've heard of, I know last year we did the passion project where that was uh, your exam grade and it only helped boost your grade. It didn't do any damage to your grade. Um, things like that. I know that other districts have changed grading scales. Well, I'm not asking for a free pass for my child. I am trying to figure out a way to ensure her success so that one year of her life doesn't define who she is for the rest of her life. Um, and I guess I think that's all that I really have to say. So I really hope moving forward, we can figure out some sort of plan to save these kids who really this has not worked out for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paige Bowski, our last speaker then. Hi, my name is Paige Bowski. I reside at 1135 North Cass Street. So um, I wrote out a thing to read. I'll read part of what I wrote. Um, but I wrote this after talking to a lot of teachers in the district. I am a high school teacher in the district and a survey went out to a lot of teachers about their thoughts on this plan. And so this is something I wrote after hearing teachers opinions and talking to a lot of staff. Um, so I, I think we need to delay reopening until fall 2021 or until the vaccine is widely available to staff and community members, along with safe and fair working conditions. Teachers should be able to voice their opinions on going back to school in unsafe conditions rather than only having the ability to ask questions about what the people who don't work in the actual schools are planning. Why is this process being rushed? Teachers and students both want to be back in the classroom because virtual learning has been a struggle for all. Teachers need time to plan. Giving two extra days to plan in between semesters and shifting from nine months of virtual learning to balance in-person and virtual learning at the same time is not doable. Teachers will be doing double the work if they have to teach both per virtual and in-person at the same time. Teachers have already been doing double the work to accommodate for virtual learning, so the workload will actually be more significant than it already is. Being virtual allows some extra time for planning. We had three weeks before school started to learn and prep for virtual learning. We should get the same time without concurrently teaching or more to plan for in-person. Also being virtual guarantees teachers to be fully present and invested in their entire class. Having half students virtual and half in-person is by no means equitable. There are so many unanswered questions and so little time to answer them. Some teachers haven't considered supplies in the organization that is required for certain hands-on classes. Specialists require different accommodations, which are forgotten or not even considered. Our district is being compared to surrounding districts that are similar, like Kenosha and Waukesha, who have had negative outcomes. Both have reopened and closed many times, which has led to dangerous results. In Kenosha, a teacher working in person contracted COVID, brought it home to their spouse who died. We should not be comparing our district to ones who are not listening to their teachers and making decisions based on parent concerns. This is important information that shouldn't be look, that should not be overlooked. Our district needs to have a response for what they will do if workers die or have long-term health conditions because of school reopening. When this question was asked on, on a school's Q&A sheet and mentioned the death in a, 
in the Kenosha school. The question was removed and reworded without mentioning the death because there is no definite answer for what would happen. Kenosha's district is also planning to move forward with in-person instruction once again after bouncing back and forth many times and ignoring data, workers, and poor conditions. In an article from Wisconsin Pum Public Radio, Kenosha offered in-person learning to all its students this year after initially planning for a virtual start in response to an outcry from parents who objected to virtual only learning and over <clears throat> the concerns of teachers. There have been many similar situations around the country and state like the teacher death in Green Bay. Going back to school without teacher input will re result in a loss of many teachers throughout the district and possibly more deaths. Case numbers are not getting better. We don't know what the numbers will look like after the holidays, which just happened, but they are likely to peak. We are we started by looking at the cases in the surrounding community, but have changed that to looking in each school. That will be flawed. The past few weeks before the holidays, uh, building buildings have were closed because COVID was spreading in schools without having in-person classes. With minimal work, workers in the building, COVID is still being spread. All cases in schools would be self-reported based on symptoms or close contact that is known. Teachers will not have their temperature taken or be required to get tested regularly. A self-reporting system gives false data to be able to track in each school. Science and facts are being ignored. Staff have been told schools are not super spreaders and to listen to a podcast based on one person's data collection. Teachers are being silenced in our district. Other data shows that cases are still surging in Wisconsin. The infection rate in Wisconsin children ages four to 17 have more than tripled since August. There's evidence that children are super spreaders. Wisconsin has been at the top for highest infection rate in the nation, ranking third highest from the White House Coronavirus Task Force report. The district's new argument for opening school is that it won't be spreading much in schools and we are going to focus on data within each school instead of the community. Ignoring the cases in the community will be detrimental because that has a huge effect on schools. There's a lack of state criteria which has led school districts developing their own gating criteria with unjustified differences. Districts developing their own metrics simply means changing or disregarding them to permit in-person instruction. Educators across the country are losing their lives. I've had many students reach out to me saying that they are sick, their family is sick, and have had many family members die. Decisions to stay open are being made by people who have not been teaching virtual and will not have to be working in a classroom. It is not equitable for both teachers and students to have zero say in the going back plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will then move on to the rest of the agenda for the evening. Item 4.1, the proposal to revise reopening schools plan, Dr. Lexman. Good. Uh, thank you and good evening, everybody. Um, in a moment, I'll share my screen. Um, but be, uh, before I do that, and before we get started, just a little bit of kind of opening comment. So first of all, I just want to, you know, thank the board members for allowing us to have a special meeting on to uh, make the decision this evening, hopefully make the decision this evening and provide some direction um, so that we can kind of plan into whatever the decision is going to be. Um, I also want to thank everybody that's participating in the meeting. Um, I, I think we've hit a um, all-time high, which is not a bad thing. I wish it was, you know, for circumstances that were um, better, um, but more participation is always better. Um, and I want to thank everybody that, you know, shared public comments and the, acknowledge the fact that, you know, we, we're coming from our own places, um, looking at the the challenges that we face together um, and those places, um, like our opinions, are all very different. Uh, and it makes the challenge of solving the problem incredibly complicated. And so, you know, I've shared many times throughout um, this journey, and we're not done yet. Um, there's no perfect, there's no actual right answer. Um, and that's going to be true tonight as well. Uh, you know, I wish I had an answer to every question that every person asked um, or a response to every concern. It's just not possible. Right. And so I think we know that and know that without even me saying it. 
Um, but there are some reasonable answers. Uh, and we're going to focus on, again, what we've done all along is what's the best information we have at the time, right? So that's what I'll be kind of walk, walking through in terms of the presentation. Now, typically, you know, district leadership teams, they, they try to work on proposals and, and develop kind of all the background information that a school board will need to consider a proposal after really doing a lot of due diligence, right? So that we would come forward with really strong confidence in the plan and during any kind of typical time, right? But these aren't typical times. Uh, and so every plan is imperfect, right? And so we, I think we have to acknowledge that. And then a couple uh, folks that spoke in public comments even recognized that. Uh, and so there's, you know, many and varied opinions here. Um, there's a lot of emotion that's tied to this. There's all kinds of anxiety about what this means um, for kids. If we don't go back, there's anxiety about what this means for me as a teacher. If we do go back, there's not an easy path here, folks. Um, and so we're asking our board for some direction tonight. Um, and that's, you know, why board members get elected <laughs> to help us solve when we hit the really, really complicated spaces. Uh, the goal all along has been returning kids to school, right? That's been the goal. Uh, and, and we've taken, I think, a slower and more cautious path than almost everybody else um, in our region. But the goal re remains the same, right? And, and so I'm asking the board to think about that goal. But knowing that, you know, after our um, presentation, we'll answer any questions. But it's possible that the direction the board sets could go in different spaces than the proposal. And that's okay, right? We're not in a typical time. And so the board could make a motion and approve the proposal that we present. That would be great. That would be helpful. It's direction, right? Or the board could make a motion and, and take the proposed plan and adjust it and um, build in a recommendation that's a little bit different. That's great too, right? It gives us some direction. Another option is there could be a motion to approve the proposal and the board um, votes it down. That's okay too, right? <laughs> we're not in a time where we're, where we're trying to figure, we're, um, where I'm personally invested in you know, this particular plan. It's about trying to find the solution that, and I've said this over and over, that's thoughtful, that's reasonable, that's balanced. And we're looking for the board to help us figure out what direction actually responds to those three things. So, um, so that's a lot on the board's shoulders. I just, I, I need to say that and hope everybody recognizes that when you kind of step into public service like this, when you hit these big moments, um, the weight is real. Um, and so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna walk through a presentation that many of you have looked at it already. We made it publicly available. It's been adjusted and adapted a little bit today. Um, it's long, so you're gonna spend quite a bit of time listening to my voice and I apologize for that upfront. Um, we're gonna try to go through the or we're going to go through, Stephanie asked that I go through the entire presentation without questions. Here and there, I will ask other members of the team on um, the step in uh, with a little bit more of their kind of unique expertise um, to present their particular slides. Then we'll answer the board member questions and we'll see kind of um, the direction the board would like to set. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen. I have to also share computer sound for later on. Let me put you down there. Right, come on, present. Okay. So um, like we do with each one of these, this is now kind of our restart, return to school plan and asking the board to consider some revisions um, at a special board meeting. So here's the agenda and there's quite a bit here, right? So we're gonna, again, I'm gonna touch on our guiding principles because, because I think it matters as we work through um, the proposed revisions, and as we think about some of the public comments this evening, we are going to continue to look at external health metrics, and they're continue to be tracked. Um, and there actually is um, encouraging news up until the point uh, we have um, these data points before you know the winter break. Um, then I'm going to spend some time, and that this will come back and forth kind of throughout the agenda, why we're reconsidering our plan. So first, it's the recent science. Some of it is feedback from uh, parents. There's some other data points that we'll look at. We're gonna look at the original parent survey um, on the priorities parents shared with us way back when we uh, first started our plan and then things in the health metrics got so much worse, we recommended remaining virtual. 
Um, we're going to also review the recent pulse check, pulse check um, parent and employee survey feedback. I think that's helpful. Um, some feedback from children's hospital doctors there that meet um, monthly, maybe a little less than that with all area school districts and feedback from our own medical director. Then I'll explain the new metrics we're looking at and why. And then what the uh, beginning phases uh, would look like if the board um, approves the plan as presented. Um, and then, then we're also going to spend just one slide on so what's changed and what is the same and some of the feedback we've been getting is you know we started with a plan and then we just threw it all out and now we're making a different plan and that's not the case. Right as new information comes in, we learn and we adapt and that's what this has been for months and it's going to continue to be that for a while. We're going to respond to some common questions from staff so some of the questions some of um, folks that made public comments this evening may in fact get answered. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about next steps and then we'll take um, questions and have some discussion with the board. So guiding principles, this is probably the shortest slide that's in the presentation. Um, we continue to focus on safety and well-being. And even though it feels like for some people um, bringing anybody back into buildings, we're abandoning that, that's not the case, right? The, the science suggests and the lessons from neighboring school districts suggests safety and well-being um, can still be held as a guiding principle. We're trying to figure out how to really maintain and be balanced in learning that works for all. And it fascinates me that we continue to hear stories of young people that are thriving. And that's why, you know, later on, we're discussing a possible um, virtual, ongoing virtual school of our own. But also just the number of students who are struggling, um, failing, um, having mental health uh, issues that maybe being back in school can help with. We're going to continue to look at you know how to be responsive and flexible and then practicality of implementation and that one is you know we can figure out almost any solution but we can't figure out doing every solution right so that um it's not possible to do everything everybody wants it's just not practical right and that's why we added that way back in the beginning of our work together so external health metrics the latest i have from our health department goes through december 22nd and the trend in the COVID burden status, which have been um, that, and then the percent positive rates um, continue to move in the right direction, right? So that should um, there not be a negative impact from the uh, you know Christmas and New Year's holidays, if that trend continues, we would actually be getting close to the metric that would move us to phase two in elementary schools in the not too distant future anyways, right? Um, now that's a big assumption on my part. We don't know the impact of the recent holidays. I'm hopeful that um, you know we all continue to follow the guidelines. There was not a spike in our immediate communities after Thanksgiving, so I'm, that gives me some reason to be hopeful. But if the trend continues, we would be moving towards phase two at some point in the near future um, with the current with the metrics that are in the current plan. Um, internal, you know, we track this every week, so this goes through December 18th, right through the end of. Um, be, uh, sorry, right through before break. Uh, and this is actually down quite a bit from the previous week, uh, which is interesting to me uh, that, you know, we're having, we had fewer positive um, cases that the close contact among staff is down quite a bit and students. And the fact that for students close contact, I think this may be the first time since we've been reporting this zero were school related. Um, so that also um, is encouraging in terms of trying to figure out how we can possibly move forward. Um, so why consider our roots, I'm sorry, why reconsider our plan? And um, I've said this, as we get new information, we learn and we adapt. And there are some good examples. Um, and this has been shared publicly, so you can, um, these are active links and you can take the time to go into those. But the high level summary from Duke University, which has um, become an exemplar in terms of higher ed, and keeping schools open, and it's really been about good mitigation strategies. So the expectations around um, masks and social distancing and hygiene and contact tracing are the lessons there. Brown University and some folks that have um, spoke tonight mentioned um, um, these kind of findings maybe from other sources, but schools are clearly not super spreader locations. And so that gives us reason to be encouraged about possibly um, adjusting the plan. And most recently, and this one was just released by the CDC um, before the winter break, 
that it compared children who tested negative to those who's positive. And the graphic on the next slide actually comes directly from that study. And so compared with children who tested negative for the virus that causes COVID, children who tested positive were more likely to have attended a social event, right, outside of school. They were not more likely to have attended um, childcare or school in person, right? So it's the fact that um, students are getting exposed outside of school. And some of that is because schools uh, that are, uh, have some form of in-person instruction have really good mitigation practices in place. Right. Um, unlike the, you know, you may not be able to rely on those things as much in general out in public events. So we think that's an encouraging data point and relatively new in the science. From our own um, children's hospital, um, this is not a slide that we created. This is actually from the Southeast Wisconsin School Association. So that's the group that I said regularly meets. It's all of the, or almost all of the school districts in Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, and they were asked this question, should schools consider virtual to reduce the burden on local health care? So this is when things were starting to spike. And I circled B just because it was one of the responses from one of the doctors that how impressed they are with the measures schools have taken. And again, schools that are open. Um, so they don't know if virtual would reduce burden in the community. Um, and I think it, it addresses some of kind of what some concerns were this evening in public comments. And then Dr. Johnson is our medical director. All school districts are in the state are required to have a medical director. And this was an email we re re uh, received from him uh, regarding the return to school committee meeting that was held on Friday, December 18th. And he said he couldn't make it, but he was supportive of kids going back to school. And that was consistent with you know um, CDC guidance and with more recent um, comments from Dr. Fauci in particular uh, focused on Wisconsin. So as those pieces line up, it starts to make sense that we would learn from the new information and then consider adapting. And so what we're considering adapting is uh, more in line with what a number of our neighboring school districts have done is start to really focus on the internal metrics. So a positive case rate and a staff absence rate. The positive case rate, um, we don't have 14 days of data yet, and we're going to start um, turning that into, again, assuming the board approves all of this, turning it into the 14-day average. And so for less than 1.5%, uh, we would be in-person learning. So that's phases four and five. Um, if we're 1.5 to 3% positive case rate, we would be in distance learning. Phase two and three and more than 3%, we would be in virtual learning. So if it goes above three, we would go back to virtual. That may have some interplay or may be separate from the staff absence rate. Um, and this may evolve a little bit yet. Uh, we had some um, pretty lengthy conversation about it this morning, in fact, as a leadership team. And it may need to vary from school to school uh, because some schools can um, operate uh, well if 20% of staff are missing because that may be two teachers and they're used to doing that under normal circumstances and on um, a large building like a Hale or a Central where 20% of staff are missing, it's going to be very difficult um, to get through a school day in a way that's um, safe and effective for learning. So there's a little more work to be done there, but the concept of a staff absence rate is consistent with what other neighboring school districts have done. There needs to be a um, kind of decision point that says it's just not, we just don't have enough staff to effectively operate a school. Uh, and what that starts to look like, and this is a draft, of um, a revised dashboard. So again, it's the very same information that was on that slide. We'd start tracking the positive um, case rate, the 14-day average um, at the district level and at the school level, and then the daily staff absence rate. So, you, so parents can start to see kind of where are we and is this starting to shift? One of the things we've learned from some of our neighbors that are using this, uh, this particular approach is that, yeah, you can start to see maybe a district level start to move into, oh, we're getting close to 3%, we're probably gonna go over 3%. Um, they give a two day notice that we're going back to virtual. But they said, before you do that, drill down to look at, is this coming from a particular school? And they said, often that's the case, um, that there may be a, a school where there's some spread and that school needs to close, just not, not the whole district. Um, but there have been examples in our, in our surrounding area when they are in, um, in person and they have this kind of metric set that they have gone back to virtual. Uh, and so it is less predictable um, or reliable, that's true. 
We will continue to track our external metrics. They're still included in the dashboard. And I think it'll be interesting to see if this in fact starts to move in the direction that we had set initially. And if that starts to kind of um, come together with both the internal metric and the external metric. And again, this is the same information that was included um, in the current dashboard that's linked on our website. So the so that's the shift kind of in metrics. So now I want to go into kind of what it looks like as we move kind of into and through phases um, two and three. And we're proposing that we continue a more cautious approach, even though metrics are met for higher phases, right? So if we're going to um, the board approves using the internal health metrics, we're well below 1% and have been since we've been tracking it. And that is also reported on our website. So I've had some parents reach out today that asked what is a pretty obvious question is, well, why are you going to phases two and three? Just go to phase four and five and get it over with. And the answer is because our plan all along has called for a, a cautious and slow approach. And I think we should continue that. I also think um, we need some time to learn what um, two day a week with some students virtual really looks like. And it's gonna be a challenge. And I think it'll be more challenging than all virtual and more challenging than all in person, right? And a number of um, teachers in particular have commented on that this evening. And I, that has to be respected. That's gonna be real, but we can't do social distancing um, in any reasonable fashion if we move right to all students coming back for four or five days a week, right? So that um, doesn't, that would be inconsistent with safety and well being, right? Um, and practicality of implementation. So a recommendation is even though metrics call for higher phases, we start phasing in as we originally planned. That phase in would um, have a, a couple of days at the beginning of the second semester to introduce just 4K, 5K, 6, and 9 to their buildings, because these are um, students that either have not or um, likely have not ever been in their new school. And so for a couple of days for that transition, in particular for 4K and 5K students that are just that are new to school in 5K, so that elementary schools can make a plan to even spread those kids out more during the day. They maybe maybe they don't come for a full day, but they come for an orientation and a time to see their teacher in, in their mask, but in their classroom. You know, a mom, a dad, or a, or a grandpa can come with um, if we limit the numbers. So we do good social distancing because that's um, on a normal year, it's stressful for lots of 4K kids and moms want to come in and give the last hug and help the kids stop crying. And so we're anticipating that's true um, as we would move into phases two and three as well. And then we would move all um, students into phases two and three together on February 1st. And there's the next couple of slides are just a calendar version of this that'll go through a little more quickly. The student teams are Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. We originally started there, then we changed it with some feedback that said Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday would be better ways to put the teams or cohorts together because it um, spreads out the instruction a little bit more um, throughout the week. But as we moved further um, into our fall semester, we got more feedback from teachers that, that didn't like that particular idea. So we did get input from teachers along the way and quite a bit, um, Deidre and I, have, did open town halls for all employees. We also then did um, meetings with teacher leaders, uh, one at the secondary level, um, included department chairs or ILTs at uh, Central. Uh, and then a group of teacher elementary leaders and their feedback um, caused us to shift back to a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday kind of team organization. But saying that, this goes by last name, um, and we adjust for you know family members that may have different last names and get them in the same team. Um, but we also will adjust if if there's a conflict for a work schedule. Those kind of things uh, we've been working on throughout this, and that's simply a, a parent calling the principal and saying, "Can I change the the team I'm in? Here's why," and we're accommodating those as best we can. Um, Wednesdays are very much like they are right now. So Wednesday elementary is virtual learning. And, you know, we are um, telling principals to provide, you know, if there's a need for a teacher or for a class to have more asynchronous time to work through kind of individual um, responses to, to make sure we accommodate as many needs as, as reasonably possible. Wednesdays for secondary are check and connect. So that's about a half a day of um, very much that, you know, teachers checking in, connecting, um, following up with students they haven't seen, and about a half a day that's, 
you know, planning for the virtual learners. And then the virtual learning uh, only will continue as an option, right? So that will, will stay through the end, at least through the end of the year. And if um, the board approves, you know, the next item on the agenda this evening, that's not a final approval of a opening a virtual charter school. There's still approvals with DPI and bringing it back to the board for final approval. But we think the feedback we've been getting um, from some parents that opening a virtual only option probably is wise right now. And we're not the only district in the state. There's 60 plus districts that are considering this as an option for next year. And then we would target phases four and five after spring break. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how that might fit in. So here's the kind of the calendar version of it, right? There's a, a teacher planning day already on the 18th. So that gives us some good time to consider what um, school will look like on the 28th and then even more so on February 1st. Um, there's a teacher record day. So that really is a teacher work day, um, but there may be voluntary kind of planning meetings that schools will um, hold. This is a professional development day that the board approved. And if the board approves this plan tonight, um, more of that may be used for the planning to get ready for, you know, two days a week of in-person learning. Wednesday is just as I described and a cleaning day. And then just as I described, we would start with just the kids that are new to their school buildings on the 28th and 29th. Um, and then February, we start to implement the kind of routine, right? So the, um, the Monday, Tuesday team, the Thursday, Friday team, and Wednesdays, we'd ask all teachers to teach from home. Um, and then, um, and that's really to provide kind of ease of access to classrooms for custodial and cleaning staff, right? So that they don't have to plan around teachers. They know all classrooms are available for cleaning. Uh, but the other staff that are currently expected to report to buildings would continue. So that's um, educational assistants, custodian secretaries, um, school leadership. Um, food service. Um, so that would continue as um, is currently in practice. So a little bit more kind of background information about, you know, as we move forward, what are the things we're paying attention to in moving into um, two days a week? So one of the things in, in the feedback of this, you know, of this question, what factors are really important that we consider? And the top three that showed up, temperature screening for students and staff, well, that's no longer rec uh, a recommendation. Right? So it's just not a recommended practice anymore. And there's so many other things that contribute, can, can trigger temperature, especially in little kids, um, that it's just not a, a practical, right? So we think of practicality of implementation. Um, it's, it's not supported in the science and it's impractical. But the second one, staff are trained in CDC guidance. So those days leading into um, where we would launch in-person learning will be used for some of that. Um, so the guidance to reduce likelihood of COVID-19 transmission, but the general inf the information available in the public is the same that'll be included in this kind of training. Right? So we're all pretty familiar um, with this guidance at this point. Um, regularly scheduled adult supervised hand washing that has more to do with elementary kids and many classrooms have sinks. Every classroom in the um, in our school district right now is equipped with a gallon jug of hand sanitizer and we've purchase hand sanitizer in 55 gallon jugs. Um, so we have plenty of it. We have availability of masks and face coverings for everyone. Um, and so every classroom has at least two per student available and most kids will come with their own as what we know from our neighbors. Um, we are requiring teachers and staff to wear masks and face coverings. And for um, some teachers that would prefer, we have N95 masks. We also have face shields and some um, based on some student needs, We'll need to shift to either the masks that have some clear um, plastic in the center or just the face shields. Um, and then we are also going to continue, just like our initial plan, our original plan, required that all students uh, wear masks. Um, another question. Um, so what are your top three priorities for cleaning disinfecting? So enhanced cleaning during the schools, and we have a plan in place for that, and we've purchased all kinds of new equipment, and I'm going to share a video here in a minute. Um, that will be shared more broadly should the board approve the plan about our um, enhanced cleaning and sanitizing practices. Um, hand sanitizer, as we talked about, limiting classroom seating to main social distancing. And so that is one of the bullets I think is really important for us to attend to as, as we also think about why we're not moving directly to phases four, four and five, right? One of the priorities of parents was limiting classroom seating. Um, we can't do that in, in phases four and five. Right. The other things, um, schools will stagger schedules. 
Uh, and so that includes um, drop off in the morning, pick up in the, in, at the end of the school day, um, how transition happened in hallways. So schools are working through and have already a lot of detail in those plans. We asked them to build those plans months ago. Um, our district leadership team did a meeting with every single leadership team in every single school to review their plan and to um, share kind of what we're seeing as best practices across schools. Our intent is um, if the board approves this, we're going to do that again. We, this morning we even talked about do we need to do some Saturday mornings just to, be, to um, use our time well in order to revisit the detailed kind of phase two plan for our phase three plan for every single building. Um, cafeteria um, seating a space, that's the plan, and, and where it can't be, there are the plexiglass dividers, um, and uh, Sodexo is ready to go with what are now the recommended practices in, you know, when we're serving in schools. And then um, social distancing in hallways, it's not going to be perfect, right? Somebody me um, mentioned that. Having fewer than half of the the students in school at any one time during social distancing because a lot of kids will remain all virtual and we'll touch on that on the later slide. Um, it will provide opportunities for some social distancing in hallways and common areas. All hallways are now marked with the, we're very familiar with the brown, you know, stickers with the feet on it and a reminder to stay six feet apart. There's signage everywhere, all of the and this will be in this will be in the video, so maybe I can just save it for later. Um, so some of the the other pieces that are in our set of practices. So there was also pulse check surveys, right? So then the most recent was the 90 day survey. So that's just a short, quick survey to get some feedback on how we're doing in our efforts to improve kind of the overall student learning experience. It didn't ask, you know, should we um, go back to or should we change our plan or should we move to distance learning. This was really about the implementation of the current plan. Here's who participated. So we have very good participation. It dipped a little bit from the first to the second implement, uh, uh, administration of the survey. That's not uncommon, but um, it's still nearly all employees and a good representation of parents. So there's some things we can celebrate. And it, it's, you know, in the midst of all of this, it's, it's hard to find um, um, silver linings in clouds, but there are some. Uh, and so parents are reporting they have good access to their child's teacher and feel confident the school is keeping the child safe. Okay, so I think that speaks loudly and in a different way about, you know, the work our teachers have been doing. We've heard a lot of really supportive comments about our teachers and I echo every single one of them. Um, I get invited into Zoom classrooms and every now and then a principal will kind of take me into a Zoom classroom and I'm every time just truly inspired and impressed by what I see. Um, and so that feedback from parents is consistent. Um, staff continue to feel confident the school is creating a safe learning and working environment uh, and, and know what is expected, right? So even though there's some um, expressions and public comments of concerns about this, the overall feedback is there's a sense that we're working to create safe learning environments here. Um, what we're most proud of, and even though there's still um, comments about, I feel like I don't have input, the, the one question I am involved with providing input to overcome these challenges improved when almost everything else went down. When I get to the slide, maybe it was everything else went down. And that's, I think, because of what I described that, you know, Deidre and I have taken the steps to try to gather more input and to, when we, um, teachers are expressing concerns about a particular part of the plan and we hear it several times and like, oh, we got to get a group in the room with us to really understand what what's the nature um, and the kind of extent of that feedback. Um, oops, sorry. So here's the actual kind of results. This is on a one to five scale. So you can get a quick look at um, from parents kind of, you know, almost every single thing went down. The one that really pops out is six. I am confident my child will not fall behind in school. And we heard a bunch about that this evening from parents during public comment, right? So that one has dropped and now we're below a three. And I think that um, is also an indicator that we have to pay attention to that feedback as we consider moving towards phases two and three. Um, the things we can focus on from this from improvement, and this is really more from the um, comments that are made, and we don't get all of the comments in these quick pulse surveys. We, are, we have a coach with student education. She goes through it and she says, here's the big things to pay attention to that come up over and over. So, and we heard we heard this this evening as well. Concern for child's social emotional well-being, um, the fatigue, frustration with in-person learning. We heard that, 
And then in, inconsistencies in communication and structure. And that kind of is, I think, um, it's a delicate balance for us where we want to try to continue our culture that we've built in, in our school district about there's certain things we hold in common, but then there are certain things that we think it's important for schools to solve as a school learning community. But that creates some uh, frustration around it seems like expectations may be inconsistent, especially during this time, but I, we don't want to lose that part of our culture. And so we think that's a little bit of where this is coming from and we're just going to keep working through that. There is also the employee um, pulse check results. And so here too, things have um, gone in the wrong direction, except for a couple here, right? I'm involved in providing input to overcome these challenges. And that uh, made a nice, my, nice move on a three point scale, or sorry, a five point scale. Um, and that uh, our, there's confidence that we'll overcome the challenges. Okay, so those things improved. Um, the other two that we asked for, on the 30, 90 day went down. Um, we. This was um, recommended by Studer. We didn't ask these questions at 30 days in. Um, we think there would be enough kind of um, experience yet to maybe uh, be able to respond to these. And that's what they did with all of their education partners. Um, so again, it's, it's feedback from a number of people. Um, so we're gonna continue with the, uh, this kind of, kind of gathering information. You know, there was some feedback, like how come you didn't directly ask the question of, do you think we should be going back to school um, or changing the plan. And there's, the answer is kind of threefold. First, we have just completed this survey. So the survey fatigue um, issue comes in. We're moving into the holiday. So we're not gonna get a very good response rate. And there is a general sense of where teachers are and where our parents are, given the feedback that has come directly from teachers and parents to myself and to the board. Right, and so the the general or the gist of that feedback is teachers are really concerned. We heard that this evening. I think that's consistent, and there are still teachers supporting the fact that we know we need to get kids back in, but they're concerned, and it's largely safety, right? And that shows up here in this slide. Um, and and parents or the gist is um, we need to get our kids back in school, and that's not universal, but that seems to be the general kind of takeaway from the feedbacks, and so. My guess is any a more formal survey of everybody would confirm that, and maybe it's just not necessary at this point to even take that step. Um, and then we've got to keep working on this one, educational assistance, no feeling disconnected in the lesson form. And so a little concerned about that. We did meet a couple times with the association leadership of our educational assistants, but um, we wanted to do a big town hall just for the educational assistants, but their work day schedules vary so much that we just couldn't find a time that would work. So we did record a video um, for them and that was well received. But again, it's not quite the same as even, no, it's not quite the same as what we call face-to-face -face these days, a Zoom meeting where you can interact even through, you know, um, the technology we've gotten so familiar with. So um, that's kind of a lot of background information and a little bit of where we're going. So this one is a little bit, so what does then March 2021 and beyond start to look like? Well, it depends on the impact of vaccine rollout. Um, if that, if the, if we get ourselves together on the rollout of vaccine, and that still are, uh, really starts to amp, ramp up, maybe um, that changes a little bit of where we are. But I, but initially, our thinking is by March first, we would expand sports and activities with access to limited spectators. Again, this assumes the health metrics stay um, in the green, uh, and we don't see spikes and big spikes in the community that may make us rethink things or we get different information from our local health department and, and holding more meetings in person. So that would be um, school staff meetings, potentially still socially distanced, still in masks, but taking a, a, a small step, right? As we continue to move towards phases four and five. And again, it's a being consistent around a kind of slow, cautious approach. Then if things again, continue to go well. Um, so on April 7th or maybe sooner, but April 7th is the, first day of school after spring break, we would implement phases four and five. And right now, um, our phases four and five call, call for five full days of in-person instruction for um, elementary and four for secondary because of the number of um, teachers that in secondary in particular that, that, that will be teaching both um, in-person and virtual. Uh, we may adjust that a bit as we see, if we see changes in the choices families are making around method of instruction. And when I get to that slide, you'll see right now, um, 
what stands out as, as a Central and Hale, well over half of the students at Central and Hale, Hale will remain all virtual, um, even if the board approves changing the plan right now. Now, parents may change that, um, and they're, they're going to be given the opportunity starting January 8th if they want to change their method of instruction. But what we've collected so far suggests that more than half would stay all virtual. Um, so the return to school committee feedback. So this is another piece of um, information that we engaged our return to school committee. It's a large stakeholder committee, um, 40 plus people. It includes um, teachers, educational assistants, secretaries, principals, district leadership, um, custodial staff. It includes health department representatives. It includes our, med includes our medical director, uh, includes parents. Um, and we worked through a version of this presentation with them. This one has gone into much more detail on the pulse survey data and the data from the much earlier surveys. But we asked them at the end, um, we worked through the presentation. They had some time in their smaller work, uh, work groups to kind of discuss it and raise any questions and, and discuss kind of where their comfort level um, sits. And the response was a, on a one to five scale that we're you know, used to using. Um, from a very uncomfortable to very comfortable. And here's what their responses looked like. Now that meeting had 29 uh, people in it. So because um, we had met mostly during the summer when there was more availability on Friday mornings, it was harder for teachers um, to uh, join the meeting because they were at work. Um, and so this may skew a little bit to the positive, but my guess is that the trend wouldn't change too much. So 17 were at very comfortable, okay? So none of these um, survey tools are perfect, but it gives you a sense of kind of where people are at and trying to figure out how do we move forward together. Um, so with that, what I wanna do is um, share the, um, the video that was put together and the, are the stars are our um, facility maintenance and custodial staff. And this is an information tool we'll use with uh, parents, with all staff to help communicate the kind of new cleaning expectations and procedures and a couple other things about um, uh, building ventilation. So we'll play the video and then we'll kind of move into the next fly, slide. But I think this answers a number of questions that are the common questions or the pieces that have even come up this evening. So first I want to express how thankful we are to everyone that has worked hard to address the myriad of challenges that we've been facing this year. It has been a rather unique year. As we move forward, I want to remind everybody that our school district's return to school framework is based on four guiding principles, safety and well-being of students and our employees, learning that works for all, responsiveness and flexibility, and then practicality of implementation. So with this video, we're going to be showing some measures we've implemented throughout our buildings to address the safety and well-being of our students, staff, and families as we return to school. My name is Steve Eichmann. I am the facilities manager for the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District. Our facility staff has been working hard to maintain the safety for our students, staff, and families during each phase of our return to school. And there is a difference between cleaning and disinfecting. And so we're removing the dirt with chemicals cleaning solution to remove the dirt before cleaning so the disinfecting is more effective. And disinfecting then is when we come back through after we have cleaned and using chemicals to disinfect surfaces to remove any bacteria that could cause infections and those kind of problems. Once we transition from phase two and or phase three, our facilities will be deep cleaned each Wednesday and on Friday or weekends, depending on our schedules. Deep cleaning will also be done if there is an outbreak of COVID-19 in the buildings or office. We are following Center of Disease Control CDC guidelines for our deep cleaning processes. We will we use high grade disinfectant cleaning solutions
When disinfecting, we ensure surfaces remain visibly wet for the contact time specified on the product label. We will disinfect all frequently touched surfaces daily, including desk cubbies, cafeteria tables, restroom stalls, and stall doors, door handles, pencil sharpeners, and sink fixtures. This will be done multiple times during the day. Cleaning and disinfecting schedules will allow time for the disinfecting product to dry and any fumes to dissipate before students are allowed in the classroom. Disinfectants will be stored out of reach of children and will not be used while children are present. Throughout all of this, beginning actually back in March, we've done a lot of ordering of uh, personal protective equipment, of uh, different supplies that we didn't have before. In each classroom, we now have hand sanitizing wipes with at least 60% alcohol. Each classroom has a jug of hand sanitizer. Each room that has a sink, we have installed paper towel dispensers. We also have the waste baskets now close to the sinks. Each classroom has two face coverings, two for each student and two for each staff member. And we also have plastic face shields available for staff and students. One of the things that we've done as well is we've looked at air quality in the buildings and in the classrooms specifically. Um, we've increased the air exchange rate um, in wherever possible. Uh, in some cases, we've doubled it. Also, what we've done is we've changed our filter and we had MERV filters before. And so MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. And it's rated on a scale of one to 16. The higher the MERV rating, the more particulates that it removes from the air. Um, in addition, each school will have at least one water bottle filling station. This will allow for the students to have their own water bottle uh, and be able to refill it safely as well. Uh, and our goal is to have at least two in every building, if not more. Our classrooms, we will have the students, when able, to all face the same direction and they are spread out, socially distancing, and we have the plexiglass. Desks and tables will be marked for when not used. We have established an isolation room in each school. So if a student shows one or more symptoms of COVID-19, they will be sent to the isolation room and their family will be contacted immediately and they would wait there with a staff member who would be specially trained to wait with them until they are picked up by a parent. I think the biggest difference that students and staff are going to notice in the buildings is that there um, are, you know, they'll notice the different protocols that have been put in place. They'll see stickers on the floor that designate how far away that we should stay away from each other. Uh, they'll see plexiglass dividers that'll help protect um, not only them, but also the, the staff and the students. Uh, they'll also see reminders to wash your hands for 20 seconds in the restrooms. Uh, we have put um, lockouts on all of the drinking fountains so that they're not used. It's a continuing um, in priority in making sure that, you know, what we do every day is make sure that the building is cleaned and disinfected um, for the next day's use. Each school will soon be sending a communication to their families about their updated pickup and drop off procedures and also new entry and exit points. For more information on the updated bus experience, please visit our website to see our new bus procedures video. Face coverings will be required. Students will be expected to wear their face coverings on school grounds at all times unless they're eating, drinking, or on a mask break. At our elementary schools, we are asking that you not drop off before 825 if possible. We know students like to get to school early and use the playground, but we will not have supervision before school as we did in typical years. Students will still be able to come to school for breakfast as they have in years past. Art, music, FIAD, specials, and electives will all look a little different. This will be based on minimizing transition and CDC recommended social distancing protocol. In addition, all schools will have a controlled traffic pattern and staff will assist in reducing congregation in hallways and previous gathering spaces. While it has not been easy to plan for such an unusual time, but we are confident we're moving forward now in the best way possible. The safety and well-being of everyone in our learning community will continue to be our highest priority. We can't wait to see you back in school.
Okay. Um, so I'm, I, I unmuted myself already. Um, so we're hopeful that kind of tool um, will be a good communication tool um, to help share you know, the approach we're taking to the cleaning, disinfecting, air handling, masking. Um, there'll also be a video. There's one that's ready to go on transportation, what that will look like on buses. And then we're um, gonna produce one on what contact tracing looks like. And Becky Hardgrove is actually, I think the slide coming up here will um, talk us through a couple scenarios to give everybody in the meeting today a sense of what that um, our protocol looks like. So some common questions from staff, will vaccine be required? Um, the answer to that is we're gonna have to get some feedback from the board, but um, in general, no, um, and here's why. The employers are able to require um, employees get a vaccination. So the board could um, take action to require it, but our attorneys have advised we don't because we'd like to be able to provide access to the vaccine through our wellness center. And so I've been um, talking with Zach and he's already working on, you know, how they would get availability and when teachers become, you know, move up in the priority list. And we'd like to give um, our, our employees, you know, you know, expedited or easier access through our wellness center. And if we do that, our attorneys have advised that since it is, we contract for healthcare services, essentially we are the healthcare provider that we shouldn't require it. And we shouldn't ask the, um, questionnaire questions related to genetic information. And so, so, so if you don't do those things, then our attorneys have advised they'd be comfortable with us providing access to the vaccine through the wellness center. Um, so that's where we are with, is the vaccine required? We're gonna strongly encourage it. We're gonna do public information campaigns for staff and for parents and for families that we strongly encourage it. I'll do one of the videos when I have my opportunity to get access to the vaccine to record it and share it. Um, because we think, um, you know, uh, people that um, other people know, uh, getting the vaccine helps encourage people to, um, if they're a little bit re um, reticent, um, to participate. So what, another question that comes up, what happens when a student refuses to wear a mask? Well, at first we take the approach we always do when students refuse to follow directions is we remind, we reteach, um, and then we move into what may be discipline, but um, we're not going to spend a lot of time in it if this is a persistent pattern or if it is um, something a family says that, um, you know, we don't think we need to wear masks. Um, my answer will be, that's fine. Then what you're telling me is you want your child to be in the virtual um, instructional method, method. And that's fine. Then that's what we'll do. Um, because our expectation is we're going to make our schools as safe as we possibly can. And the expectation is students wear masks. The only exception is that there's something um, medical uh, that means they shouldn't be wearing a mask if there's something required in an IEP. Uh, so those would be the only exceptions and we'll work individually with um, families and IEP plans through that. Uh, how will we monitor hallways and transitions? Now, I've already kind of mentioned this won't be perfect, it's, and it's been mentioned in public comments, especially for secondary kids. But again, hallways are all marked. Um, what you saw that in the video. We've also hired additional staff that will fill in in a number of places. We've hired um, the isolation room monitors or health room monitors, as we're calling them. So there's one in every school. Um, so when they're not required to do uh, monitoring of students that are uh, have to be isolated until a parent comes to get them, they're available to do support in hallways and transitions. We've hired additional um, EAs. We've hired additional youth advisors. So we've taken a number of approach to find try to find staff that'll create the the maximum amount of flexibility we can figure out how to afford and where we can find people um, because the substitute. Um, teacher shortage is real. Um, and so we've uh, focused on other kinds of positions to try to add more adults into our schools. Um, again, it, it won't be perfect, um, but it's a strategy that has netted us some uh, additional staffing that when we've gone outside of the traditional kind of substitute teacher hiring. Um, we get a question, isn't hasty given, given the spike that is expected from the holidays? Well, we don't know yet um, if there is a spike from the holidays. There didn't seem to be one locally after Thanksgiving. Um, and the, what we're proposing is we wouldn't implement phases two and three until second semester. So we have some lead time here to see if there will be a spike and we would know. And, and if the 
um, numbers really start to shift. You know, and if we see a dramatic shift in the community and then in, even in our internal numbers, um, we would come back and inform the board that we, you know, we think it's not wise um, that we would begin phases two and three at this time. So I think it has to be understood that there's flexibility that has to be built in this because things change pretty quickly still. Um, has the plan for safety been thrown out in response to a few parents who are unhappy? The answer there, I, I appreciate the question and I get how it can feel like that. So that's a question from a teacher and it's a, not a direct question, it's just a pattern of questions. Um, and, but the, the overall answer is no, right? Our, our first priority is still safety. The goal has always been to get students back in schools and you know we think our plan uh, addresses the safety concerns and given what we now know about the most recent science about COVID-19 in schools, it seems to be aligned, right? Um, can we get air filters for our rooms? Well, individual air filters in rooms um, aren't gonna do a lot. And we've already heard in the video what we've done to increase kind of air exchange rates and filtering. Um, and so we think we've maximized um, the benefits of what we can do with the current kind of um, air management systems that we have. Um, will staff be required to travel between buildings? Yes, some will. Um, and you know, we we can um, we can I've said this before. We can do anything. We can't do everything. So we can't um, staff every elementary school with a full time music, full time art, full time physical education. There's just not enough dollars in the budget um, to be able to do something like that. And then we'd be hiring teachers that um, six less than six months from now we'd be um, telling them they don't have a job. Right, so, so again, that practicality of implementation, but we will be asking traveling staff and providing them with additional masks. And that's been a recommendation from our health department that they um, change masks every time they enter a new building. So we'll be supplying them with um, many more masks. And then how will we balance both virtual and distance learning um, students for, for instruction? That's a complicated answer. There's a slide here coming up that Deidre um, will walk us through. Um, just so that you can, we share some of the thinking with the board and for um, teachers that have asked about that in public comments this evening in a little more detail. So before that, what I wanted to focus on, what has changed and what's the same? Because that has also been kind of what a common question that has come up about, you know, well, we had a plan, why are you getting rid of the whole plan? And we're not. So what has changed is science about COVID-19 in schools. And I've highlighted that. Um, what we're changing is use of internal metrics and that um, has been supported by our health department. And um, the reason they supported it, and it was Bob at the health department said he has a high, and I don't have the quote written down in front of me anymore, but I recall it has a high, high degree of confidence in our kind of internal practices around mitigation and contact tracing that we've been using, you know, um, all along that, that um, shifting the use of internal metrics is something they're comfortable with, right? Um, our returning to school committee supported the approach. We've learned lots of lessons from neighboring districts we're implementing phases two and three together. That's a change. Um, and we think that makes sense um, if we're going to move at all, that we move um, all grade levels. And then recreation camps are going to change. And there's a slide coming up in a little more detail about that. Uh, much more has stayed the same, right? It's still health metric based approach. And we're continuing to monitor community metrics. And if we see something really shift in a dramatic direction in the, in the wrong way, um, we'll respond to that. We're still taking a cautious approach. We still have really good mitigation practices in place and ready to go. We have um, N95 and face shields available, plexiglass um, in all kinds of identified locations. Like the video, we have enhanced cleaning and contact tracing um, uh, all set to go. I don't know if there's another bullet because now I have you guys sitting there. Oh, and then this, what is the same, uh, which will be a challenge is the simultaneous virtual and in-person learning. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Becky Hargrove, our lead um, school nurse, and she'll walk us through a couple scenarios here of what contact tracing procedure looks like. And then Deidre um, will talk a little bit more in detail following that with the slide on the dynamics of simultaneous virtual and in-person learning. And it'll give me a couple of slides to give my voice a rest. So go ahead, Becky. All right. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit of background, we do have four full time nurses who have been spending a lot of time doing contact tracing for the district for our camps for staff, um, families, 
and athletics. And we feel like we finally got, knock on wood, a pretty good handle on the best way to do it. Um, everything is very individual based on each case, but we just wanted to give you a couple of scenarios that might come up as things go on if you have questions. Um, one question that teachers have had is what happens if kids are at school and they are somebody's notified that they've been a close contact to somebody. So for example, school's notified at 10.30 a.m. that the Smith children who were all present at school were with their father all weekend and he's tested positive for COVID-19. Um, the secretary from that school will notify us immediately by the COVID email. And that's just the fastest, easiest way because we're always checking that. We're checking that at nights and on weekends too so that we can follow up. Um, one of the nurses will follow up with the father to initiate the investigation. The students will be sent home as soon as possible. Um, that said, it is in that situation, it's not an emergency. We certainly won't run in and grab them and say they have to, you know, go right now. We'll make sure that we do it in a safe and um, respectful way so that they don't feel like they're being ostracized at all. Um, they'll be sent home. The quarantine information will be given to the family. Um, the principal and the secretary will be notified of those dates. And then the nurses will follow up with them towards the end of that quarantine, just to see if they've developed any symptoms and to see if they're able to come back afterwards. Um, and a second thing that we might see is um, a staff member or a student who becomes positive after being in a building. So the scenario that we've given is a teacher develops symptoms of COVID-19 on Wednesday morning and tests positive on a Thursday. She taught her Monday and Tuesday group in person and that would be the last time she'd been, be in the building. The teacher would notify the nurses via the COVID email and staff's been given that information on how to do that. We would follow up immediately with that teacher and principal to determine who she has been in close contact with as well as her isolation dates and when she needs to stay home as soon as we determine those close contacts we would send a letter outlining the exposure and the quarantine dates that they have and then we also do contact them by phone just to make sure that they've seen it and that they that parents can ask any questions that they have or staff members if there's a general exposure letter that's more of a just an fyi we had a case of covid in the building, but you were not determined to be a close contact, we will also put that together as well. Um, one other quick thing that I just wanted to mention is I know it was brought up that cases are just, we're only told by people who are self-reporting. We do work with all the local health departments. So throughout the day, we're getting messages from West Dallas Health Department, letting us know of cases who are positive and close contacts within the building. So it's not simply relying on self-reporting. Good, um, thanks Becky. Sure. Uh, and we are, um, we're getting close to the end of this. So we'll have time for questions, but we wanna, um, continue with a slide from Deidre that's a uh, little more of our thoughts about the dynamics of managing kind of simultaneous in-person and virtual learning when we hit phases two and three. So Deidre, if you'd go ahead and walk us through these slides. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks for sticking this out with us and for all of the input and the feedback that people provided earlier on during public comment. That always helps us to make the best, most informed decision we can when we hear from all of you. Um, so a few of the things that will shift instructionally, and we did hear, we've heard um, comments and we've gotten some emails about some of the concerns with um, being happy with the quality of the instruction that's being provided in virtual. And we heard some concerns tonight that some people aren't quite as happy with that, but we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on all of the work our teachers have been doing. It has been amazing. Uh, my children proudly go to our district and they've had a really positive experience so far um, in the virtual learning. Um, however, it is very challenging to do both. And so when we have our elementaries coming back for phase two, um, the students will be coming Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. In the elementary schools, most of the schools identified as a pod. So one teacher will just be focused on the virtual students during the time kids are at school and the other teachers in that same pod will be able to work with the students that are in person and then they um, rotate through those groups of students without increasing exposure to all of the kids. And so they take shifts doing some of the virtual instruction. 
In a few of our other schools, they've organized themselves so it is just one teacher. Some of the feedback we got early on from parents was that they wanted some consistency in the teachers wherever that was humanly possible. So we're trying to honor that within the plans that we're doing at each school. But for each teacher, they're going to have to balance some more asynchronous time just to balance the needs of all the learners in front of them. And we proudly trust our teachers to make the decisions that work really well for their families and for their students at any time that they need to. Um, some of what we were talking about earlier is our students have been out of school for a really long time. So with pending approval of this plan tonight and pending the metrics looking the way they need to, if we were to start those first couple of days when students are coming for a Monday, Tuesday or a Thursday, Friday, they're going to be exhausted. Um, similar to if you've ha ever had small children, they are that first couple of weeks you send them to kindergarten for the first time. So we need to be balancing some more asynchronous activities with still that opportunity to have a full day of school with multiple chances to check in. And we've heard a lot around some of the Zoom fatigue tonight, which is a real thing. And that does happen when we're online for as much as we have been. So we want to be sure that we're balancing the time in classrooms with students there, as well as the students who will continue to participate virtually as well as making sure that we have some asynchronous time so that we can connect with both groups and work on some of those relationships that we know are so, so important. Um, and that's just during phase two. When we go back to five days a week, when we move into phase four, then there will be a much clearer distinction between the students who are just virtual and the students who are coming in person at elementary. For secondary, as Marty said, um, we're leaving those Wednesdays as check and connect day for the whole year because that is going to be a challenge to balance the kids that are participating virtually and the kids that are participating both in distance learning as well as when we get back to in-person learning. Um, it's going to mean some more asynchronous time. Uh, we've ordered some additional cameras. We're working on that again today so that we can do more live broadcasting with streaming cameras so that the teacher can go around the space and do more demonstration and things like that so it's not quite as static. Um, we're going to have probably lots of students still participating on a device sometimes even if they're in person and the teacher is still there. Um, because that's a way that we can make sure that there is instruction for all the students and then still get into the personalized learning that we have been working on for a really long time and are proud of as they do some of those smaller group activities or as some students are doing something asynchronously. And then there's going to be the combination of all of those things. So that's going to flux quite a bit throughout the week. Um, and our teachers have done a really beautiful job at it listening to the families and listening to the students and knowing where kids are and being able to slow down. If anybody hasn't had a chance yet, um, UWM's radio did two interviews with two of our teachers, Amanda Hendrickson from Wilson did a, a kindergarten one, and then Ashley Dooley from West talked about her experience with virtual learning. And a lot of what we're talking about is that time to slow down a bit and connect more with kids um, in some of the areas that we've been successful. So being able to keep doing that and keep up the virtual instruction means that we have to trust our teachers to balance their day throughout the week. What we have asked is that they communicate very, very clearly to students and families so that you still have access to know what's happening week to week and as things shift. Um, there's been a couple of questions about the schedule at the high school and sticking with the 90 minute modified block, which we are a couple of reasons for that. It limits transitions quite a bit. So from a safety measure, you want to make sure you're limiting transitions. Many of our teachers have found some great success with that longer period of time. And if you're trying to balance even something simple like taking attendance for the students that are in person and the students that are in virtual, you need a chunk, longer chunk of time if you really want to get to some good instructional practice. So that practice we will keep and we'll adjust for days off and things like that in the schedule. So make sure that it's not always impacting one group or the other, one team or the other. Um, and then the continued use of online tools, additional media for the classrooms in order to keep con those connections going, both with the learner and the teacher and for, to have learners have opportunities to connect with each other. Can you switch the slide? Thank you. Um, and then the next section is on the teacher supports. Um, so this does take additional planning. It takes more planning than normal. This is new to many of the teachers. And then this adjustment at this first phase from what we've heard from neighboring districts is the most challenging. So we wanna be sure we're going into that with as much time as possible. 
Um, so the board approved an additional professional development day on January 26th. Then that day will be used partially to do some professional development, which we haven't done a lot of this year because we've moved those days to planning days. Part of that will be to have teams meet from across our district as we want our teachers have expressed a lot of interest in talking to other teachers who teach something similar from other schools. So we'll arrange some of those meetings. And part of that is to make sure that schools have time with their assigned school nurse to be able to make sure they really understand all the protocols and the procedures that are going to happen when students are coming back to school. Um, we still have the professional development days on January 18th, February 15th, and February 16th that will be planning days for all teachers. At elementary, during phase two, the teachers will be teaching virtually on Wednesdays, but schools have already built into their schedule some either more asynchronous time or some school-wide activities to give teachers about two additional hours of planning time on Wednesdays. And if you are working in a school where they're still making some of those adjustments, please discuss that with your principal, because um, that was part of the plan that we worked on together. And some of them have been coming along, but pushing for that time to go into Wednesdays so that our elementary staff have additional time to plan. Um, teachers will have fewer collaboration meetings to ensure that they can help supervise students safely in the morning, um, as well as have some additional time to prepare. And then we still have an elementary only planning day in this calendar on March 3rd. Um, for the secondary, one adjustment that we'll make to support our teachers is right now, the Wednesdays for Check and Connect Day are about two hours of connection with students two hours of open office hours. And then Marty talked about four hours of planning time. We'll no longer have those open office hours on Wednesdays. So the teachers will have that additional two hours a week to do some planning and some preparation, um, as well as if they need it to check in with a few of the kids that maybe were in quarantine or something else happened that was unexpected that week. So those are a few of the other things that we've tried to build in for teacher support. And then we've just asked that as staff have individual considerations that might need some additional support that they continue to work with their building principal first and we'll do the best we can to support their needs. Do you want me to do this one too, Marty? Uh, you're, yes, go ahead. You're closer to this than I am at this yep. point. Um, so this also, like we've said a couple of times, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So once we move into phases two and three, we're going to have to make a pretty significant shift to the camps that we're currently offering. And we again heard about that in public comment and we've been so thankful at the quality of the programming that they've been able to run and the safety protocols that they've put in place. Um, we're currently serving about 170 students in camps for five days a week um, for the elementary level. And because of needing to move all of those camps out of schools to make space for students to come in and still keep socially distanced and follow our um, safety protocols, camp needs to move to the recreation center, which also means that camp is going to need to be reduced significantly for the number of students that we're able to serve. It also it needs to shift because of staffing. Currently, it's staffed mostly by our educational assistants who will be needed back in classrooms once students are back into the classroom. Um, so it means that uh, camp is going to go down to a capacity of 25 students on Monday and Tuesday. And obviously all of this shift is pending approval of this plan or a shift into a different plan um, based on the decision made tonight. 25 students on Thursday and Friday so that on Wednesdays they can have all 50 students. Um, so of the families that are currently being served by camp, we're instituting a lottery system and we're just offering seats out of those 50 that we have available to families in the lottery system until those seats are taken. Um, and it's going to mean that some of our families who have really relied on camp are not gonna have that as a resource going forward. So we'll continue to meet with our student services team and try to problem solve ways to support our families as best we can. Um, if phases two and three go well, we'll also con consider additional um, options for families that need supervision on those virtual learning days. So as we know more, we adapt and adjust. And so once we get into the swing of things, if there is an opportunity to open up, um, if we have the staff to do it, to open up another site so that REC can offer more seats at camp, we'll continue to make those adjustments. Recreation will be offering before and after school care for the days that students are participating in um, distance learning. So if you are a Monday, Tuesday student, 
on Monday, Tuesday, you can come for both before care and after care and recreation will have a sign up for all of that um, coming out in the next week or so, so that they'll be able to plan at each site for again, how to follow all of our safety protocols and the mitigation procedures, but yet be able to offer before and after school care at the sites that we historically have offered it. Okay. Thank you. So um, next steps. So, um, and some of this I've already mentioned. Um, so exploring the vaccine distribution through the wellness center, um, the board consideration of our recommendation this, e this evening and really is, you know, we, what we need from our board is um, what direction should we take next? Um, and then with that direction, we'll start communication with families and we have some of that um, ready to roll. In the background, there's a new iteration of our returning to school website, which would now be distance learning. Um, one of the steps we'll take is verification of method of instruction selection. And that's what the, the graph here is showing. So this is kind of the current state is built from the method of instruction survey that we conducted um, in the fall at some point um, and where we followed up with many, many phone calls. And so this is what I cited earlier, as you can see here with um, Central and James Dotkey, the blue is virtual uh, and the red is distance. Uh, and so we're still gonna have a good number of students that remain all virtual, right? And that's pretty consistent across, but there's a lot of families that um, have selected very early on, they wanted to at least have their students uh, in what we call the distance learning. And that's for us as phases two and three. Uh, and so when we do the communication of uh, verification of method of instruction, we expect this to shift some. Um, and we think there'll be families that go both directions. Some families will decide that, well, the vaccine is gonna be so close, I'm just gonna keep you um, home until we get, get you vaccinated. That is reasonable. Uh, and there'll be some families that, that have picked all virtual and will decide that we just can't do this anymore. And we heard some of that frustration in public comments today and we're, we need you to go back two days, two days a week. Um, that's perfectly reasonable. And that's why we're gonna open the opportunity to change. It's a pretty simple thing. It's simply calling the school, right? And so that we'll have a school secretary or somebody else actually go into Skyward and, and make the change, but we'll communicate it to every family that there's an opportunity. And this was planned anyways um, at this time before we started second semester that we would be doing um, or taking this step um, to provide the opportunity to change method of instruction if um, families wanted to. Then we will you know, share the videos um, on disinfecting, busing, and contact tracing. And then again, if board approves it, we'll begin phases two and three. So our, our recommendation- Marty, can I just add one um, tiny thing, if you could go back to that slide, um, that the verification of instruction is their commitment for quarter three, mm -hmm. and that families will have another window of opportunity to commit for quarter four. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about the shift happening at semester, but we committed to families that we need your commitment by quarter um, because I know it's difficult right now to be thinking about life in terms of a whole semester as well. So um, those opportunities to adjust the decision will be at the end of third quarter as well before the next steps. Good. Um, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, so our recommendation, and this is the last slide, um, we'll turn it over to questions. Um, so our, we're recommending that the board approve um, the returning, the updated returning to school plan inclusive of these things. So internal health and staff metrics to determine phases, implementation of uh, phases two and three beginning with second semester. Um, and that, that's, I've talked about that. So we're implementing them together because that's a change from what the board approved previously. Consideration of implementing phases four and five no later than following spring break, as long as that's aligned to the health metrics. And then continuation of all other elements of the original plan, such as mask required, social distancing, isolation, quarantine when required, and any of the other details that have always been in the plan. And that you know included what um, Becky and Deidre um, just walked us through. Uh, and so that's where we are. And so again, like I started, we're looking for some direction from the board. And if there are other things the board would like to see included that um, the board can support or if the board decides based on kind of the feedback and the information that you gathered and collectively you decide that you'd like to continue with our current plan, that's okay too. We just need to get a sense from the board where you would like us to go next. So with that, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you to help um, navigate questions. Can you stop sharing real quick so I can see the rest of the, I'm gonna to try to see the board. Yep. 
Um, I'm hopeful that the board has their cameras on and others don't as much so that I can see the board members. So board members, I, or else I will just start going through the roll call and start asking board members for individual questions. So as of right now, I don't see anybody. I'm gonna try to keep I see scrolling. Heather. Heather, there you go. I see her now. She's on page two. I'm wondering to maybe kind of navigate through this. Um, can we start like at the first slide and see if people have questions about the first slide and just keep moving through it that way, opposed to going all over the place in slides? Keep it more organized and thought like, I mean, the first question may be about like the survey and then the next question may be about the cleaners. So kind of keep it chunked together so we can keep it a little more organized. So we're not jumping all over the place. Stephanie, it's, a, it's your call. There's 30 plus slides. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to work as much. Did you, if, if we have questions jotted down, that's probably going to be the easiest way is just to go. And I think some of the questions will be get other questions as we go through it. Well, then my first question would be the survey that was done for the post check-in was that was done prior to the plan being released, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to go into my next question? Which yep. is Different. Yeah, go through your questions, Heather. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we're talking about the cleaners and the sanitizing and things, do they have subs or will they be giving overtime or extra hours to people who, have, if we have someone who isn't available to do their job cleaning, say someone's sick or takes a vacation day, how are they going to handle that to ensure that we have proper cleaning and sanitation every day? Okay, so Steve Eichmann, I know is here, uh, I don't know what page you're on, Steve, but um, Steve, if you would jump in here. Yeah, it'll be a combination of all of those. I mean, just as it's difficult to find um, enough teacher substitutes, it's also difficult to find enough substitutes for custodial staff. So we've already talked with them. We have head custodian meetings every month uh, and we have one tomorrow. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about is that um, if somebody is short in a building, then others will um, be asked to step up, work overtime if need be. Um, come in over the weekend, whatever it may be, to make sure that we're getting everything done the way it should be done so that everybody is safe and they're as safe as can be. And Steve, we've already had to do that a couple of times just based on um, as the facility staff have been working in buildings. So you've already had the opportunity to kind of test that out a couple of times. Right. And we've also taken um, during that same what you're talking about, we've taken some staff from one site um, and we've moved them temporarily to another site to increase the cleaning at a site where there uh, maybe had been some contract tracing identified um, with individuals at that site. And then when that was all cleaned and everything was disinfected, then they moved back to their original site. Okay. Uh, my next question is, do all schools have teacher pods? I didn't think all of our schools had that when you're talking about um, the teacher pods and large versus small and blended classes and things. Do all of our elementaries have teacher pods now? Um, no, each school made their individual plan kind of on some parameters. The minimum amount of transition from students having to not trade teachers back and forth during the different phases, as well as availability of staff and kind of how they were historically organized. So most of the schools landed on a model where the teachers are working in a pod where one person maybe is now the math teacher in that pod of two, three grades, right? And then that person does the virtual math while somebody else is teaching reading and writing and then they flip flop. Um, so that the, um, the virtual students are having the opportunity to participate in with the rest of the class. A couple of the schools have a dedicated teacher who's just going to take all of the virtual students. It depended on in each school kind of who chose what. So a few of those plans may have some adjustments to them coming up as well, given the fact that if it was a school that had a lot of K-4 and through second grade students choose virtual and then two students choose fifth grade virtual, you're not going to have that all be one class. So the elementaries each made a plan based on how many students are we serving virtually? Where would their natural classroom placement have been? And how do we try to maintain the integrity of that as best we can? And yet have the fewest number of teachers possible trying to do both at the same time. And then the teachers have been working on at the school sites, what would that plan look like in and amongst themselves? So I met with a couple of the elementaries today and the teachers have started that process of how will they balance the day and how will they communicate who's doing what with who during the course of instruction? 
without having to teach both at the same time as we move through the phases at elementary once we get to the five days a week. Okay. Um, the next one was about the Wednesdays. I just want to make sure I understood that. Does that mean that like your elementary will get two additional hours of prep time, but our secondary schools will have like six? Um, the secondary schools already have additional planning time because they do, they will, once we're back, they're never going to a spot where they don't have to teach both the okay. virtual students and the in-person students. And so they just have some additional responsibilities when it comes to some of those things that um, on balancing even how we take attendance and how we do some of those check and connect pieces that are more of a double duty than our elementary teachers will be asked to do over time. And so that is where those Wednesdays were. So they will have then additional planning time on those Wednesdays, but a chunk of that time is going to just be in rectifying all the attendance records and following up with some of the documentation that needs to be done. Plus, you're going to have some of the students who you thought were coming virtually who will be um, doing in person and vice versa. And so as those shifts happen, they have to have some time to balance all of that. Okay. And along that same track, then what about our special teachers who travel between buildings? Um, so because the elementary opportunity. Yep, the yeah. elementary specialist is our biggest um, area of concern as far as how to help them the best right now, because again, they travel between multiple buildings and there just isn't a way to have them kind of pod up or do some of those other things. Um, Mary Pat's on the call tonight and she and I met with all the elementary music teachers already to talk about, hey, if you have creative solutions to some of this, if there's ways that we can support you in some of the work, you just have to let us know what they are within some parameters. Um, because like Marty said, hiring additional staff, three additional teachers for every single school is a, even if that was budgetarily convenient, um, it would be challenging to find that many staff right now anyway. Um, so we've worked with the individual departments and we'll keep doing that to try to keep the balance of their days. The principals are well aware that they are being asked to do kind of a little bit more. Um, and so they're trying their best to organize the schedules between buildings, because that was one thing that the teachers did ask us for, was trying to find a little bit more consistency in the schedule. That lightens their load quite a bit. So we've gone back to some of the principals um, to say, you know, here's the issue, or in a couple of buildings, the biggest issue for them was just the space that was being provided. So we've gone back to principals and tried to make sure we're doing the very best we can for that employee group as well. Mary Pat, did you want to come up? Comment on that as well. um, and as far as like music, because we do have the most traveling teachers in our department, um, we have worked very hard to make sure that the teachers who maybe teach band and general music are doing all of the same school on one day and they're not traveling between schools. There are six or seven of us that do have to travel between secondary schools around our lunchtime. That's just our schedule and we know how to what to do with that. Um, but as far as the elementary, I think the biggest concern is that they're still going to be teaching all of their classes. But now Wednesday looks very different. So are Wednesday classes not classes or are they being lumped into Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, Friday? And I think that's a concern of the teachers. Um, but I know the principals are, you know, working and I've just kept encouraging the teachers to keep talking to the principals. Work yeah, and that's part of what we'll check in on when we meet with each of the right. schools again, like Marty indicated, is kind of what here are the things that we know are keeping going as um, challenges for us and how do we address those at each right. school. And it, traditionally specialists have been on duties, but I don't think it's going to look that way because we won't have lunch duties and that sort of thing this year the way we've always in the past. So. I think here. that's all for now. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Uh, Kristen, you're up next. All right. I have a few questions, a comment, and a clarification I would like to have. First, when it comes to the hybrid model, I think that's the biggest concern parents have reached out to us to ask about. My understanding based on what I heard tonight is that all students will have two teachers now during this hybrid model, one for the days that are virtual and one for the days that are in person. If that's not the case, let me know what, it, what exactly is this going to look like? Yeah, um, and I can jump in on that one. So at, um, for example, if I was teaching at the high school, right, I might have my normal caseload of students in the course of the week. Some of them are gonna be learning virtually on Monday and Tuesday. 
Some of them are going to be in person on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesdays is still going to be my check and connect day. And then Thursday and Friday, I'm going to have my other group of students that are coming in person. And some of the students, while I'm teaching in person, some kids are going to be virtual while I'm teaching in person. So that staffing stays consistent throughout the whole time. At the elementary level, that you know, most of the students right now, almost all of our students already work with a team of teachers. So both from the parent requests to try to keep some of that consistent wherever we could, as well as the teachers wanting to keep their own students, they've worked it out within that teaching team or within that pod so that one of them is with some of the virtual students when we get to the next phase, when we get to phase five, or excuse me, phase four in elementary is back five days a week. And they kind of rotate which one at different times of the day is the virtual instructor. For those students though, during phase two, it'll look the same where they're coming to class either virtually or in person, but the class is gonna be somewhat similar between them, which is where that balance of some of the asynchronous time needs to come from. Did I answer your question, Kristen? Uh, you answered a question. I think the concern for me, though, is that, I, you know, I've got two elementary ed students at home. I don't see a pod system. I see my two teachers every day doing this. And I'll let you know right now, teaching asynchronously, I'm currently probably the only person in this 300 room right now teaching in person and virtual. And it is, in, it is extremely hard on even the most professional teacher because the double duty is extremely hard. Also, my concern is hearing that situation float out there is the fact that it's now January. If my kids were to go back to school, does that mean now they're going to have a new teacher by February, March? Because they have no. not been exposed to additional teachers. Um, correct. They wouldn't have a, a new teacher. And again, for the individual schools, for the elementary schools, it's difficult for me to say exactly what your student's experience would look like versus a student at another school. The principals all have that kind of mapped out at each school site. So if there are concerns around how they're balancing that, then we can ask each individual. We have a couple elementary principals on tonight who I'm sure would be happy to share their plan. But the idea would not be that the students are flip-flopping teachers. So if your student chose to be coming in person, some of the students would be participating virtually during that time at the same time that you've got the other students. But in the pod of teachers, they'll balance that out so that you're not getting additional teachers you're getting the same group of teachers. You just might have some of them at some parts of the day and others at other parts of the day. And they figured out a way to do that and keep kids socially distanced at school. All right, that might be something and I'm eyeballing Mr. Johnson right now and he can't see me do that. Um, I do have a question though. I think this is probably for anybody who wants to answer it. How many families, um, I know we surveyed at the beginning of the school year so we should have these numbers. How many families have said they actually wanna do hybrid? So I don't know that we have the totals on that slide, but Beth, if you're here, um, or Aaron. Um, uh, I'll get the numbers. Okay. All right. And so then uh, my questions are based on that then. So um, I would like to see those numbers. And I also would like to know what class sizes then would look like. Figuratively, I know, I know it's, it could change. We could have families then say now, oh, we're going to wait till five days or not change at all. But figuratively looking at our original data of parents who said they would prefer a hybrid, what are those class sizes? What are those going to look like? Um, right. so the, well, the, um, the class sizes should be pretty small because we're still going to have a large number of kids based on that original survey that are going to stay all virtual. And so you take that um, group of students out and, that, and then you take the rest that want to come back for two days a week and you divide them in half. So now you really have small class sizes on because you're, you're serving maybe a third of the student population at a time, right? So you're in the 10 to 12 range of kids in the classroom. And that's, and that's what we want to get to for social distancing. Okay. Um, I guess I just wish by here January that we'd actually have solid numbers for that. I'm a numbers person. It's same when it comes to looking at the data right now, when it comes to infection rates, I don't see the numbers looking in the direction right now. Um, something I wanna make a comment to is that um, a lot of parents that are frustrated, a lot of it comes to, I think I believe Schoology and how individual teachers and individual schools are 
um, addressing work. And I'm wondering if as a district coming down from Deidre and Marty, um, we need more of an umbrella saying this is students are given this many days to submit work and that's it as opposed to individual teachers who are hardlining because virtual learning is not equitable. So we need to find a, a better way to make this equitable moving forward, whether we move forward with a change or whether we keep the system going. Um, that is one of the biggest gripes I'm hearing and it's completely legitimate. Yeah, um, uh, and we had addressed that very much so from the start to say that assignment yeah. shouldn't be due until after a weekend. And so at least giving the students through the following weekend, we followed up with a couple of schools when they've had specific incidents and principals have followed up with a couple of teachers who um, weren't allowing some of the same flexibility that we had asked for at the start of the whole process. And so if there are individual concerns about particular teachers or, or people not making some of that flexibility available, I would highly encourage people start with your building principal and then we can look into some of those individually. But certainly that's something I can remind staff of when I see them in January for the PD day. Um, it's just kind of those uniform measures that we wanted to be consistent for all families to give them some time to kind of process and get through the assignments that are being given. Okay. And um, last thing was a, a lot of us received a uh, some feedback from teachers, from a, a, a large group of teachers. And I went through and numbered out every response based on the score they provided of their confidence in the district making good decisions and um, moving back into person and 64 percent score was at a one or a two and um i think there hasn't been enough clarity and i would hope that as a district that's hoping to put out a better teacher package benefits package and teacher retention rate that we really think carefully about honoring what our teachers have said just because um, we want to keep these great teachers in our district. So I um, that was more of my last comment I wanted to put out there into the wilderness. Yeah, I'm going to follow up a little bit with it. And then Beth, I think, has the number. Yeah, so the that, that particular survey was administered by the Teacher Association. We appreciate they did it, and we appreciate that they shared it with everybody. It only had 132 responses, and the average was 2.18 um, in terms of um, five-point scale. So among that 132, which is a small set of teachers that responded, granted it was over the holiday break, so I understand that. And, but 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 it's what I referenced earlier: the the consistent pattern among teachers is concern and anxiety, and I think that's fair. And again, our you know our, our job and the board's job here is to find what's the right balance between teacher concern and student and parent need. Right? That's what we're asking the board to do this evening, and that's hard. Um, but that's what we need. Uh, so Beth, if you got those numbers. First of all, we, we have been working with parents for their method of instruction throughout the fall. Um, we asked them and then we went back and double checked and then we even contacted some that had not responded to verbally go over it. So there's been a lot of work on this and we're gonna continue to give parents that choice. Right now we have 2,279 students who want to remain virtual, 4,564 students who wish to be in the distance learning, and 528 that will wait for the in-person or phase four and five. Okay. Again, 2,279 will remain virtual, 4,564 would like some access to school and 528 will remain home until it's safe to come to school um, in phase four and five. Thank you, Beth. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I know uh, Christine had her hand up. Christine, did you want to go next? I know you were going to chime in last time. Sorry. Still muted though. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, I know we talked a lot about Wednesdays, but they're the third week in Friday, assuming this all, you know, goes through and we the goal is to get kids back in school, right? So, but what happens in that third week in February when there are those professional planning days? And then how do we balance that with the 
A through L kids and the M through Z kid later in that week? Um, yeah, that's a very valid question and something that's on our list of things to discuss with um, principals as we go forward. So we'll have to make some adjustments because otherwise that would be a whole week of instruction where the teachers and the families didn't have the Monday, Tuesday students and you only saw the Thursday, Friday students. So when we've had that so far this year, because we do that modified block schedule at the high schools, we've simply adjusted sometimes to make a seven period day occasionally, or we've adjusted those days. So we'll have to figure that out a little closer to that time frame so that we can balance those days. Cause that most of the professional development days fall on either a Monday, um, most of ours do. And so trying to make sure that we are balancing that for families and for teachers. The teachers don't like that when you get really a whole week's worth of instruction with one group and you don't really see the other group for their instruction. So, um, but that's something on our list to work through as a team and get some feedback from the principals on how it would be best managed at the school level to balance those days. Okay. The other question that I had was around orientation for the four grades that we're bringing back. Um, at the elementary level, it would just be the four or five Okay, just kind of to connect. Um, it didn't seem to me like there was a direct plan. Maybe there isn't an overall district plan. Maybe each building will come up with their own plan. So maybe families can, can, check, can check in and kind of see what is orientation going to look like at my kids' elementary school for the four and five K and the middle school. And, and I think that allowing each school to have their own identity within how they want to handle that for their families is probably the best way to approach that. Yeah, that is what, how we'll do that right now. I met with one of the schools today because we were talking about our three-year-olds who participate in our early childhood program and kind of where do they fit into the mix of all of these things. So we've already started talking about that. For one of the big parts about that transition to 4K, 5K is when the parents are able to bring their student in for the first time. And so part of what breaking up those days for a little longer at that elementary level lets us do is a little bit more of what might feel slightly more normal. And that would mean we'd have to stagger the kids throughout the day so we didn't have too many people in at one point. So, so far, principals are simply just thinking of ideas around that. And then again, once we know some direction from the board tonight, we'll get into more of the nitty gritty details and the planning. Um, sixth grade and ninth grade will do something similar to what they had previously done. So they'll spend, um, we did an orientation at the start of school, if you remember, and we just had to keep kids in smaller groups and we moved them around the building and gave tours and had teachers introduce themselves either virtually or standing on the stage with only a limited number of students in an auditorium or something like that. So they would likely follow a similar plan, but we just gave some general guidance to it. And then each school kind of made it their own um, because it's how they welcome the students in normally. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm, um, I made notes, so I'll okay. have to. If they're if they're not answered, I'll go through them. And my, okay. my yeah. I'm trying to scroll through the pages to look for the other board members. I saw Brian. I see Brian. Now I just have to unmute. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. This this may take a while. Um, and, and first, I want to say I'm glad we're doing this. I, I think the feedback has been very clear that while our current plan is working for some. Um, for others, it's just not, and um, and we need to find a way to address that. Um, with that said, I, I'm a little apprehensive anytime we're compared directly to other districts because I think you're comparing apples to oranges. Um, other districts are different; they're financially different. They have newer buildings, they have larger classrooms in some cases, larger spaces in halls. So many different variables that you cannot account for. Um, so I think it's important to remember that all of our buildings are very, very, very old. <laughs> I don't know if I can use enough varies in that. Um, and I think Steve addressed some of those concerns specifically in terms of airflow. Um, I know he had mentioned that where it was possible, that was increased. Now, it sounds like in some cases that is not possible, at least not to the level that we would want. So I guess what safeguards are being put in place in those situations, what are we doing to make that environment a little bit safer? And that's where the, the change in the MERV rating and the MERV filters that we use, that's where that's coming into play. Um, we're doing that in all of the classrooms and all of the air handling units, regardless of whether we can increase the air exchange rate or not. And so 
um, even going from where we before we were at like a four and now we're going to eight to 10 in most of the um, areas that probably um, depending on what you document you read increases the number of particulates that is taken out of the air by anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Okay. And then Brian, just to add in that, there's been a couple of the teacher groups or when I've met with the student services group <clears throat> who work in some of those odd little cornery bookcase closety type things that we have in many of our very, very, very old buildings. Um, and so they're working with their principal now to make some adjustments to whether or not that's an appropriate workspace to continue or if additional PPE needs to be added to those spaces mm -hmm. that maybe are kind of smaller and out of the way, um, especially when I met with all of our counselors and social workers and school psychs. They weren't thinking about that and then suddenly the principal said you must have made a had a meeting with them because i suddenly got all kinds of new requests for ppe for offices and i said yep we all have to be thinking about our workspace and how that works and they typically meet in smaller spaces one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with students so we have to adjust how we do that so that it can be in a larger space with more ppe to make sure that we're keeping the safety protocols as best we can okay um <clears throat> I'm sorry, my notes are all over the place too. So I'm making sure I cover everything. Um, so we, we talked a little bit, um, especially at the elementary school level. I, I think I'm a little concerned about that because it sounds like, how do I put it? Um, there may not be equity from one school to another because each school kind of came up with their own plan. So it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we may have some schools where, teacher, where there may be a teacher who is doing both virtual and in-person. So in that case, I'm a little worried about the expectations and their workload. I mean, we're giving them two extra hours of planning time, but that doesn't really compare to what the middle and intermediate are getting for basically, yes, different age levels, but the same responsibilities and same level of work. Um, I guess, how is that going to be addressed? Because somebody going to one school is go going to have a different experience than somebody else since it's not being done exactly the same. Yeah, um, and again, some of that depends on those numbers. So for those 2000 some odd students that chose virtual, there's a higher percentage of some of those at one school versus another, right? So they had to plan differently than if I'm a school that only had eight kids that chose virtual, right? I'm gonna make a very different plan than a school that might've had 200 kids that chose virtual or 150 students who chose virtual. So how you adjust to that is part of where each school had to kind of make their own individual plan. Um, the elementary teachers, and again, I am, please don't get me wrong, not just missing the length to which our teachers have been working or the work that they're doing, but part of the challenge is lots of our secondary teachers see between 90 and 150 students a week, and our elementary teachers see somewhere at around 24, um, and I'll keep that number vague because we staff at 24, and then the buildings adjust the staffing based on um, the needs of that building and how they assign the grade levels. And so the volume of students that you're trying to keep up with at secondary is just simply slightly different than elementary, not that the needs are any different at either site. During phase two, the teachers are gonna have more of kind of a little bit of both, but that's again, where Wednesdays have gone all virtual and we've encouraged them to use more asynchronous time if they need it. When we go to phase five, that's really when they'll be in the groove of doing that plan. And like I said, the schools have spent an extensive amount of time planning around that and planning with the teachers to give a lot of input on what's gonna work best for them. We may find that some of what we thought was a great idea is not such a great idea. And therefore that's where keeping that constant communication open where teachers are going back to the principal to say, hey, parts of this just don't work because I'm suddenly doing a double duty or where we're trying to support like our elementary specialists, they will be doing both. There just is no other way to work around that. So again, like Mary Pat said, we're trying to remove their duties. We're trying to make sure that if they get really stuck and they need time to do a planning day that will help support them wherever we can, because that is asking them to do more. And they do see more students than a third grade teacher or a fourth grade teacher. So um, there, you know, there's, we can do anything, we can't do everything. And so we're trying the best we can to balance that plan at each school site and with each teacher to make it as reasonable as possible for the workload we're asking them to do. Um, <clears throat> we, we talked a couple times about the numbers in terms of preferences. When again was that last, um, 
were, were those last results from the parents in terms of what their preferences were. That's when do we... Uh, mm -hmm. So, so we did those in October and November and the, I can send you the actual chart. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, each court, you know, we have those, um, as of November. Now I have the data right as of right before we, um, left, you know, for the holiday. Um, mm -hmm. and then depending on what happens here tonight, We'll be contacting parents if they wish to make an adjustment they're welcome to do so um, but we have asked them now it'll be three times um you know but now we'll be maybe we'll be having some kind of change um, but we did that in october and november yeah well and the reason i ask that is because now with more of a plan in place i think that may impact families um perspectives in terms of what they want to do and what their decision may be. So I think yeah, I, the thing that worries me is because those numbers probably most accurately were last in October at some point, um, how accurate, um, uh, I, I guess I'm a little worried how accurate the numbers are of what we're planning on once an official plan comes out. I, I think there might be some uh, potentially numbers skewing one way or the other um, once that actual plan is approved. One thing that was a bit of confusion was the the fourth and fifth phase mm -hmm. um, waiting. And many of the schools took the initiative to physically phone parents and say, are you, sh you sure you understand that's staying virtual until, and many of them have eliminated any phase four and five, meaning that all students Either they wish to remain virtual or come back for some level of schooling. So when um, you mentioned having uh, kind of going back to families after this is approved or whatever happens, um, how long are families tied into that decision then? I, is that something where if they feel that they are not getting, again, want to be careful how I say this, but if they do not are not getting the type of education their child needs, will there be an opportunity for them to make a change? So we've asked families to commit by the quarter because like um, some of your questions and some of your frustration is when you can't give a really specific plan for like yeah. what's third grade gonna look like at this school because so much of that depends on what those numbers look like at that school. So if it's open to changing week to week, it makes it near impossible mm -hmm create a staffing plan that works. So we've asked families to commit a quarter at a time um, and then keep them informed throughout the process. So there'll be a window to adjust your decision um, starting on January 8th and then another window to adjust your decision before fourth quarter. In very unusual circumstances, there something may have changed, a student may have developed a medical condition and need to go to virtual or those types of things. Mm -hmm. And of course, the schools will meet with those families and try to do the best they can to make whatever adjustments are going to be necessary. But it makes it near impossible to plan for the instructional piece with any consistency right, and have a clear plan that you can articulate to families if the numbers change off and on really regularly. So following up on that then, what, um, um, what, <laughs> what are we going to do um, or, or what is the plan to make sure that, it, it, of course, the environments are going to be different, but that the kids are getting the same standard of educa education uh, as best as possible, basically, so that no kids are, are, you know, falling behind. And I guess following up on that further, how are we going to address the kids that have already fallen behind um, and, and have some work to do to, to get back up to the level they need to be uh, to move uh, move on uh, at the end of the year? Um, so the same practices we use all the time are the ones that we'll use to provide the best educational experience we can right, which are to do the best that we know how to do, to trust our teachers, that they know their students really well and are, are able to provide for their needs and then get feedback from families and make those adjustments where we need to, right? That's always our, our way of going about it. We always give some general guidelines to staff as far as how much time to spend on this or how much time to spend on this. And then mm -hmm. 
really important that we trust our staff to be able to make those adjustments within their daily schedules or how things are happening to best meet the needs of kids. We will have yeah. some students who, based on you know whatever <laughs> academic measure you want to use, and there's all kinds mm -hmm. of interesting feedback out there around how we're measuring what's behind and what's not. Mm -hmm. That's been interesting to follow. Um, but we have reading specialists in each school that'll continue to work with kids on, on any reading deficits that have developed or students who have had a harder time keeping up with some of the virtual instruction. The secondary schools are all prepared to support those students as best they can as they've been going through. We have been reviewing grades on a much more regular basis than we normally do and trying to follow up. As we know, there's a nationwide an increase in failure rates and those types mm -hmm. of so we've been working with teachers individually to look at grading practices to make sure that we are providing the best opportunity that we can to every single learner every day. And so we'll continue to do that as we go into the next phase. So from uh, then spending a significant yeah. amount of time meeting with the teachers even more regularly than they normally mm -hmm. do during virtual instruction, which is a benefit or a luxury of this time that we've had in virtual is that the principals are finding some more of those times because they're not running lunches and walking mm -hmm. around the and some of the things they would normally do. And so um, they've been working really closely on making sure that teachers are driving forward with the things that we wanna do and then putting progress monitoring tools in place so that we can say, this is how much we know the student has gained towards the goals that we've set for that student. And this is how much we know that we need to continue working on in a new way and then making adjustments. Um completely understand all of that. And I think our teachers do a great job. I guess my concern is as we're moving to more of a hybrid model where, you know, virtual already has been an increase on their workload. Hybrid's going to add to that. My fear is there's just not enough hours in the day um, and that things can fall through the cracks. Um, and ultimately it's great to say the parents need to stay on top of that too. Everybody's home life is different and that level of involvement we, we can't anticipate is going to be there for every family. So I'm just worried that there's going to, especially as we're moving to this hybrid model, that there's going to be more of a possibility for kids falling through the cracks through no intention of the teachers, just the nature of how it's, uh, of the amount of workload that they're going to have. Yeah, and I think, Brian, that's where keeping a close eye on some of the progress monitoring is so important. And if that teacher needs additional support in order to meet the needs of their students, that's where we went to a co-teaching model with all of our reading specialists. And most of our um, teachers that work with students with special needs co-teach and our innovation coaches co-teach in classrooms. And they do a lot of our GCT support as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is you wanna bring the resources to the students as much as possible and make sure that there's enough support in each space. And so we'll continue to do that. Sometimes the reading specialist works really intensely for an hour and a half a day in a school with a particular classroom because that classroom's progress monitoring notes are indicating that those students are struggling to keep up with whatever it is, the markers that we've set for them. And so we'll continue to adjust those supports and classes. We've, when we talked to the elementary specialists, one of the things that we shared with them is some of the extra staff that Marty talked about with EAs and youth advisors and some of those pieces, sometimes it's going to take another person going into that space to make it work. And so that's the parts that we're gonna learn and adapt as we go, because there's going to be a few of those moments where somebody says, time out, based on the split, I've suddenly got an oddball class that I'm struggling to manage on my own, or based on you know the circumstances as they've fallen out. And so we're just gonna have to keep our close eyes on a lot of those things and make those adjustments. But that's some of where we wanna make sure we are fully staffed as best as possible and have all those other positions available because there are just times when a teacher is going to need an extra pair of hands. That's just the reality of the situation that we're working our way through. Yeah, the other um, strategy that's being talked about, and it's a little, it feels like it's a long way off to start talking about summer school, um, but the summer school start to look quite a bit different. And I think as we um, see transitions at the federal level, do we start to see an emphasis and funding that starts to flow to um, summer school this year to help that um, fill that gap where kids have fallen behind because there's there's no solution here where that's going to be um, absolutely mitigated. Um, there are kids that are going to fall through the cracks, um, and and it, it's that that particular concern and motivates me more than anything else in kind of advancing. Like we should probably start moving into a phase two, 
because for some kids, we got to do something different. And I think that same urgency is going to develop around summer school. Yeah. And DPI has had already one hearing um, to get some input from some districts. And we had um, Adam Hingle from our office participated in that just to give our feedback and our desire to be able to offer more varied things in summer school for longer periods of time and potentially fund that at full membership were some of the questions that were discussed at the hearing. Brian, were you all set? Um, one more and then I'll <laughs> give it up to somebody else. Um, we talked, and I think one of the parents who actually spoke or one of the community members that spoke mentioned something that that's a concern of mine and it happens all, every year with anything is that um, I think he specifically said parents will give their kids medicine and send them into school. Um, so I was, I was, I felt a little bit better when it, it was stated earlier on that we're not just relying on self-reporting, um, that we are getting full contract tracing information and so forth. Um, I think we all know the reality is people are going to be ex exposed outside of school, coming into the school, um, potentially exposing others. Uh, hopefully that will be mitigated to some degree. Uh, I wanted a little clarification though, how long, and I might've missed that, but if we know somebody has been exposed, what is the required amount of time for quarantine? So this is Becky and we have it in the slide, in the, in the notes in the slides. So good job, Becky, to capture that. So Becky, I'll turn this sure. on. Well, and I tried to make the slide as <laughs> concise as possible because there's just so much that goes along with it. But, um quarantine the cdc still recommends that 14 days is the best practice for quarantining anybody so we get rid of that asymptomatic spread they did recently as i'm sure everyone has heard make some recommendations that if your local health department says is on board that you can reduce the quarantine time to 10 days from that 14 as long as you are monitoring for symptoms and don't develop any and keep monitoring through the 14 um, some health departments are also using their, there was a seven day option that came with testing. The West Dallas Health Department did reject that um, due to I, problems. Oh, the challenges of specific, specific testing timelines and being able to verify the negative tests so that we don't have people lying basically. Um, so in our letters that go out, we are still making sure to tell them that 14 days is absolutely the best practice and that you need to be um, cleared by a nurse in order to come back, come back if you want those 10 days. And we obviously there are going to be situations where people are going to try to move around it. We know that we've had some pretty good success though so far and I'm hoping that we can keep that up by having such good communication with families. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, I wanted to try to give most board members an opportunity to go before I did. <clears throat> um, I have a number of questions and uh, some of them are gonna be not maybe in the same line that other people have been asking, but uh, my first question is, have we done a stress test on the uh, Wi-Fi system in our buildings to ensure that we have the ability to do uh, teacher streaming as well as uh, virtual people logging into that connection, as well as other kids in the school on devices at the same time? And can that system actually uh, sustain that? So we don't have, you know, people with leg or people not being able to log in because now we're taking things from all different internet connections um, being narrowed down into everyone going into the school and, and having everything going through that one school network. It is, uh, I don't think we have phone in the meeting this evening, but it is a question that I explored way early on in the process is uh, if we suddenly had everybody back in buildings, but if we're all on devices, so maybe we're hundred percent one-to-one, would we have the capacity to support that and the answer was yes, is that we've built out an infrastructure that uh, would, would um, allow for it. And we haven't done a stress test. We haven't had the opportunity to do that, right? Um, at least you know, since March. Um, so there may be some some gaps in it, but the feedback um, from, um, from the technology folks is they felt like we were in a good, um, good place with it. Do we have any backup plans if something goes down um, in the middle of a school day or something, do we have extra 
you know, things that need to be replaced, Wi-Fi hotspots or servers or whatever, so that we wouldn't be just kind of floundering for a, a half a day or whatever in a building uh, where all of a sudden nothing can happen because now you can't even send everyone back to virtual because there are half the people are there and the other half don't have any ability to log into the school, you know, connection. Um, it, yeah, so I think we have, um can very quickly deploy additional hotspots. And that has happened in the past, and in particular as, as um, more testing has shifted to um, online platforms so that we have, those are really kind of maybe smaller, but they're similar to kind of stress tests. And we did hit a couple spots um, in the last round where we had, a, had a, and our tech folks flew in, I think it was Jefferson where we hit the, because some of the build, you know, this goes back to Brian's comment, our old buildings, um, and these big old um, walls that you know weren't built for you know Wi-Fi to get through, but mm -hmm. they were able to um, catch up with that and rectify that pretty quickly. So it really is a strategy of deploying more hotspots. Okay, all right. Um, for teacher absences, this is really one of my bigger concerns with moving back to in-person. And I know we've, we've discussed, you know, we hire as many people as we can and we can, um, you know, fill in as needed. Uh, are we going to be able to offer in instances where teachers are, are uh, maybe exposed, need to quarantine, but aren't ill, too ill to teach, to be able to teach from home? I know we have offered some people who have asked for the, the ability to teach from home just right off the bat, but that was, you know, X amount of people that we could afford to do that. Do we have place, uh, policies in place or procedures in place in those instances where people need to teach? And we're talking about teachers that just can't be replaced, you know, AP teachers or those many teachers that you can't just put another teacher in there to do the same thing that would be able to turn into a virtual teacher essentially for that quarantine period so that the education can continue. Um, the answer is yes. Um, that's, that is the plan. That's um, precisely kind of that's built in. You know, it's not a change in what we'd be doing. So for teachers that are required to quarantine but are um, not ill or not um, so ill that they they can't continue to teach, they'll teach from home. Then the challenge is, you know, what a, what adult goes into the the space to supervise students, and that's where the additional EAs or youth advisors, some of those um, uh, individuals come in, or or a strategy in a larger building we've discussed is, do you start to you know at a central. Can you um, spread kids out in a cafeteria when it's not lunchtime and have multiple classrooms of kids socially distanced and they're online with their teacher who's quarantining at home, right? So it's gonna be a combination of those kind of things. But yes, we certainly wanna provide that opportunity um, for teachers that are required to quarantine, but they can still teach. Um, so that is part of the plan that is currently in place. Okay, and would the expectation be the same for students? Um, yes. Yes, so if students are required to quarantine and they're not ill, um, we would want them in school learning virtually. Okay. That's um, also where, Noah, the metric around staff absences comes in though, because there will occasionally be a threshold at which you, know, you can't function in the school. Um, and that one would be then a time that we'd have to consider not, that school not being open for that day. It, it would be just for a day, you wouldn't be like, you know, we need to shut down for two weeks so that the quarantines can be, I mean, it may depend upon how many teachers are, are out, I guess, but. Yeah. And it would depend on what they're out for. So if you knew there were so many quarantine for so long, then, and we couldn't backfill those, then that might be longer. But the idea would be that sometimes you just need one day to ship some people around and put the right people in place. I am looking forward to the opportunity to be in many of our classrooms as a substitute teacher, as that's what many districts um, are experiencing now as well, is that it's all hands on deck and we all just kind of do what we need to do to keep the system running as best we can. And it was mentioned that the percent of staff that will be out would actually be building dependent. I mean, we have general guidelines in those metrics, but so um, would that be published at any time? So you know that, well, for Longfellow, the percentage of staff out is this, but for Madison, as you mentioned, they you know, have a smaller staff. And so having 20% of the staff out isn't as big of a deal for them. So that, you know, there'd be a more expectation, really um, an understanding for those who are staff members and students and families going to that school of when that threshold would be met. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, that is our, our intent 
Um, and so it was a little nebulous in that because we just haven't drilled into it um, or had the opportunity to drill into it just yet. Because there's also a dynamic of, um, because, you know, um, enrollment um, is well below projection, and that's true in almost every school district right now. But our current staffing, we left in place, right? So we didn't start adjusting staffing. We think that was smart. Um, but that that's not consistent across the district, right? So some schools um, are right on in their projection. They don't have built-in flexibility. Other schools do. And so that, that will also influence the percent of absences. If there's more flexibility built into a building, well, they can run at a higher absence rate and adapt. Uh, and so we've, we've got to really kind of drill into the details of it, but the intent is to right, establish that and say, in this building, here's the threshold that would cause us to say, sorry, we're, we can't open today. Um, or because of the, you know, there's now, you know, four teachers that have to quarantine for the next 10 days, we can't open for the next 10 days. Um, so there's uh, some work to be there, but that's the intention. Yeah, the sub shortage has been a huge disadvantage, but it has allowed Melissa Cherney the opportunity to practice that threshold in buildings. Like, so she knows as far as how many in each school, and we'll get some more feedback from principals as well based on their social distancing plan, but she knows down to the minute at six o'clock at night, if a building's gonna be in some trouble for the next morning and then she starts to alert us. And that hasn't happened a ton in the last couple of years, but we've had a couple of mornings that were close where she's had to call one of us very early in the morning and say, I'm gonna need you to get me some help over at such and such school because we were short on subs and they had a flu outbreak or you know other normal things that happen. So she's got a pretty good idea already of a structure at each school and which keeps it functional. And then we still need to get some feedback from principals on now, if that would keep it functional on a normal day, now putting our social distancing practices in place, what keeps it normal and functional? And then how do we make that determination each, at each school? And then try that and see if it works or if it, you know, and make some adjustments as we need to. Okay. Um, on Wednesdays, when it's a cleaning day, are teachers teaching from home on Wednesdays then? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to echo my con the same concerns that Brian gave regarding having to do virtual and um, in-person instruction at the same time. I think that is going to be and I've heard some teachers in our districts who have done it, that it is just not something that is very easy to do at all. And um, to ensure that if uh, this plan is approved, uh, that if teachers are struggling, that they have a ready avenue to reach out to, to ensure that they can get any supports necessary. My largest concern is that by shifting to try to get students back in buildings, um, we will actually decrease the quality of education that we are able to provide because of that dynamic struggle. And um, I just wanted to reiterate my concern on that and ensure that um, hopefully that will be communicated if this plan is approved and outlined what the steps those uh, teachers are able to take um, if they're finding that they're having difficulties. So um, yes, we're going to figure out as much support as we can. Um, and Deidre can add to that. But I think I, I have to emphasize again, I said it earlier this evening, um, I think um, all virtual or all in person is going to be better instructionally from the teacher's perspective and from the learning from the student perspective than hybrid, right? That's just, that's the honest answer. It's not going to be as good, uh, but it's the balance again, right? The balance of getting some kids back engaged in buildings that desperately need that um, is what we're trying to figure out. But again, we have to be honest about the challenges that come with if that is the choice, those are gonna be real. Um, and I would just add to that, the balance of the safety concern for the teachers. So ripping the bandaid off and going all the way to four or five days of instruction, that really, you know, we heard it tonight, we've heard it from multiple other sources that the safety procedures are a real concern for our teachers. And so again, like Marty said, it's just that balance of how do you you know, the system can do anything, but it can't do everything. And we're trying to get a system that has the most reasonable amount of balance to it and that, but there, you know, there's always an unintended consequence. And 
um, some of that's going to be a challenge. It'll be especially rocky for a couple of weeks and then we'll get in a groove just like our teachers always, always do and we'll figure it out. But the teachers who were really struggling with trying to figure out just the virtual instruction, we offered a ton of support sessions at the start of the school year to help people get over the hump and some specific training at school sites to help people get over the hump. And so we'll continue to do that as best we can. Okay. Um, in regards to the uh, the uh, 4K, 5K, 6th grade, and ninth grade that are currently scheduled to come in at the last couple of days of January, um, is there any thought into including the 3K group into that? And um, will the 3K group be, I mean, I know it's a much smaller group in general, will they be coming back in mass or will they be also on a, on a you know, split schedule like everyone else? Um, yep, good question. And I know I saw Laura on here. So Laura, if I don't articulate the whole plan we talked about today, let me know. Um, but yes, we would bring the three-year-olds in for that same orientation process, just a little bit you know, spread out as normal. We have some of our three-year-olds are, that are entering the program have quite a few medical concerns. And so it takes some planning and some organization to make sure that we can provide for their safety. And in a couple of cases, their doctors will recommend that they stay virtual for a little bit longer. Um, we've got a balance within our three-year-old early childhood team right now for one person to be the virtual instructor and the others to be able to do the more in-person instruction. Um, and to start, they'll follow that Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday timelines. Um, for some of the three-year-olds, we're gonna have to do actually a slower ramp up because that's even a long time for them to be in school when this is their first school experience. And so IEP teams, you know, our three-year-olds that are in school are, are in school through our early childhood program through special ed. And so IEP teams will have the ability to meet and make the adjustments they need to to the day for more or less as we go. Because um, that may be the case for some of our students with you know, some of our students, the issue is sometimes the length of the school day. And given the distance between when we were last in school and when we're re potentially re-entering schools, we might need to make a lot of adjustments just for individual students to meet their needs. And so we'll start that with our three-year-old program and run that all the way through our 18 to 21-year-old program. Okay. Um, in regards to the elementary pods that you had mentioned and having um, you know, one teacher kind of identified as the virtual instructor and one teacher as the in-person instructor. For some families, um, the teacher that may, they may be receiving might play a role in what um, option that they would choose. So in order to determine that, would be the best bet to reach out to the principal for the school and see if they have that laid out so they kind of know what would happen? Yes. Yeah, that would be because, again, each school has done that based on the numbers that they have at the school site. And when I say the balance of the day, most of the teachers are saying, like, for the morning, I'm going to do all the math instruction and I'll keep the kids that are virtual. And you're going to do the ELA instruction to the in-person kids and then they flip flop so that a teacher has also at the elementary that allows that teacher to specialize and only plan for one area versus trying to plan for multiple areas, which was a support that many of the teachers were interested in as they're trying to figure this out. Um, but those specific site by site plans, each school has those. So as a parent, if you have any particular concerns, please address those with your school site. So what you're saying that in most elementaries, if you had two teachers, if you were having a co-taught class currently in virtual, you're still most likely seeing both of those teachers, if you're both if you're in person or in virtual, just depending on, you know, what if they're teaching English or reading yes. or whatever happens to be that day. However, they've decided to divide up the instruction a little bit, yes, to keep those groups smaller. But the likelihood is in in almost every case. Um, that the teachers that the student has right now would be the same balance of teachers that they would have. It just would look a little different as far as where they were spending their time with who. Okay. Um, so as part of the planning for this, you know, there was some concern about making sure that there's enough classroom materials for each individual student when they're there in the process. Is that some process that's already started um, as part of the planning that we've been doing for months now, or is that something that will need to be kind of determined as teachers plan for what those instructions will be once hybrid is moved to, if that is what is done. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so what we did to plan for that piece was we, when we met with all of the teachers in August, we had like the, we used some of those extra days that we were given to prep for the school year to meet as whole departments. And so four-year-old kindergarten teachers all met and they made a list of, if you couldn't share materials, what are the supplies you think you would need? And then all of the, every department and every grade level submitted that big list to my office and we kept every school supply service company known to man in business for a little while, as well as had to open up a little bit of a warehouse at 9333 to house all of the stuff. Um, art teachers each made a kit so that kids aren't sharing materials in art. That's a place where we tend to share a ton of materials. Mm -hmm. So those are all kind of packaged up and kind of individualized. Our music department made, they can't do singing, right? That's not advisable under the CDC guidelines. And so, and you can't play instruments. So we've had to get creative. Um, I broke the news to the elementary principals the week before break that the, we've decided to substitute the recorders for big plastic drums that kids can drum on because you can drum with, yeah. So it's gonna be crazy loud and insane, but it allows kids to participate in music just in a different kind of way than what we would normally offer. And so we've tried to think of a ton of those things. We're going to realize 1000 of them that we should have ordered once we get that far. But then on top of that, when I just got a general supply list, so each classroom keeps a bin of things like dice. So teachers said, well, I just need more dice. So we ordered as many as we could humanly get our hands on and we divvied them out by school. And kits of all of that are sitting in schools right now waiting for whatever they need. So math manipulatives was a big one that was on the list from teachers. Um, Things like um, a lots of the art and music supplies were on the list from teachers, uh, extra number lines and you know all of those kinds of things that normally you put a bin of in the middle of a table and a bunch of kids all share. We tried to order enough so that they could either keep one set of them for particular, like your Monday, Tuesday kids and then sanitize them and do the Thursday, Friday kids can use similar sets or so that they didn't have to do that sharing at all. And those materials have all been distributed out to schools for everything that we've gotten as an order. Um, and then secondary teachers asked for a couple of other adaptive platforms. That's more of what they've felt they've needed in some of this just to make it easier to work with Schoology and Skyward and Google Classroom and all their pieces. Um, so some of those are going into place this week. So that's been kind of a rotating process. Um, and sometimes, as Mary Pat can attest, it's a matter of trying to take inventory of 1,500 shaky things so that you can put them each in a bin for each student and count them all and get them out to each school. It's been quite the process. Okay. Well, that's that's good. I'm glad to hear that. It's important, obviously, as part of what we're trying to do. Um, so talking about specials, uh, how will those will those work the same way when you're having virtual students and in person students will they just still basically be doing it how like they have been doing it. Um, I have concerns because special teachers are uh, very difficult to replace and if a special teacher suddenly has to quarantine because of an exposure XYZ. Um, you know, they would be moving back to virtual instruction if they were healthy enough to do so anyways. And so I just wonder if it would be safer to just have that be in virtual instruction um, to ensure that we don't lose it altogether. My concern is an art teacher, as a you know, PE teacher, music teacher gets ill and we don't have a replacement for them. Um, how can we mitigate that? So how, can you, you know, let me know what the plan is for, for specials. Um, sure. Um, so for music, I'll let Mary Pat talk a little bit about that one since she's here tonight and she's worked extensively on that plan as normal. Um, but we've made a lot of adjustments to like band and band lessons would still be online. You can do some things with orchestra in person because you're not blowing on instruments and exchanging air rates. Choir, you're going to do a lot more film yourself singing your songs at home and bring your video in when you come into school to balance instructionally like the things that we shouldn't be doing. We're not using the locker room to change for gym. We're doing a lot more personal fitness schools. And then days when students are doing virtual, they're, they're incorporating a lot more of the watch this video and do these exercises and then track your progress more or do some of the health related lessons when we're back. Um, in person. And then for art, it, that doesn't shift quite as much, right, outside of sending home kits of things for kids to work on at home and then having things for kids to work on in school. 
the idea that we could have all of them teach virtually and have enough staff in every building just isn't practical in the plant. It's just not. Um, th there's no possible way we would get enough bodies in spaces to be able to do that, even if we had a million and a half dollars to spend on that project or it would cost a significant amount of money. I'm throwing that number out randomly, but um, it just wouldn't be practical. And that's what kind of when we met with them, we said, what do you need right now? How can we best support you? That was one of their first suggestions. And I said, the issue wouldn't even be if we could pay for all of that. It would be finding enough people. We've had to get pretty creative with how we've posted some of these positions to get them filled so that we can have some teachers who qualify under ADA or telecommuting to be working from home while there's somebody qualified to supervise the students in the room. So that's the challenge in that. And some of that is, you know, we've encouraged them, the principals from each, you know, so um, I'll use the term pod again, sorry, but um, the schools all share specialists within a grouping. So those schools have also now we said, well, after the feedback I got from the music teachers when I met with them, I went back to the principals and said, as your groups, you need to meet and make sure you're figuring out how to best support those staff. And in some cases, they'll figure out ways to get a little bit more creative to try to do the best we can for those teachers. But that is a concern. And there isn't a, I wish I had a great answer for that one. I don't. So do you want me to jump in? Yeah. Okay. So no, there would be 65 art, music, and PE teachers that would need to have somebody in their room. So we know that that's not a, a, a thing that could happen. Um, but if look at, like, think about those teams. There are, if you think about three elementaries, there's two art, two music, and two PE teachers that cover three elementaries in several situations. And those teachers all have worked together to figure out how to not only work with each other, with their partner, their music partner, but also with their art and PE partner as well. So they figured out some stuff. Um, there's some shared equipment that can be used. The, we have those big buckets that we can use for drumming that can also be used in PE class, scarves, other sorts of things that have been purchased. So each child has their own set of materials. Um, so that is part of how we've figured out some of the elementary thing. And then of course, PE is still happening in the gyms, but the art and music classes are happening in their classrooms. So the teachers are going to the kids. So we're trying to eliminate as much of the traveling of the kids in the building as possible at the elementary levels. And the, yeah, the art, music, and FIAD teachers that have worked together for a long time at the elementary have done a lot of cross-curricular projects. So right. that is what will allow them, I think a lot about the team at MAN, and I know I saw a couple of the teachers from that team on the call tonight, um, mm -hmm. and they did the beautiful combination presentation last spring that was a lot of cross-curricular work. So when there is an opportunity to do that when you're stationary in a building, that does give you some flexibility to be able to split that up a little bit more. So there are thinking of creative ideas. We've offered, you know, some suggestions and some other ideas, and then we're going to continue to meet with them to see what supports we can provide. Right. And some of our planning in August was specifically how do you tag team what you're doing in music for PE the next day or that afternoon and share some of those, you know, more cross-curricular projects as well, because we wanted it to be something that was easier at home, but it's also going to transfer to when we're back in the building or can work for the kids who are at home while kids are at school. And I think about my own situation, I'll have 10 kids at school, 10 kids at home and four, five or six kids in a class that I will never see in person. And you know, I'll have my two devices going and I'll be doing my thing. And the kids will probably jump in and say, hey, we need to do this or so-and-so needs help or whatever. But I, you know, I kind of count on my kids to help figure out solutions to things that I don't necessarily know about with technology or ways to be creative. And just by what they've turned in for projects because we don't have concerts has shown that, you know, if I give them some leeway, they do some pretty awesome things. And we just keep plugging along and working together. That's just kind of what we do. Okay. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, my next question is regarding um, if this is approved tonight, uh, what specific metrics would be looking at in the community for pausing this plan? Yeah, so, um, 
my thinking is is really around if we start um, going back into what is now called is it critical no the kind of what's the highest level red no, uh, extreme is the highest we're oh, okay. cool. extreme so if we start getting um back into extreme or if the trend starts going there uh in milwaukee county and west Allis, west milwaukee that's where i would uh think i'd want to take a kind of district-wide pause um because i that and that's consistent with kind of taking a more cautious approach um, to all of this so it's and that's why we left the community-based metrics in the dashboard right so we're not abandoning those i think it's important to monitor them um but you know and, and yeah we are different than some of our neighbors and, and demographically quite a bit but some of the school districts that have done pretty well in moving into hybrid and now moving into even five person have had much higher um uh uh, COVID burden rates than we have had, uh, and they've managed to do pretty well internally. So their internal metrics have stayed stable, even though the community metrics are much higher than ours, uh, which has been kind of fascinating to me that we haven't moved, even though um, almost all of our neighbors have with, you know, worse metrics. But that just, that's outside of the question. The, the, uh, right, when we hit extreme, that's where I'm going to start going, okay, we need to pause until things um, calm down again. I think it's important to have those things delineated because um, I don't want to be pigeonholed into a situation that we've decided on and then information has changed. As we've said from the beginning, um, as we get new information, then we look at the information and determine from those uh, data points, where should we move from there? And if that information changes positive or negative, then that should be evaluated at that point. Um, I also think that if we are in hybrid, the same should be true. Um, if we're starting seeing, you know, a reverse you know, back into um, bad ter territory, because as you pointed out in the, some of the studies that have been done, although those are uh, preliminary studies that are low in number in regards to participants of those studies, uh, it's what we have right now. Um, most of the time, you're not going to get people uh, infecting their household members from school, uh, but you are going to have participation in things outside of school infecting other people in school. And that's why the burden rate in the community is still so very important to pay attention to uh, when looking at this, because even though uh, the school children themselves, the teachers themselves may not be super spreaders, uh, the community at large will be, and it will be bringing that disease into our schools. And that's the part that I'm concerned about and why I want to make sure that we are looking at those community data points as well. Um, because if it starts exploding there, it's only a matter of time before uh, we end up in trouble here. Yeah, I, no, I agree. And I think then we'll add that as in one of the top parts where we have the um, positive case rate and then the staff absence rate, the kind of the community burden rate trigger at, at critical. And so that um, that's known up front that that would be a trigger that would move us to back to all virtual. Um, and one of the, the things I like about that, and this is really a, a lesson from um, Franklin, the superintendent there, but she talked about once the, they adopted their plan and they had to move back to virtual at one point, she said it was pretty easy to explain to parents that were really angry that they wanted their kids in school is that it's based on the metrics. This is where we are. That's the plan. We're going to virtual. And that was pretty much the end of it. Um, and so that's helpful, actually, if the board approves that. And so that is a, a change we'll make to include that kind of at the high level um, of the dashboard that we would trigger virtual if we hit critical, or sorry, what was it again? Extreme. Extreme. The worst you can be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's good too, because then um, if someone gets, if we have to send an email out, you know, hey, this is where we're at and we have to make a change and you have two days. So, you know, you're going to have to figure it out that there won't be. And, and I hope everyone who's listening and who watches this later will understand that that is a distinct possibility that could happen. If we open up in hybrid that uh, you might get an email saying that you, your child can't come to school that day uh, tomorrow. And you have to figure out what you're going to do in that time frame, depending on what's going in in that classroom or that school or in the district as a whole. And so right now we have consistency because we know every day what to expect and what we're going to do. If we move to hybrid, that will change into much more uncertainty and possible inconsistency. 
depending on what is happening. And we can have the best metrics and the best um, safety precautions in the world at our schools, but they're only there for the time they're in the schools. And what happens at home and what happens on the weekends is really gonna play a role, a large role, in whether any, any move to hybrid in our district is successful or not. Uh, I had a question for, for Becky, actually. Uh, Rebecca, I'm sorry. I don't know you well enough. Yeah, you're going to call me Becky. Um, you mentioned that for the, um, uh, the, the health department was providing you with information if there was any reports of positive or, or um, you know, exposures that were happening. Can yeah. you, do you know how that's happening? Do they have a list of like all the students and staff that they're cross-checking against reports? So when they're, when they're contact tracers, um, follow up with any families part of the questions they're asking is what school their children attend whether it's virtual or in person and so from that then they all the contact tracers send all the information to melissa thomas who's our contact there and then she passes that on to us okay um, all right it's part of the positive case contact tracing. right oh, but they're also letting us know who our close contacts are so we're getting a lot of that information more so about students from the health department now. And I think a lot of that is just because the students are virtual. Sure. Um, whereas with staff, we're getting that far before the health departments find out because we've got that communication started. Okay. All right, I was just wondering about that. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna say is not a question or comment. It's, it's really, well, it's a comment actually. Uh, it's regarding the, the air handling and the, the filters that we're using. Um, so we, we have increased the air handling changes and the, the amount of changes, and that um, is important. That's really the thing that's going to help the most in trying to prevent the spread via droplet transmission. Um, the filters, unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to use the filters that would be needed to actually filter out viral particles. Right. Um, you have to get to a MERV 13 before you get to that, and so we're 8 to 10, better than where we were. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's that that number of changes that we can get happening to hopefully remove those viral particles before someone can be infected by them. So with that, I will, um, I will pause and see if anyone else has any questions. Thank you very much. Harry, you have questions? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I've got some questions that were submitted by some parents. Um, and one is more confirmation um, that other PPEs besides masks will be allowed like shields. Um, yes, but right now there is a mask requirement that's been implemented by the board. So masks are required. Um, it, shields can be added to it, but masks are still going to be required unless the board changes it. Um, so it's not an either or, it's a both. Um, and the only exceptions, like I mentioned, is where it's medically um, inappropriate for a child to wear a mask. Um, so we get doctor's orders or there's um, a condition and, and that's related to an IEP need. Okay. So especially um, for like our students that have hearing impairments who lip read, right? The, we need the clear mask, right? Or they would for short periods of time, you know, exchange those out. But really that's where we ordered a bunch of the clear masks for was so that we can honor that still and yet provide the accommodation that's needed for those students. Okay. Um, what will happen if the governor's mask mandate were to end, will the district continue its own mask requirement? Yes, unless the board takes action to direct us otherwise. Okay. Um, and then for, uh, will, the, will there be additional mask breaks or exceptions for children with asthma, for example, during physical education? I'm um, sure, right. Those kind of things will get worked out on an individual basis. And some of those students may have 504 plans where the, those kind of accommodations will be made, but absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the things we talked to the special ed team today, Gary, about is trying to make sure that they're writing in enough mask breaks for even a student that has sensory issues. So therefore, keeping a mask on for a long period of time is more of a challenge. You don't want to just say don't wear one because it's, you know, becoming a community. Not only is it the right. governor's order, but we want to train our kids to be part of that community solution. Um, so how do you do that? You have them take more breaks more frequently until you slowly train them to be able to wear the mask for longer. Okay. Um, 
And for um, students that might be allergic to hand sanitizer, um, will, the, will there be a requirement for hand sanitizer or will the use of washing stations be enough? So there won't be a requirement for hand sanitizer. It's definitely recommended, but hand washing um, will be enough, especially for okay. students that are sensitive. Can I jump into that one? We do have one student that I can think of that does have a pretty um, significant reaction to hand sanitizer. So certainly he would be a kid that with his IEP and just making sure his teacher would know that we're gonna just do hand washing versus the hand sanitizer. Okay, good, thank you. Um, and then any plans for social distancing on buses and how will that be enforced? So, um, Aaron, do we have you in the meeting? Aaron's not here, but I can speak to that one. Okay. So while we're in phase two and phase three, um, we have obviously an easier time social distancing on the bus because half of the students um, will be, you know, give or take, will be on the bus at, at a time. Um, we actually do have a bus video that's similar to the uh, video that we watched earlier tonight regarding um, the cleaning of schools and cleaning and disinfecting of schools. We also made a bus procedures video. So that will be um, on our website shortly as well. And there are protocols such as students will file in from, they'll seat themselves in the back first, filing up through the front. They'll leave the front seat open as, uh, as possible for the bus driver. Um, they'll sit with siblings or their household um, family members if possible. So things like that. But um, we will, I mean, there's only so much room on a bus and we're not adding more buses and there actually aren't even more buses in the state of Wisconsin to be able to double our fleet. So um, I see Heather is um, nodding your head over there as well. So um, while we are in phase two and phase three, social distancing will be more available, but we know that when students come back entirely, we do have some students who will remain virtual, who will redu reduce the amount of students on the bus. But we, you know, there's a point where there's only so much that we can do in terms of social distancing on the bus when we return in phases four and five. Um, and okay. Caitlin, one thing that Erin had shared before is the bus company also looked to stretch out some of the bus stops so that there weren't so many kids gathering at one bus stop or another. So they're trying their best as well to work with us to make sure that we can do the very best job that we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, earlier, I think you know, Brian had brought up a, a question about the survey results and the uh, differences in the in the options. So when we move into four phases four and five is there still going to be a hybrid option or is it just going to be you're in you're in school or you're virtual oh uh, that's a good question um the way i carry it in my head is there's no more hybrid option it's you're either virtual or you're in person um and the the reason behind that is we know from the teacher standpoint and the learner standpoint right i've already said it pretty clearly either all virtual or all in person is just better. And so why would we continue to offer, you know, a less than um, perfect solution or less than adequate, even adequate solution. And it's the moving through phases two and three is really to help us get all the systems of mitigation and contact tracing kind of running and to help people get comfortable kind of coming back together in buildings during, you know, COVID-19, but it's not the best instructional or learning solution. So we wouldn't continue. I wouldn't support continuing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so D Dieter had earlier had mentioned um, about phase change or uh, parents making changes based on a uh, quarterly basis. So third quarter, fourth quarter, et cetera. If, if there were a scenario where the metrics show you could move into phase four or five before fourth quarter, would parents be able to make that change prior to the fourth quarter? Um, so it, if, well, the metrics were, were shifted and it looked like we were going to be able to move to in person. So then, yes, I think we would create that opportunity. So if there are parents that are, had committed to stay all virtual and then wanted to change, yeah, I think um, we'd accommodate those. And we, well, you know, we accommodate case by case situations throughout this all the time. Um, and they're, you know, so we anticipate examples where, you know, jobs change. Um, and even with the, the two teams or the two cohorts, you know, we've had families reach out saying, well, I just can't get off those two days. I need to be in the other cohort. Well, of course we do that. And so we'll make those adaptations as, as we move forward. Okay. 
Um, let me see. Uh, bear with me for a minute. Okay. Um, and then, if if the plan were to go with the uh, phase uh, two and three, and then the delay to move to phase four and five, would there be an opportunity with for students with IEPs, special needs students, to go into four phase five, either immediately or sooner than than other students? Um, yes. So those will all be individual IEP team decisions based on the progress monitoring notes that the staff are keeping. And all of our special ed staff have been keeping very tight progress monitoring notes so that we can make the best decision we can in that moment in time. We have some students with special needs that are back in buildings now because um, the IEP team determined that we needed to do something different in order to meet their needs and all the safety protocols were met and we worked with the health department on the plan and all of those sorts of things. So we're making those adjustments on an individual basis based on the nature of the disability and whether or not the student is making adequate progress towards the goals of that IEP. And a follow-up question to that, are are all parents with IEPs aware of that? Because I would I would think based on some of the parents I've talked to, I don't know if all the parents are aware of that. Um, any of the parents, certainly the parents at any time can call an IEP team meeting and it's to, to consider whether or not the education is meeting the needs of their student at any given point. And so we've tried to communicate that really clearly. Um, we've asked the case managers to communicate more regularly just on their progress monitoring notes. So the family knows kind of what the marker is that the team will be considering as they go forward. Um, so, and we've communicated a couple of times that if parents of students with special needs have any concerns that they should call their case manager and follow up on a meeting. Given the number of meetings we've had, I would say lots of parents know that, but whether or not all parents know that, um, certainly I can ask Anne to reinforce that in her next um, staff memo to our special ed team. Okay, thank you. Um, bear with me for a minute. And then that that's at all grade levels for Correct. So the students with IEPs who could come into school sooner, it'll be K4 through 12? Uh, K3 through 21. Okay, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yes, but Sorry. yeah. Yep, great idea. But yes, for all of them. Yep, so our three-year-olds yeah. could potentially, if that was a need for some of the three-year-olds or for some of the students in our 18 to 21-year-old program. Okay. Um, and I just have one final question. Um, so... In the slide, it says consideration of implementing phases four and five no later than following spring break aligned with health metrics. Um, you know, with the challenges that exist in hybrid, why not set an earlier considered consideration date for the move to phase four or five, such as the you know, first Monday in March? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm, right, so that's one that, you know, would. Um, so it's honestly just the best guess of where to land it um, because we don't really know. And so it, it really is based more on at what point do we feel we'll have um, some level of confidence built among staff that it's okay to be in schools, you know, working face-to-face um, -face in person with kids. So to give enough time there. And that is also kind of conversations. And this is really, you know, Phil Ertl and Wauwatosa is that expect people to be really nervous at first and it's going to take weeks for them to have a couple moments where there's a positive case in the school and they see the contact tracing place out tape uh, play out they see the isolation practices they see all the systems work that should be working and then the anxiety starts to come down and i don't know you know if that's three weeks or if that's six weeks um at this point for us but that's why we have the language no later than, right? So it may be sooner um, that we would want to um, start the pivot. And, and it goes back to, we know that it's probably better instructionally to be able to pivot, but I think we're going to have to get some sense of, are the current systems um, working and are people starting to feel comfortable um, in those systems before we would then consider uh, moving with the metrics into phases four and five. So it's, it's an inexact answer. I'm sorry, yeah. but that's kind of where we are. <laughs> Um, the other piece of that, just to keep in mind, is that third quarter ends on March 26th. And so um, making those transitions at kind of natural starts and stops to instruction mm -hmm. are sometimes helpful for everybody and especially for staff to wrap their heads around as well. So the 
the quarter ends and we go shortly into spring break right after that. And so that would be another thing to keep in mind in the factors of consideration and why we wait to make a bit of a shift. Hey, Pat, did you want to Yeah, yeah I just want to jump in. I agree with what Marty said about staff feeling comfortable and those natural transitions. And of course, with our kids, they need time to get used to what this two day thing is. And then once we're comfortable, we can live in that for a while and have a couple weeks or four or five weeks that feel really good and finish that quarter nicely before we go into the next phase. It takes middle school kids a long time to figure out those routines and those procedures, especially when we haven't been in a building <laughs> and gone from class to class and done that for, you know, 10 months that those procedures will take a long time, especially when they're only in the building for two days rather than five. So but I think that was one of the things we talked about when we did breakouts in the return to school committee was knowing that this was what we were doing and we knew we had time to, you know, go through those procedures with the kids and prepare them for the next phase without just jumping right in a couple weeks later. Are you good? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Ryan, I know you had a couple of follow-up questions and then Kristen, I see your hand up so we'll come back to that. Ryan, did you wanna go? Oh, I'm sorry, did you call me? I did, yes. Okay, my connection was going in and out. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier was the camps that we currently have in place. Um, and I know those, uh, you know, when we first came up with those that was to help alleviate the concerns for families that um, had students um, who didn't have somewhere to go during the day now and now they're still going to have that situation for three days a week. Um, I guess how flexible and how creative are we going to be able to be on some of those solutions because again fall, going back to not wanting students to fall uh, fall through the cracks and from a family perspective, not having them uh, have any undue hardships uh, from our change in plan. How flexible are we in terms of being able to come up with creative solutions to, to help these families? Yeah, so uh, I, I don't want to over promise here, but we have um, talked about some scenarios um, in our planning that might um, help this. Uh, and so one is, do we, because we don't have a lot of facility space left to run camps and socially distance kids, but we've even talked about, do we go out and lease space somewhere um, to, to provide more camp space? That's an option. It comes with additional cost, but it also creates, you know, the staffing um, challenge is real in trying to expand camp. So we run up against that problem. The other one, and this is where I really have to be careful that I'm not over promising, is that we talked about a scenario where we would prioritize families that were in camp that didn't get into the you know, limited rec camp and potentially um, offer them kind of a four day a week um, school day or school week, right? So that, and, but, it, but it's gonna depend very much on the capacity of the school to add in a few kids uh, and still maintain social distancing, right? So that's why I'm being a little bit careful here, but that's probably the most realistic way to support the families that were in camp is to get, and this is elementary only, right? So they would essentially be a dual cohort or dual team kid um, and go to school four days a week. But it's, again, we gotta let the numbers kind of settle out a little bit to see, um, you know, who's left after the lottery and, what and do they want, you know, additional support? And then if we were to kind of distribute them into schools, does it work? Right, before uh, we would actually kind of launch something like that. And that's why I'm being really careful here in the, in the space where we've got lots of parents listening in, like we may or may not be able to do that. Um, and I have a meeting set up for tomorrow after school. Um, once we'll have a better idea of who gets chosen in the lottery with all of our elementary student services staff um, so that they can help start problem solving what might be some solutions. And then I did contact, um, I've gotten through with at least one of our local daycares that I worked with a ton at the start of the year who has a bunch of our students to say, hey, you might see an increase in 
requests coming your way. Um, and some of the students you're seeing now may have the opportunity to come back because we've provided them with hotspots and got releases so that we could best support the kids wherever they were um, during virtual instruction. So we're trying to find as many community resources as humanly possible um, so that families do have some options that are um, something that they can reasonably manage. I just want, I don't, and so my turn, I would be worried about having them in both groups just because it, it removes that pod that you, you're, you could easily wipe out a classroom uh, if something does happen and it, and it happens to be, uh, well, it doesn't have to be one of the kids that are in both groups. <laughs> so they just happen to carry it from one to the other. So I would just caution that. Mm -hmm. No, we've talked about that and I, um, we're worried about that as well. And, um, Right, it's not a perfect solution. That's why I'm like, I gotta be careful by over promising something like that. And that's why we're exploring other options as well. Brian, did you finish your question? Yeah, just really one more thing. And it's kind of a comment leading into some questions. I think my big concern with all of this, um, well, one of my big concerns with all of this um, is the teachers. Um, I just feel we heard some feedback tonight. We saw the WIA survey, um, uh, or heard about the WIA survey results. Um, and yeah, that was a small sample size, but it was a bigger sample size than what we have from teachers on the returning to school committee. Um, so I think we need to be very mindful of that um, for a number of reasons. And I get, again, we heard, we heard comments from uh, people before who are essential workers too. Um, and I get that. Um, and I'm not minimizing anybody who is an essential worker in any way, shape or form. Um, but we are potentially asking teachers again to, to move from a virtual environment, which was already more work, um, to a hybrid model, which will be increasingly more work. We've had problems attracting and retaining teachers um, to this district. Um, and these are all things we need to be mindful of. So, so we really need to pay attention to our teachers, to what we are asking of them. Um, in terms of support, we need to make sure that it really needs to be part of a plan, uh, a specific plan, as opposed to waiting for them to ask for help. Some people just aren't going to ask for help. They're going to try to do everything they can as much as they can, or just feel like they can't ask for help or whatever the case may be. So I just really want to make clear that we need to be concerned with the teachers, how they're doing, both from a workload, mentally, emotionally, all of that. Um, so going back to that, um, or, or following up on that, one of the things we talked about the differences in elementary teachers to the secondary teachers. Although we also then talked a, a little bit about the specialists and, and the specialists probably touch just as many students as our secondary um, teachers. Yet they're falling in that category where they're kind of being um, treated a little bit differently from, from that perspective. So is that a concern as well? I mean, again, they're, they're touching just as many students as, as the secondary teachers. Yeah, so a couple of things that I'll address to that one. Sorry, Marty, I don't know where you're gonna jump in first. Okay, um, so the couple of things, of course we're worried about our teachers and part of where we've been as slow and cautious and thoughtful with our plan as we have is, is in that attempt to protect our teachers. We shifted the way that we're doing teacher evaluation this year to be really different. Um, and it's an empathy interview process where you ask the teacher what's going well and where are you stuck and what are your goals and what evidence will you collect? And we're trying to keep those meetings much shorter and far more about a self-reflective process versus me going into your Zoom and being like, I saw Brian teaching math, right? And like writing that down in a form. Um, this is far more, I'm gonna sit with you, well, virtually sit with you one on one and ask you some questions about that. And so we'll continue that pattern this year. We may be continuing that for the long haul because we've gotten an extremely high amount of positive feedback. Marty and I did that same model with the principals for their initial evaluations this year and got comments like that was the best professional conversation I've ever had. Okay. Good feedback. Um, so it's one way that we will continue to check in with people because that'll be there's another check in like that in like January, February kind of time frame, depending on size of the building and number of people doing those that they'll repeat that round. So you set some goals around some things you wanted to work on with your students and how are you doing on that and what support do you need for me is always the question that goes with it. 
And one-on-one, -on -one, as you're really talking about their practice and where they see themselves, most teachers will say, like, here's where I'm really, really stuck or here's some help that I need. Most teachers will. And some, you just get a sense that you have to follow up with them a couple more times because maybe you felt like they weren't asking for the help that they needed. So we'll continue that process. As far as the specialist go, that is a concern. And like we keep saying, there's you know the balance of what we're hearing from parents and the balance of what we're hearing from staff and the whole plan. And if the board should decide to choose to remain virtual as opposed to going to hybrid, we're prepared to support that as well, like Marty said. Mm -hmm. So that's some of this, you know, again, there's just going to be like we can't solve all of the concerns that we have in the course of what we're trying to do. This is not humanly possible. But I certainly have checked in with the elementary music teachers so far and the secondary music teachers so far because theirs is going to look so different. Um, and I've made myself available as many times as people are interested or as whenever teachers want to check in with me as well. And typically when I'm in buildings, that's a lot of what I do is a pulse check. So I'm trying to figure out what that looks like in my new world as we transition into hybrid as I'm also the substitute. If any principal gets sick, so I have to watch how much time I'm actually spreading myself around buildings um, for all of those same reasons. So trying to figure out how we keep those connections going is something that we're learning about every day. Yeah, I think um, you definitely got you hit the notes uh, on it. I mean, the yes, we're concerned about our teachers who worry about them all the time throughout all of this, but there's, there's no reasonable solution to kind of alleviate kind of the anxiety that teachers are feeling about returning to school and start to meet more student needs at the same time, except for allowing every teacher that wants to continue to teach virtually to do so. However, that means I have to replace every single one of those teachers physically with another adult, which we can't do. So the, the only available solution isn't actually available. Right. And so that's the quandary. And just like Deidre said, if, if this is not the solution right now for the board, that's okay. Because we're actually in a reasonably good space in virtual, except for the families that are really struggling with it. Yeah. And I think, and I think my comment about that was just making sure that we are, you know, enforcing the protocols that we have in place, making sure that we are again, and not saying that you're not. Um, but just making sure that the teachers know that we are doing what we can to ensure that they are in the safest possible environment. Again, I know it's very important that some students get back into classrooms. Some students are just very much struggling and not doing well uh, in, in the current environment. So, and yeah, yeah, it's, you're never going to please everybody and you can't do everything um, that you want to do. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> just a lot to consider. Yep. Thank you. And I just Frank, had a Christine, did you want to come? Yeah, just one one comment. That that question number six, and one of the reasons why I wanted the breakdown on the results of the of the the pulse survey that was done, is that was that was a concern in every building in our district. That was the pop out one, right? Is I don't feel confident that my student isn't going to fall behind. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, wanted to reiterate yep. that. No, I appreciate that. Uh, Heather? Um, just kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum, we're talking a lot about kids falling behind. I have a concern about our gifted and talented kids, that they're getting pushed to make strides forward instead of staying stagnant, making sure that we're challenging them and that they're not just doing the minimal amount of work to maintain, but to keep their growth going. So I guess more of a statement than a comment. Yeah, we certainly have plans in place to support our identified um, students who are identified gifted and talented. And um, we shifted that support this year and adjusted the way we did the staffing in that department. And we've gotten lots of positive feedback on that around um, how integrated it feels and how the teacher teams are working on those things. If a parent had a specific concern about their plan for a student that was identified gifted and talented, they should start always with their building principal and reach out to, well, their classroom teacher first and foremost, and then reach out to the building principal if there were specific concerns. But those plans are still in place and we're still following through with all of those. We're still looking for opportunities to accelerate in advance. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around our math department since in the last, as we knew we had a hole there 
years ago and now pushing into really focusing on our ELA growth. Um, and again, we've stretched quite a bit of advancement in math, even some of during some of this challenging time. So the challenge is that that gap tends to get bigger, right? And so it's, you know, that's what we're trying to focus on right now and make sure isn't happening. But if there's a specific parent with a specific concern, always please address it with the teacher. And then if, you know, work through the principal and then you can work through my office beyond that. And we're happy to listen and provide what support we can. Thank you. Kristen, did you have a follow-up as well? Um, actually, Marty kind of sold my question a little bit, which was, um, I know the teachers were asked what their preferred options were for um, virtual hybrid or in-person. Um, are you saying that that probably won't be honored if we go back to five day in person that there will be staff that will just have to. So if we go back to five day in person, absolutely. Um, yeah. um, Do we have enough to cover like hybrid right now? Because if we're looking at the numbers that Beth provided me, 62% of families want a hybrid option. Mm -hmm. So will we have enough staff to do hybrid? Yes, if, we, if we're bringing um, students back, we have to bring teachers back. Um, and some of them won't like that. And some teachers won't like that answer. And I, it's fair not to like that answer. Um, you know, we've, uh, we have plans to accommodate as many teachers as we can through um, what we're required to do from FMLA or ADA. And we're going to um, voluntarily extend those opportunities, even as they expired on December 31st. Um, and then we recreated, which is unique, um, our own internal, we, we call it telecommuting opportunity, but we were able to staff, um, I forget, was it 17 or 15 positions on um, Caitlin, but something that's in, in there uh, in our CARES funding budget. 17.5, uh, I believe. Okay, so 17.5 positions. So they're, so those are teachers that have um, really unique circumstances and, and we're able to document those circumstances. And so uh, they've been approved to continue to work from home. So I think we've we've done quite a bit, um, but if kids are coming back, you have to have adults in the buildings and um, teachers are gonna have to come back. Um, my other question was related to the state budget that's being proposed for education budget, which would penalize districts that don't have kids in person. I'm wondering how much thought is being put into that in relation to the push to get kids back into buildings. Mm -hmm. So um, that's from what, I, what I've learned, and this is again through SWSA. So SWSA collectively, we hire a lobbyist in the last big meeting, um, Rainey is her first name. What Rainey um, shared is that her sense of, you know, talking um, in Madison with legislators that that's not going anywhere. Um, okay. that, that whole package that was- um, Yeah, I don't even think it has an AB number at this point. Yeah. It's an article. Good to know, thanks. Yep. Yes. Did you call on me? I did. I saw your hand up. Oh, you're breaking up. I can't understand yep. you. Yep. Uh, I thought I'd wait until a little later because I had a lot of questions. But most, most of them have been answered. Uh, but let me go through my notes and see which ones were. Okay. I'm in. A, we're in hybrid, and I'm an elementary classroom teacher. We don't have pods. So I'm teaching both virtual and the kids. So I'm teaching math, science, social studies, reading, writing, and I have to plan for both and grade for both. It doesn't seem like it's equal to a school that has pods where there's a teacher focusing on just the virtual and the in-person. Yeah, the teacher, the schools that don't have the pods have a dedicated virtual only teacher that's going to do multi grade. Okay. So and, it was uh, kind of two different ways to organize it depending on how it worked with the number of families that chose vir the virtual option. And some of that may shift when we get the new, you know, as, as families change their selection, that shifts a bit on how they assign some of those sections. Okay. That, that might also answer this next question, but I still want to ask it. Uh, if I heard correctly, some art and music is going to be done in the individual classroom, not a music or art classroom. So if I'm the virtual teacher and I need to prepare 
videos for my students. How can I do it if I've got other kids in my class that are having music and art? Yeah, so the um, the general teacher from that classroom will go work in an alternate space and that's a space where they could go to make other videos or other things because we'll have enough space and buildings for people to stretch out and then would the, would the resources be available if they need certain things from their room to you know use in the video um they're gonna have to plan for that and the reason that we're doing that is so that you're moving the students fewer times throughout the day because one of the oh, I, I get that yeah I yeah get that. so some of that is just going to be kind of a planning component Jeff that we're trying to make the plan at each school site as transparent as possible so people can be thinking about things like that and my last one I just got to ask I probably know the answer but remember I was a teacher there's no dumb question well uh do we have enough charging stations in all the rooms so that kids don't have to sit next to each other while they're waiting for their device to be recharged? Yep, that, um, that's a really good one. So uh, that's one we, gotta, I, we, have, we have purchased lots and lots of additional chargers, that's for sure. I, I'm just, I'm I'm just asking, I'm not right. no, it's an interesting, at all or anything. Yeah. It's an interesting question because lots of classrooms have the charging kind of in a hub. So mm -hmm. we got to explore that about how we distribute access to charging a little differently. That's interesting. Yeah. So no, thanks for asking that. Ryan wanted to jump in on that one. Yeah, it's not a problem, Jeff, because the, the devices hold a charge for a really long period of time. So we just cycle the devices that are currently being charged so that not everybody needs to charge all at the same time. So you don't actually need it to be one to one for charging stations. I mean, okay. of course, that might, be, Ryan, that might be how they do it in your school, but would all schools be doing it that way? Elementary uh, has the newer iPads that generally hold the charge for longer. And we've replaced the ones that really don't hold a charge. So there's less of a concern. And then the carts that we purchased at the secondary for the Chromebooks, they're charging stations. So you're only plugging in like one thing. So there's the procedures like Mary Pat was talking about of how do I get my device that's just mine checked out to me, right? So that I'm not handling everybody's stuff and piling onto a big pile of things to take care of some of that, but that's just part of the procedures and the practices that they have to do in each classroom. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Uh, um, for one, if we go to hybrid, if people forget their device at home because they're now coming back and forth with this thing or they lost it or whatever you know what sort of capacity do we have to loan out a device um, for that day and then what are the procedures to ensure that we're you know cleaning that properly um, it, since that would be like a, essentially a shared device i would presume <laughs> I don't know, Caitlin, if you want to jump in on that. Tech has a pretty slick plan for how they clean and sanitize them already. And the techs and the buildings and the animation coaches both are pretty well prepped to be able to sanitize a device at the end of a day. It's not a super lengthy procedure. There's just, they have their sanitizing protocols for that. Um, Caitlin checked today on inventory to make sure that we had enough to make sure that the kids who didn't yet borrow a school device don't have to bring their personal device into school. Right, that we still have one available for them. We have a limited number of other devices in each school at this point, but we've been replacing the ones that have been broken up until this point. So some of it is yes, in most cases we'll have one, but if 50 kids forget their device on a day, we're not gonna have enough for all of those students. So that's again, part of like the procedures and the training that we have to start doing with students and families like, hey, just like your phone, like this goes with you wherever you go. Um, so that we can mitigate that as best we can. Great, thank you board members for all of the questions and the thoroughness by which you've reviewed all of these things and asked questions. Um, very deep, which is great. I expect to kind of flesh a lot of these things out before you decide uh, anything um, today. So I'm gonna go through the, the executive summary um, with items that are being asked of us to consider. I just wanna make sure one last time that all board members have exhausted their questions before I move on to the executive summary. Okay. 
So the executive summary, what's being asked, and this is what the motion would look like, is that the board would approve the updated returning to school plan, which would be inclusive of the following four things. The internal health and staffing metrics, to, uh, we, would, we would adapt the internal health staffing metrics to determine phases. The implementation of phases two and three, beginning with second semester, provided the internal health, health metrics are met. Consideration of implementing phases four and five, no later than following spring break, and the continuation of all other elements that we adopt in the original plan in July. So those are the items that are being considered this evening that we would look for a motion to uh, adopt in their entirety. So if I huh? jump in. I'm sorry, Marty, go ahead. I would um, ask that, so the motion would include, it's really that bullet that the language is that we are gonna use internal metrics to determine phase changes, but what Noah introduced, and I, I like this, is that um, we gotta figure out the language here, but that it would include um, if if the external metrics hit extreme, that then mm -hmm. we would go back to virtual or we would consider a phase change. So it's, it needs to be a either or or both and kind of language in there, because if, if that doesn't get added, then then I'm only using internal metrics. Brad, could we just add that as a separate bullet underneath internal matrix and staffing metrics to determine phases? Mm -hmm. How would we want that to be worded? We'd make sure that gets included that in the motion. Do you have any ideas, Noah, on how you'd like to phrase that? Um, well, it, I mean, it, we could make it broad and just say if the internal and external metrics that have been determined are, are met, instead of saying specifically extreme, because um, if the state changes their scale and now it says critical instead of extreme, I don't want to be oh, good point. pigeonholed into one one word, but we can just say that, you know, by the defined internal and external metrics, we will move to uh, phases two and three. Uh, so uh, implementation of phases two and three beginning with second semester provided the internal and external health metrics are met. You just said, and external to that phrase, I think that would be sufficient. And as long as we denote that um, on the website clearly what those metrics are, uh, I think that should be fine. Okay. And then it allows changing if necessary if the scale changes. Do we want to say phases two and three because we could go back to completely virtual? Could we just say a shift in phases versus a specific phase? Sure. Marty, does that limit anything? No, I think that I think that works. So it'd be just shifting phases. Uh, starting implementation of phase semester. shifting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second semester provided the internal and external metrics are met. Health metrics are met. Yeah. Okay. So we're leaving in bullet point one. We're just adding the word external to bullet point two? Correct. Okay. Uh, and while well, we're moving the phases two and three, and we're changing that to simply implementation of phases. Okay. We're not specifically denoting because we might move back to phase one if the uh, metrics get worse or are, are worse. Okay. Okay. So the way that the, the motion would be read is that the board would review uh, internal health and staffing metrics to determine phases. Uh, implementation of, of phases beginning with the second semester provided the internal and external health metrics are met. Consideration of implementation of phases four and five no later than the following spring break and continuation of all other elements originally adopted in July in the original plan. So that's how we would be considering it. So we would consider those items together. So I would look for a motion. Um, <clears throat> can I make one other suggestion for uh, consideration of implementation phases four and five? Can we just make that contingent upon internal and external uh, health metrics being met as opposed to putting it like, well, we won't, why do we have to consider them by the, as Gary's point, if it's better earlier and things are going well earlier, then we could change it earlier. And if it's not and it's later, then we have to then we change it later. So if we just say when those internal and external metrics, uh, uh, health met metrics have been met, we will consider phase moving to phases four and five. 
the um, let me step in a little bit here because that would mean we move to phases four and five now uh, because those metrics have been met. Um, and I and I'm right. I'm really cautious about that because I think we need time to kind of get people used to kind of just even being in school together. So we need a little different language in there. I guess I don't like the no later than because that puts a deadline on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Why don't we just say may begin as soon as spring break? Because I think that the whole point, and Mary Pat kind of brought this up, is that we want to do it within those quarters or within that. Where does spring break fall? Is that around that the March? First week of April. Yeah, March 26th ends the quarter, and then um, spring break begins the first. Begins the 29th. Oh, the 29th yeah. yeah, and it goes through. Um, the seventh is when we're back. Mm -hmm. It's the first day back after spring break. You're, you're muted, Gary. So then, you know, based on what you just said, though, I want to go back to something that was talked about earlier. I mean, where we would then be transitioning phase four, four and five in the middle of, you know, after the fourth quarter has started. I, I know it's early in the fourth quarter starting. Uh, but why not then consider phases four and five starting earlier in the third quarter? Which goes back to something Noah said about if we make the metrics earlier, why not move the phases four and five earlier? I, I understand that the, the natural breaks that you talked about, but if but if the metrics show that we can move into those phases, why why would we delay that? Yeah, the, well, the reason right we talked about it, that we would delay it is just because building trust and, and in the systems to keep people safe takes some time just getting kids back into any kind of school routine takes some time um, and so maybe it's uh maybe a, a little bit of a solution is that um that we would remain in phases two and three for at least six weeks so we give ourselves kind of that six week window. And then if metrics are met, we would move into phases four and five. So wherever that six weeks would land, it's in the middle of third quarter. But I think um, a month seems a little bit short to me and six weeks seems reasonable um, in terms well, of- I, hold on. I shared the screen with the calendar just so everybody yeah. could look at it together. I thought that might, I don't know. It was helping me to be able to look at it. So, because then you would be talking potentially about starting the really like the week of the 15th, which would mm -hmm. also give us a short period of time to be back into potentially phases four and five right before spring break. So it also allows us to work some kinks out of the system before we go into spring break as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, either one of those, I think based on the calendar, that would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now we talked to about a vote, but now they're like amending like the wording. Hey guys, we can uh, hear you. You're you're not muted. Whoever you are speaking, you're not muted. You're muted now. Thank you. <laughs> um. So you're saying so you're saying to change it to say fourth six weeks or for at least six weeks. For at least six weeks. Okay. I'm okay with but at least six weeks for the wording because that we can look at what's happening and, and make determinations if changes need to be made or not. Mm -hmm. Would it come back for board approval to move, move phases if that were the case? If we were going to go earlier, given that language, if we, were, we wanted to consider going earlier, then yes, we would come back. But if it was the, within six weeks, then we could just move without board approval? No, if it says we're going to be in phases two or three for at least six weeks, then on um, we'd have to stay with the six weeks. So we would, if we wanted to go earlier, then we would have to come back to the board. But if we made the six weeks and then the metrics were good, it wouldn't require board approval to move to phases four and five after that. Right. Correct. Correct. So the, then I just want to understand uh, for my clarification for people out there. So we're saying we're going to be in phases two and three for six weeks. 
and then to look at the metrics. And then when would the move be made then? On the 15th? Because if we're measuring six weeks, do we we're then immediately going to tell people we're shifting from two and three into four and five? Wouldn't we want to give them a lead time? Um, yeah, I mean, what we talked about is under the circumstances we are now with using internal metrics. Um, if we were to go back phases, I, we were talking about a two day notice, and, and and I think that's that's part of the communication then is that if people know that. Um, going into this, this could happen on a two-day notice, then that families and um, staff just need to plan for that eventuality. Um, and, you know, more lead time is better, but I think if we're going to try to make, you know, move in six weeks um, to make a decision, you know, that Wednesday that would say on Monday, we're going to move to phases four and five. So I think that then it's just going to be reminding families that that's the decision day and to be ready. Would would we have two days though? I mean, this isn't part of this, but I don't know if we'd have two days. Sometimes, if we have a certain amount of people in a classroom or a school, it might be that night that you get an email that says, you know, we can't have people in the building tomorrow. Um, I don't know if two days is going to be feasible in all situations. I think if a, if there's a plan change moving everything to virtual, that might be one thing. But in a, within a classroom or within a school, it, it might not be feasible for that. Um, no, it's a good point. That's correct. That's correct. So I think we got to figure out the right communication around that. Um, that Right, the health department may say, no, that classroom gets shut down tomorrow. Uh, and so if, I think, again, that's just in the way we start framing the communication following kind of the, where the board finalizes this this evening. Okay, so you've not come to a consensus on the phase four and five language. So what do we have right now? <laughs> Originally, it's no later than spring break, following spring break. Mm -hmm. And then the proposed language was to say for a minimum of six weeks. Are we saying six weeks from when the 4K and 5K go back or from February no. 1st? From oh. February 1st. Yeah, from when hybrid starts. Right. So hybrid doesn't so start until the 1st if it just gets approved. Do we need to say that from February 1st? Six I don't think so. February? It'd be from the time the plan was implemented, which would be February 1st. So. Okay. I'm comfortable with the no later than spring break, personally, because I think it does give us some flexibility and it, it allows us to come back earlier if need to be as well. With the no later than, you know, and then we would have to come back and take additional board action if we would not be able to move to phases four and five after spring break. That would be the only thing that we would have to consider at that point. Otherwise, we'd have the ability to move back and forth in the phases based on the metrics, how the, the, the motion would be read at that point. Yeah, and I guess that bullet point does say consideration, not that we will move to Correct. four and five. That's what I want to get away from. A consideration of implementing four and five no later than spring break, assuming health metric, internal and external health metrics are met. We would then amend add that to that line as well. I mean, all of these are dependent on the internal and external health metrics for mm -hmm. the conversation. So then that does give us that flexibility to go back and forth if need be. And again, if we were, if everyone's about, you know, allowed to get vaccinated tomorrow and everyone's great by next week, then we might want to consider opening more sooner, right? So that, I think that gives us some flexibility there too. So I want I want to create the if we're gonna you know if we're gonna take action I want to give it the opportunity to give us the most flexibility to meet the needs of the district over the rest of the semester. So that we don't have to continue to do this and have to put parents and staff at at you know unease of what's going to happen the next week. There's already going to be enough of that. I. I just I still have a concern about bullet point three. It, I'm trying to think of if there's language or add another bullet point that the school board will consider implementation of phases four and five as soon as the metrics. So as soon as the, as soon as the internal metrics show that move can be done so that we, my concern is that the metrics are there, but 
there's some caution of moving forward. So we still continue to wait till spring break. I, I'd like to have something to trigger that we consider that phase four and five as soon as possible, we, if it happens before spring break. We could put an and, and or in there and or no later than the following spring break and add the internal external health matrix within that <laughs> phase, still leaving the word consideration in there. Well, I, think I, think, I think adding the internal external to that bullet point takes care of that because then it does set a deadline that it won't be later. It potentially would not be later than spring break, but it would allow it to happen much sooner. If the mm -hmm. metrics are met, Four weeks potentially. I mean, that's not realistic, probably, but we don't know that. Yeah. And the other thing is too is to make sure that we're giving the time for staff to get comfortable yeah. in the situation right. they're in. So, even right. if metrics are met two weeks from now, we're probably not going to move to phases four and five in two weeks because we want to make sure that everyone's getting into the the comfort level of what's going to happen uh, if people are in the building. And so, I think that having that six week time frame. If we're in a month and we meet it in a month and people are like, yeah, things are great. I'm so comfortable and we can talk to staff and think people are cool with that. Well, we have the ability to consider moving earlier if we want to. That just allows us to do that. But I don't I don't think by having a six week time frame in there that we can amend if we feel that like we want to is a bad. What about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Heather. I was just going to say, what about add an appropriate transition around the spring break? What's around spring break? It be May 1st? That might be too late. No, because it was before. Right? So I, I, yeah. I, I, I I don't want to. I don't want to handcuff us either by getting too caught up on specific dates. There's there's a nice yeah. wiggle room here with spring break that gives us a couple of different options to start sooner if the metrics allow it. You know, and it doesn't it doesn't preclude having to, to re make these decisions every couple of weeks to decide. It, it has that fluidity, and otherwise, we're going to be making every Monday. We're going to be deciding this. Mm -hmm. and I don't think our families and our staff want that either. But I want to be cautious about, you know, putting too many restrictions on the timeline. If the metrics are the determining factor, then the metrics are the determining factor, and we'd like them to be. You know, we'd like to have everything in phase four and five by spring break. And assuming that the metrics meet that, that's when we consider moving. If they're not met by then, we'd have to consider not. But if, you know, if they're before, great, we've given ourselves that option. Tristan? I'm just wondering if it's, are we gonna, can we vote on individual bullet points? I'm gonna say no, because okay. the whole plan works together. Okay. And otherwise, we could not approve part of it and approve the rest, and the rest of the plan won't work. So, and I only say that only because we've had options like this before where the whole plan doesn't work because they're not all considered at the same time. So, okay. sure, thank you. Yeah. So, we should determine how we want to word the, the third bullet point if that's what the sticking point is. Christine? So, our metrics, I know there was some talk uh, when we last met before we met tonight that our, our metrics table was going to look different. We were talking about maybe adapting something from Franklin. Are we working off of what we were presented tonight in the presentation? Where Milwaukee County will still affect our ability to have kids return, whether it's two days a week or four days, whatever happens next. The way I'm understanding kind of the conversation is that, yes, we're working off that metrics dashboard in terms of moving phases, but the understanding that um, we're gonna spend some time in phases two and three, even though the metrics have already been met essentially for phases four and five. And that um, the way I'm understanding it again is that if the external metrics were to get to extreme, even if we're meeting internal metrics, right? So if the external metrics get back to extreme, we would move back to all virtual. That's kind of so, how I'm understanding all of this. Then we need to add, add, put the word extreme in here because that's not what those metrics tell us. I didn't see anything on that table that stated that or communicated that. 
that, that's correct because that was just introduced this evening so that we'd go right. back and then we'd rebuild that um, dashboard with that included and at least that's if you right if the board wants language in there that captures all of that that that's great but at least that's my understanding is kind of I just want to clarify what is the what are what is the metrics that we're using what's the table going to look like because it either needs to be communicated in the table or it needs to be communicated in the motion. it would be in the table as I uh, Dr. Lexman had mentioned previously so initially we were looking only at internal metrics my point was is that the burden rate specifically uh, in the community will play a large role in what those internal metrics will look at and I didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves and say, we're going to move on this date, irregardless right. of what happens around us. And so I wanted to make sure that we're still following and looking at those internal metrics or external metrics as we prepare to any move to hybrid, if that is what's agreed upon. So that if next week or the week after that, all of a sudden cases are spiking like crazy, we don't have to have another meeting that says, oh, never mind, we're not going to do that anymore. So by saying that if so right now things have dropped, um, our, our bird rate has dropped considerably in West Southwest Milwaukee. It's still high, very high, but it's gotten down a lot lower than what was previously. If it starts going back up again because of people's concerns with travel over the holidays, which is a, a concern, not, not to be uh, dismissed at all, um, in the next two weeks, we should know that. And so in those next two weeks, if we do see a huge increase in the burden rate, then we can say, okay, we're going to pause this. We're not going to go back on you know, February 1st we're going to push it by two weeks and see how things are from there or whatever happens to be. That language allows the administration to do that without us to come back and vote again on it. That okay. was what I wanted to do. Yeah, there was a slight increase of about a thousand cases. I went to the DHA website where there was a huge spike in October and then it started to drop. We really didn't see an increase in cases after Thanksgiving, but we have seen some after the holiday season, a little Kind of a dip and then a little hop so there's going to be a delay in reporting due to the holidays but yeah. the next two weeks should tell us what we need to know yeah and just okay. to comment too that one of the reasons why we didn't want to list a specific level was that the state may change its description so extreme may not be it may be appropriate well, today might, but they might change the description of that level so otherwise oh. then we're locked into that particular description as well so we again for the flexibility piece all right, thank you for, for clarifying that. Appreciate the time. <laughs> for 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 bullet three, if we if we just took out that that time, you know, spring break, and put in something like consideration of implementing phase phases four and five as soon as the health metrics um, are met, or something similar to that. That that way, if once the the metrics are met, we make a consideration. Now we may, you know, the consideration might be, you know. Yeah, we met the metrics, but it's only been two weeks, and that's too soon to move into four and five, so we're not going to move. Um, but that, but at least that gives us the um, the the trigger point that I'm I'm looking for. So then the, the responsibility then would fall to administration to, right. to to move. So they'd have the ability to move into phases four and five, so long as the metrics are met, and then it would be on the timeline of administration and staff. Right? Is that what you're saying, Gary? Um, well, I, I, I don't want to talk about timeline. I, I, I want to say once the, once the if metrics are met soon, the consideration should be discussed immediately. Now, maybe we don't move in immediately. Maybe, you know, it's, you know, we're two weeks in the phases two and three and, you know, two weeks is too soon to move to four and five if that's what people feel. But then we could move to four and five after four weeks. I, I, I just I want to remove a a timeline of sorts and see and try to push if the fa if the metrics show that we can move to move as soon as possible so just just so i'm clear what that means is there will be an agenda item next week monday to discuss this because the metrics have been met mm -hmm. yeah and i i'm fine with that i mean i personally am fine with that i think that no later than following spring break um that's a no later than it doesn't mean it can't happen earlier than it's just a no later than so i, I think that um still gets you where you want to be gary it's just that it instead of having a uh, hard start date it just has a hard end date like it will be considered no later than the week after spring break yeah. if it happened earlier 
if it's determined that the internal and external metrics are met, but it'll happen definitely no later than that time. Now, consideration doesn't mean that we will move because it will depend obviously on the internal and external metrics. It just makes us come back to the table on, a, on April 7th or thereabouts to consider this again if we have not taken action before that time. Am I misunderstanding that? Is everyone else? Is that? No, I think that that would be an accurate description, Noah. So then, then for, for bullet item three, and based on what you're saying, Noah, if the metrics aren't met, we could move to four and five. So con consideration of implementing phases four and five, if the internal and external metrics are met, no later than the week following spring break. We have to add the internal and external metrics into that set. I just, yeah, I, I just, my concern with the way that's worded is that we're, we're going to stretch it out. It allows us to stretch it out if we want to, but if and the metrics I, are met earlier than that and the staff are comfortable with moving, then we can do that. Yes, we would have to meet again to make that vote and say, yes, we're going to move to phase in four and five because it's earlier than that time frame. But this is just stating that we will definitely consider it by that time frame. But we could consider it earlier and we will all have access to the metrics, you know, and I'm sure the administration will be more than happy to move forward earlier than that if it's, you know, if we're, if we're met with it. I know I will be. So the change to the point three would just be to add the internal and external metrics to make sure that we're, we're comparing the same things at the same, for the same phase considerations, mm -hmm. utilizing the same grouping of data. Yeah, so consideration of implementing phases four and five if internal and external metrics are met no later than the week after spring break. That's what I would advocate for, for bullet point three. So the way that um, taking all that feedback, so the consideration would be for board approval, board motion would be to approve the following. Um, we would move to internal health and staffing metrics to determine phases and phase changes. Uh, implementation of phases beginning with second semester provided the internal and external health metrics are met. Consideration of implementing phases four and five, meeting internal and external health metrics no later than spring week following spring break mm -hmm. and continuation of all other elements of the original plan as originally approved. I, so I just one one more question then um, based on something Dr. Lexman said earlier if if we met the metrics for phase four and phase five do we make that consideration before um, third semester or third quarter starts before third quarter third starts? quarter or fourth quarter third quarter third quarter is this semester it's in two weeks yeah yeah Earlier, Dr. Lexman said we've met the metrics, right? Internal metrics? Right. And currently, we're, we're meeting those, yes. So if we're meeting internal metrics, then can that consideration for uh, phases four and five be done earlier? We can't consider internal metrics where we don't have people in buildings. Right. We have very few people in buildings right now. The internal metrics are great, but we have a fraction of the people who will be in buildings. We really need to see people in buildings and see what what, if our metrics are working, if our mitigation practices are working before we can say, yeah, we can move to a different phase. So that, so yes, we are. So what Dr. Lexman said is true. According yeah. to what we're going to approve, we are technically meeting the metrics, but it would be foolish mm -hmm. to say, oh yeah, our metrics look great. We have right. you know, what, 50 people, people in buildings. buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to have hundreds of just... people in the building that we need to make sure that what we're doing is going to work and then move forward from there. Yes, I understand that. Um, so the, I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm just afraid that putting the spring break in there is we're gonna, we're just gonna push it off. I don't think anybody wants to push it off based on what the conversation has been today. If we meet this third week of March, I think it's go time if, if we can ha make it happen. I don't think people are gonna purposely stall it. There's reasons to because we're not meeting the metric book I don't think the billing. I don't think that there's been any any sentiment so far that I've seen or heard that would say, you know what, let's let's prolong this as long as possible. Let's stay in this 
middle ground as long as possible. I, I, unless I'm missing something, but it doesn't appear that that's people's interest. We want to get to the last phase as soon as possible, but we have to walk before we can run. Yeah. Yes, and, and the, right, that's why I'm like a little reluctant here. And then another strategy I've seen boards use is to um, essentially kind of prove kind of what we're talking about, but that they set a, a hard date where the administration has to bring it back for consideration. So to bring it back for, for reconsideration no later than, you know, the first Monday of March or the, you know, the last regular formal board meeting of February, whatever just using examples here, but that's another way to approach this. So that, um, so that, so what that, what that would do is it says, yeah, we're going to commit to this plan right now and we're going to be in phases two and three. Um, but the board knows it's going to come back to them, you know, the, the first meeting in March for reconsideration. So that maybe is a way to find a path here to um, get to a resolution. Mm -hmm. okay. I, like I, that. I can't hear you, Heather. I said I think that's a good idea to set forth that what we've implement what we've said and with changes and then to say to be reviewed like Marty said our first meeting in March. So that would be March eighth then. Yeah. All right. So it gives us just a little bit over a month in phases two and three before it gets reconsidered. I think that's reasonable. I agree. Yeah, I agree to that. So does that have to be added as a separate bullet point? Yeah. Yep. All right. So the so first shall, shall I read it again? Well, now I'm worried about yeah. the first bullet point because it says internal health and staffing metrics to determine phases should be internal and external. Health and staffing metrics to determine phases. We've already adopted the external method, external metrics though. So this is to adopt the internal metrics. That's a specific change. We've already, in the previous plan, we already adopted external. Okay. So we're adding the inclusion of the internal metrics as, a, as an approved method of evaluation. Okay. Okay. So we'll, be, we'll consider a motion on the following. Uh, adopting internal health and staffing metrics to determine phases, implementation of phases beginning with second semester, provided the internal and external health metrics are met, consideration of implementing phases four and five, meeting health, internal and external health metrics no later than the week following spring break, uh, bringing plan back for board review on March 8th, 2021, and continuation of all other elements of the original plan as originally adopted. I think we got something. Motion to approve. A motion. Second. Moved and seconded. We'll do a roll call vote. Set. Mrs. Justin. Ms. Klug? Yes. Mr. Ustruck? Yes. Mrs. Kaiser? No. Mr. Keller? Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Uh, yes. Mr. Sikich? You're muted. No. President Ammon. Yes. Thank you all for that. I just want to make a quick little editorial comment that this plan works if our community helps make it work. So to the comments earlier about what happens in the community gets brought to our schools, that is very much the truth. And so we ask and that our community support decisions made and help us make this plan as successful as possible. So moving on to item 4.2 this evening is the virtual charter school application. So Deidre, I will let you take that over. Wow, 
it's an interesting time to be starting the next agenda item. Um, so hopefully um, this one will go relatively quickly. I am going to pull up the presentation and share screen just to give some background. Um, as many of you have heard, we have had a lot of really positive response to some of what we've done in virtual learning. And we've had as much as we've had some families who have expressed some concerns or have had some issues with it, we also are hearing a lot of cases where families are saying, this actually really works for me. This is working for me and my family. I'm really happy with what the school has done and what the school has provided. And so like Marty indicated earlier tonight, much like many of the districts in our area, um, it would make some sense for us to consider offering a virtual charter beyond the school year. Um, and so in order to offer virtual instruction in the state of Wisconsin, typically when it's times outside of a pandemic, um, you need to be a charter school. And so we would need to make an application to the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction um, in order to consider whether or not we would like to open a virtual charter school. Um, and the application was attached to the exec summary for tonight. Um, and I wanna start by thanking Ryan Johnson, who's the principal at Mitchell, um, who has had quite a bit of uh, feedback from families at Mitchell about how well some of what they're doing at Mitchell has been working. And so he pushed forward to say, hey, I'm willing to work on the application and kind of get this process started if um, we're ready to take that next step. And so um, Ryan has done 90% of the legwork on the whole process and met with um, both a representative from a consultancy that DPI works with, as well as our business department and our leadership and learning team. Um, and he's kind of led the charge in getting us to this point of the application. Um, so I wanna always start by reminding us of our why. So this is just simply a graphic of our strategic plan. And one of the things that we talk about in one of our goals in our strategic plan is to be able to um, decrease the number of resident students who apply for open enrollment out to other districts. And right now, by not having a virtual option, we are likely going to see an increase in the number of families to continue to look for a virtual option next year. So we wanna make sure that we're providing a virtual option for those families who should choose it. Um, so again, some of our families are finding great success. Um, we already have many learners who open and roll out to other districts to attend virtual charter schools. So there's a large one in McFarland um, Wauwatosa has one, Waukesha has one called eAchieve. I think there are two others that we have that students open and roll out to. Um, it's a couple of hundred students every year. So it's a significant amount of money that goes out the door under open enrollment to districts that have virtual academies. And if we had our own internal academy, that's not to say all those families would automatically come back, but we're hoping to propose something that looks a little different than your standard virtual charter. And so maybe it would attract some of those families to come back to provide through some of the opportunities available in West Dallas, West Milwaukee, because by opening rolling out, they aren't always eligible. They aren't eligible to participate in sports and other electives here in district. Whereas if they were part of an internal charter school, they could. Um, so there's some great benefits to being tied to your local neighborhood school district if you're choosing a virtual charter option. Um, and then there's again, additionally, um, across the state and across the nation, we are not the only people who are moving into this territory. We are likely the only people doing it quite as quickly as our process has become, which is why we wanted to bring it to the full board tonight after we met in committee. Um, so what we are looking to do is open a virtual charter school that is for students in four-year-old kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, again, for, sometimes charters are, are designed just for older students. And so we wanna design one that's really um, inclusive of our elementary population as well. We wanna design something that's aligned to our strategic plan. So it's going to have a lot of play-based instruction, project-based learning, um, and experiential-based learning. It's gonna offer some time in a physical school so that students can come in and build the things that they're working on in projects. They can still do public demonstrations of learning. They can still have those opportunities to be in a physical space at a school to be able to do some of the things that require equipment or other facilities that you can't always do in virtual. 
Um, it would include opportunities for social emotional learning and then opportunities to jo join clubs, sports and activities um, within our district. Because again, the students similar to how shared journeys works, it's an instrumentality charter. So it's still run through the primary operations of our school district. It is just an extension of our school district into an instrumentality charter. So this one would work much in the same way that shared journeys works, where they have an independent board um, and they have um, the they're eligible for funding sources that go directly to the charter, but that the finances and a lot of the support is done through our local school district. So we manage most of the finances, we manage the enrollment to shared journeys. And so this one would work in a similar fashion to kind of how that works. Um, lots of the questions that we had when we met as a board committee were on costs. And I said, I'm gonna go back and find out what those concrete numbers would be to even get us started with an application. Um, and that's harder to do than we thought. So Caitlin and I talked about this again, I think this morning or yesterday, last week before break. Um, and that's the challenge is all of the, many of the costs associated to this are gonna be tied to enrollment. So teachers, we would look for approximately one teacher to 21 to 24 students, depending on how wide the grade level span was. But we won't know exactly how many teachers we need until we would see how many students would actually enroll. Um, administrative support, we would only have a full-time principal and a secretary if we went over 250 students. So those are a couple of the pieces that um, kind of are consistent in the way we staff at our other schools that would be part of the plan for staffing for this. The likelihood is, especially in the first year, that it would be district residents that were choosing to stay here versus open and rolling out. So likely the allocations for the principal and the secretary and the teachers could potentially come from students who would have otherwise open rolled out and stayed here, but wouldn't have maybe planned to return to physical schools in the fall. So it might fall within our current staffing allocation. Um, we'd also need a little bit of a budget for some equipment and supplies. One-to-one um, -one devices would obviously be required. Many of those we could take out of our current fleet if they were for students who we are planning for for right now for in projected enrollment for next year. Um, but there might be some specialized equipment or specialized devices that we need to buy in addition to that. Um, because it would be an instrumentality charter, it follows our school. Um, they'd use our same Skyward. They'd use Schoology. They'd have access to the other resources that we already own anyway. So there's no additional cost associated to those things. The only cost associated to it for the present time is in the planning. So we've paid Ryan, it's been quite a bit of work to get the application to this point. So we've paid him a supplemental contract to do the plan, the application portion. And then we would need to have somebody doing this through a supplemental contract to be helping with some of the planning and the organization to get the next kind of steps of the whole process going. Um, so this is what a timeline would look like for the potential um, to get a virtual charter school up and running. I um, mean, this timeline looks very compressed and very short because it is. Um, so um, it is the first step is simply an application to DPI, which actually doesn't obligate us to do anything at this point. It's just DPI saying with your application and with your plan, we would support you taking the next steps and looking to enroll kids and make a plan from there. So that's really the first step. And the sooner we get approval from DPI, the sooner we know how much effort and time we would need to put into planning or how quickly we would need to advertise to find out how many students would want to be enrolling in something like this so the rest of the budget process could start. The other timeline piece that's very tight um, right now is that there are federal grant monies available for charter schools and the application for that is due February 1st. So of course it never hurts us to apply for grant monies and so we would want to start with um, a grant if we could. And so um, in order to apply for the federal grant first you have to have an application that's been approved by the Department of Public Construction. So part of our reason for bringing this forward tonight for consideration is just the timeline in which we're trying to work in order to be ready to open for fall. 
Um, and then as early as February 1st, we could start some early enrollment. So getting some feelers out for how many students we could potentially be serving and then designing the actual school operating system and curriculum. And then we would work on actual enrollment numbers as we kind of fell out and fell forward to say, okay, these are the number of students we need to start planning for so that we could accurately plan for staffing and for logistics that we would need as far as that goes. Um, next steps for us in this process are to approve the application. So we would, are seeking board approval tonight to give us permission to send that application to the Wisconsin Department of Public Construction for the potential to open the school. Um, they Then we'd send that application in pending board approval. We'd apply for the federal grant monies by February 1st, which again is a quick turnaround. Um, we would offer a supplemental contract to someone to assist with the planning. Likely Ryan, who's been doing a significant amount of the planning at this point would continue but then it would also likely take a little bit of extra help from other individuals. And we've had some internal individuals express interest as well as some potential retired staff who might be interested in coming back and helping us with the planning phase of this. Um, and then our goal would be to come back to the board with an update once we knew that DPI approved our application. And therefore we were really getting into the start of the planning process of what this could look like with a little bit more on kind of the specifics and some of the logistics. So I went through that super fast, partially because we are where we are in the evening, um, partially because I've shared quite a bit of information through Marty's Friday notes and some of my board updates that we've been doing to get us to this point. Um, and I wanted to be sure we left some time for questions that people may have. No. So what at this point, if we approve it tonight, what sort of monetary um, commitment is being made? Um, if we approved it tonight so far, we're just looking at a supplemental contract. We've already done one. Um, and so we're looking at an, a supplemental contract to do the planning. Um, it would likely be a pretty hefty supplemental contract because it's pretty significant amount of workload in the next couple of months. Um, so we hadn't set a determined amount around that yet, but typically, you know, they're those are a little bit heftier. And so that would come back to the board for approval in the next at the next board meeting. For the supplemental contract? As part of the normal hiring package is the supplemental contract. But that would be the only expense we're obligated to at this moment in time is really the man hours it's going to take to get these applications and the other pieces to go forward. You have a ballpark on what that would be? Oh yeah, probably like eight to 10,000 is usually what kind of our heavier supplemental contracts look like. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Additional questions? Yeah. Gary? Um, <clears throat> did we survey families who currently open and roll out to virtual schools to determine if they have an interest in enrolling in the WAWM virtual school? We did not do any of that surveying yet because we don't have that option available yet. And so we would will that is part of the planning process to go next, Gary, is to make sure that we do communicate with those families to express why it might be in that student's best interest to come back to a West Dallas, West Milwaukee option, um, as well as opening it up to have open enrollment seats available to other districts who may want to open enroll in for that virtual option as well. So potentially it could be a recruiting tool for us to um, have open enrollment students choose it as well in the system. Okay, that your last comment is related to another question. If we would um, increase the open enrollment seats to try to get more students into the district through this virtual charter school. Um, the open enrollment seats will get um, approved by the board in the same process that they normally work. Um, and so those aren't going to change at the present moment. Um, but we would come back to the board for further approval if suddenly we got, uh, there was a reason to think that we needed to increase them based on the interest in the virtual academy. But the process we use for determining open enrollment seats for what we know right now is the same as it has been for the several years in a row where we do the projections, at the 92%. And those numbers, I believe, come to you guys next week. So it would be with okay, so we don't, we, so we, of available seats. Sorry, Gary. 
So we're going to we're going to calculate that number the same based on the the brick and mortar schools who are not anticipating an, a potential increase in open enrollment interest with the virtual charter school. Um, we may potentially see an increase in interest. And then if we do fill our other seats, much like we have done in other years, then we would come back to the board in June to say, hey, we could open up new seats because we have availability. So mm -hmm. we'd follow the normal process for now based on what we know for sure, um, because we obviously wouldn't want to commit ourselves to something that we couldn't follow through on, but then if we needed to, we could come back to the board later on to ask for an increase of seats based on the criteria from DPI to do so. Okay. And then uh, just, and, and I'm going to guess that this is going to be done, but just to uh, make it clear that we need to communicate to families that students are attending a new school and this is not a virtual learning from their brick and mortar school. Because um, I've, I've talked to some people who think that they're they're going to go to the virtual charter school but you know they're going to be a hail graduate um yeah so yes clarifying the expectations for our students who participate in our virtual academy um certainly I, some of the comments that were made very early tonight i think a few families got it confused that that's what they'd be doing right now that we were trying to do this now because it went hand in hand with the change of the phases. And so we have to clear, make sure that all of that is really clear. Okay, that's all. So tonight the approval would be for the application to at least just move forward with the process. And the application, not that all the work Ryan's done hasn't been phenomenal, but it could get rejected, right? It I mean, get rejected. It's and that's, yes. And that's a moot point. It's a moot point. And it is that, not going to be rejected. I know it won't. I know. But <laughs> and this is this does not mean that in seven yeah. months' time we are 100% going to offer a new charter school. This is the next step along the path to potentially offering a charter school. Yes. So I just I want to make sure that that's clear that this doesn't. Yeah. And again, we'd be informing seven. the board throughout the whole process on kind of right. each step of the way where we were, obviously, because this, again, feels um like a quicker presentation on something that is a ginormous big deal um but right now it really is just to be able to submit the application that was out to the public and to you guys as well to dpi for consideration if they approve it it comes with a whole boatload of new work that we get to do right and to your point earlier Deidre, there has been a lot of communication to the board on this topic and, and, and ongoing so your point that the presentation was shorter. This is certainly not the only time we have gone in depth about the topic because we've gotten numerous updates from you um, in the committee on, on, on what the potential could be and what that would look like. So make sure that's clear too. Okay. Any additional questions on the application? Noah? Just one quick one about open enrollment. Considering this week you get people from like all over the state, I guess technically if someone wanted to, to do that. Um, they still follow the same open enrollment rules because we talked about having, you know, opportunities to be in, um, you know, be in building to do stuff. But if they're coming up from, you know, Eagle River, Wisconsin, um, that's on them to get down here uh, to to participate if they want to. We don't have to, you know, awesome. charter a plane or something to get them over here. Um, and, and it's the same go for, I mean, I know we this is way in the future, but for special needs students and any special ed students that may participate, if they need special transportation, that still wouldn't fall on our backs to, to try and get that done? Um, it depends on, on how many seats you take in which category in special education, right? So um, it de that all is based on those caseload calculations. So whatever seats you open to students with special needs, once you accept their application based on the criteria that you set, then if they have transportation in their IEP, then you do pay for that. Um, but you do get an increase in funding from DPI if it's a student that's identified as a student with a special need to help accommodate for things like that. So no, we wouldn't be obligated to transport kids all the way in because lots of that obviously would be optional. Um, Marty has a very extensive plan where he'd like to open like a a place where they could all live and stay for their week when they come. But I am personally not committing to jumping down that road just quite yet. <laughs> That's I like not that. currently part of the plan. You're not approving anything like that. Not approving anything like that. That was just an outside idea that is on a list of things to consider long after we get this all up and going. 
the WAWM hostel. Is that that is kind of where he was going with it. And I was like, oh, goodness, only one thing at a time, please. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the application? If not, we would look for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any additional comments or questions? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Go forth and applicate. <laughs> have everybody on the work so far. Um, okay. We would look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No one wants to stay. I right, thank you everyone for the work tonight and the questions and the diligence that you put to everything. Um, all right, you. take care everyone.